Roll call in 30 seconds, stand by. Yeah. Yeah, I'm 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 watching it right now. Okay, I got that screen, screen that just says we have a Uh, good afternoon. Sorry, we're just, uh, we haven't done a hearing this large without panels before, so we're just um, managing a couple of technical issues, which I'll have more to say about in a moment. But first, uh, let me um, call us to order and begin by recognizing that uh, today's land use public hearing uh, is uh, on and about uh, Treaty 6 land, um, which is traditional territory of the Cree, the Dene, the Soto, the Nakota Sioux and Blackfoot peoples, as well as one of the great homelands of the Métis Nation. And so um, I will now roll call uh, members of council to first to uh, establish attendance, starting this time with Councillor Zadig. I'm here, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Good afternoon. Councillor Essinger. Good afternoon. Councillor Hamilton. Good afternoon. Councillor Henderson. Uh, here, back on my correct wing. Live and on deck, Councillor Knack. <laughs> Good afternoon. Thank you, Councillor McKean. Oh, right. Uh, he he's his back is still out. He sends his regrets. Um, he's he's recovering, but very slowly. So he's where he needs to be right now. Councillor Nickel. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, Councillor Paquette. Good afternoon. Noon, Councillor Walters. Hello. Good afternoon, Councillor Banga. Alive and well. Uh, superb. Councillor Cartmel. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Councillor Cantorina. Good afternoon, Mayor. Good afternoon. Okay, so uh, there is an agenda before us with uh, some replacement attachments for item 3.5. Councillor Essinger, if you'd be so kind. I'm happy to move the May 4th, uh, 2021 City Council Public here in agenda. Uh, be adopted with the following changes. Uh, replacement attachment one under Charter Bylaw 19673. Second. Thank you. Uh, please vote on the adoption of the agenda with that addition or replacement, pardon me. I'm a yes, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Walters and Councillor Cartmel. Yes. Thank you. And Councillor Zadek. 
Yes, I thought it went through, but sure. Thank you. We have 12 votes, Mr. Mayor. Dis display the vote, please. Carried unanimously. Protocol items. I don't think we have any for today. Uh, so I will briefly highlight the procedures for today's hearings. The way this will work is the clerk will call out the bylaws to be dealt with, and then I will call out the names of people registered to speak to each bylaw. Next, council will select the bylaws that uh, they wish to discuss and vote on any bylaws that have not been selected for discussion today. Council will then listen to each of the bylaws that were selected for discussion and debate in order. For each item, administration will first provide an overview of the bylaw, and then members of the public will be invited to speak virtually using Google Meet. Those in favor will speak first, followed by those in opposition. Each will have five minutes to make comments. The clerk will run the official timer. However, attendees participating virtually may wish to use a timer at home too. When a speaker is finished, however, please stay on the line as council may wish to ask questions. After comments from the public, council may ask questions of city administration. After all the speakers have concluded, the chair will then uh, ask each speaker uh, if they wish to speak to new information which arose during the public hearing. This process requires patience to ensure that everyone who does wish to address council has an appropriate opportunity. Thereafter, council may close the public hearing and debate the bylaw. For those participating virtually, uh, which is everyone basically at this point, please refrain from using the chat function in Google Meet during the meeting as it can create issues of decorum or provide unfair advantage, and it can even interfere with the live stream. So additionally, please remember to mute your microphone when you are not presenting or answering questions, just to cut down on echo and feedback. If any of you are experiencing any difficulties, the Office of the City Clerk has resources available to facilitate communication with those participating in the statutory public hearing process. Please reach out using the contact information provided in your registration or via city.clerk at edmonton.ca. Madam Clerk, please Thank call you. the bylaws. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.1, Charter Bylaw 19678, to allow for low density residential development? Rosenthal. Yes, I have Catherine Chopko back to answer questions only from IBI. Are you there, Catherine? Yes, thank you. Welcome. I have PJ Pescott to answer questions only from Melcor. Hi, yeah, I'm here. Fantastic. Welcome. Uh, Sarah Sherman to answer questions only from IBI. Yes. And nobody uh, else registered in opposition. Next. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.2, Charter Bylaw 19677, to allow for low to medium density residential with limited commercial uses at ground level, the uplands? Yes, I have Rana Raymond to answer questions only from Qualico. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. And no one in opposition. Items 3.3, 3.4, and 3.5 will be dealt with together. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.3, bylaw 19689, amendment to the North Saskatchewan River Valley Area Redevelopment Plan? Item 3.4, bylaw 19672, amendment to the Uplands Neighborhood Structure Plan? Or item 3.5, charter bylaw 19673, to allow for a shared use path, stormwater management facility, and a range of low density ground oriented housing forms, the Uplands? Yes, I have Rihanna Raymond to answer questions only from Qualico again, and no one in opposition. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.6, Charter Bylaw 19674, to allow for a variety of ground oriented housing types, including row housing on shallow lots, Riverview, neighborhood 3? Yes, I have Rihanna Raymond again from Qualico, again to answer questions only, and again, no one in opposition. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.7, Charter Bylaw 19663, to allow for low density residential housing and a stormwater management facility, Riverview Neighborhood 3? Very busy day for Rihanna Raymond. Again, to answer questions only. Again, from Qualico. Again, um, no one in opposition. Items 3.8 and 3.9 will be dealt with together. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.8, bylaw 19670, amendment to the Chappelle Neighborhood Area Structure Plan, or item 3.9, charter bylaw 19671, to allow back-to-back -back stacked row housing Chappelle? Yes, I have Elise Shillington to answer questions only from Stantec. Hi, good afternoon. Good afternoon, and Peter Sukalis to answer questions again from Brookfield Residential. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Did I get it that time? Yep, you bet. Yeah, sounds finally, good. Finally. <laughs> And no one in opposition. 
Items 310 and 311 will be dealt with together. Is there anyone to speak to item 310, bylaw 19688, to amend the Kinglet Gardens neighborhood structure plan? Or item 311, charter bylaw 19636, to allow for multi unit housing, Kinglet Gardens? Yes, I have Keith Davies to answer questions only from Stantec. Hello. Hello, and Jim Killow to answer questions only from Rohit. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, and no one in opposition. Is there anyone to speak to item 312, Charter Bylaw 19655, to allow for a range of low density residential housing, Walker? Yes, I have Catherine Chopko Beck to answer questions only from IBI. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. And Kevin Backus to answer questions only from Anthem. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. And no one in opposition. Items 313 and 314 will be dealt with together. Is there anyone to speak to item 313, bylaw 19683, amendment to Glen, Glen Rating Heights Neighborhood Structure Plan, or item 314, charter bylaw 19684, to allow for medium and low density housing Glen Rating Heights? Yes, I have Keith Davies to answer questions only from Stantec. Hello again. Hello, and Kevin Backus to answer questions only from Anthem United. Hello. Hello, and no one in opposition. Items 315, 316, and 317 will be dealt with together. Is there anyone to speak to item 315, Amendment to Heritage Valley Servicing Concept Design Brief? Item 316, Bylaw 19649, Amendment to the Richford Neighborhood Area Structure Plan? Or item 317, Charter Bylaw 19650, to allow for a range of commercial office and service uses, Richford? Yes, I have Ryan and Forgive me, is it IDIC or EDIC? No, it's IDIC. IDIC. I keep overthinking that one, but welcome back. Um, I have from, uh, he's from Heinz. Yes, I'm Zoom. here. And Joe Marchese. Joe, are you there? Point of order or point of privilege, Mr. Mayor, there seems to be interference on the line that's making it very hard to hear. Okay, well, uh, we'll pause for a moment and see if we can isolate that. Okay, if you can all please mute yourselves until I call upon you. Great, thank you. Uh, Joe Marchese? I don't believe he's checked in. There are a couple of people on the phone that, that we haven't been in touch with, so there's a chance that he's there and may need to star six to unmute on his keypad. Okay, Joe, if you're there, hit star six uh, if you're on the phone and uh, holla back at us. Good afternoon. There you are. Welcome. Yes, and, thank uh, you. Uh, you're welcome. Uh, and Nicole Farn. Good afternoon. Super. Uh, and Nicole's to answer questions only from Bunt Engineering. And then in opposition, I have uh, Corey Fogd. Good afternoon. It's Corey Fogd. So good, Fogd. Fogd. Thank you. I, I, uh, I, there will be a few names I get wrong. I apologize to each and every one of you in advance. It is an occupational hazard for me to attempt to pronounce all of your names correctly. So I'll do my best. Please correct me, though. Uh, second, I have Ali Halat. Um, it'll be Ali and Paula Halat, and I am here right now, and he's just, uh, he'll be right back. Okay, so you're you're back to back. Ali will be first, and then Paula, thank you. Uh, you would be uh, speaker number three in opposition. You're back to back, so thank you. Okay. Next uh, is Laura Buckler. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, next is Jim Ross. I'm here. <clears throat> yep. Good afternoon. And uh, it says that, Jim, you're here to answer questions only for the Royal Gardens and Black McCreek Homeowners Association? Correct. Okay. Noted. Thank you. Next, I have uh, uh, Parbjit Daliwal. Parbjit Daliwal? No? How about Ranjit Daliwal? They're both logged on. Unfortunately, something is wrong with their mic. They're not able to speak. Oh, okay. 
Well, we'll see if we can get them some assistance because uh, we'll, we'll, it'll be a little while before we come to them. So hopefully, maybe they can log out, log back in, or something. So, well, I'm not going to try to do the tech support from this seat, but we'll see if we can help you out offline. Uh, next is uh, Jasmine Nijar. Was that you just now? That's Jasmine Nijar. Yes, I'm here. Welcome. And then next, I have George Schmidt from the board of the Ravines of Richford. I'm here. Uh, welcome, George. Thank you. And then next, have I have Shelby McLeod. Good afternoon. Thanks for the opportunity. Good afternoon. Uh, next, I have Glinda Schuster from Richford Community. Yeah, I'm here. Welcome. And then I have Ravneed Mali. I'm here. Hello. Welcome. And uh, I have Ashis Ray. I'm here. Welcome. Yes, I'm here. Oh. Welcome. Is there anybody else wishing to speak to uh, the Richford item? we haven't called so far okay not seeing any then next is there anyone to speak to item 318 charter bylaw 19680 to allow for small-scale infill development Calder um, yes uh, though I have no one registered in favor at the present time uh, in opposition I have Larry Wisniak Larry did check in. I believe he was participating by phone, so may need to star six on his keypad to unmute. Did you get that, Larry? Okay, yes, I hit star six. I'm here. Perfect. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, and I have no one else on the Calder item. Did we have an applicant for that one or no registration at this point? Okay. Uh, Cromdale. Items 319, 320, and 321 will be dealt with together. Is there anyone to speak to item 319, bylaw 19685, to close road right of way Cromdale? Bylaw 19686, to amend the Cromdale Virginia Park Area Redevelopment Plan? Or charter bylaw 19687, to allow for a medium rise apartment building Cromdale? Yes, I have Bard Golightly to answer questions only from Ebenezer Developments. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Bard. Uh, and I have Lucas Stone. Lucas? Okay. Well, uh, we'll be a while before we get to this, so hopefully we'll be able to get Lucas on the line. So, and in opposition, I have Debbie uh, Bocabella. Debbie, are you there? I believe that Debbie is is on the phone and would just need to star six on her keypad to unmute. Hello? Debbie? I, I have spoken to Debbie a couple of times, but we'll reach out. Great, thank you. Um, next, I have Lori Rackel. Hi. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. You're most welcome. Uh, next, I have Jennifer K. Bowerman. Thank you. I will be speaking. Yes. Uh, welcome. And next, uh, speaker number four on the Cromdale item in opposition, I have Anthony uh, Olivier. Good afternoon, folks. It's Anthony Oliver. Oh, Oliver. Sorry, I've got a transposition error here. And you are from no Oliver problem. Litigation. Uh, no, just on my own uh, on, oh. on my own behalf. Oh, okay. Uh, I have an organizational affiliation here, but we'll strike that. So, Anthony Oliver, welcome. Number sure, five, thank you. I have uh, Nancy Bradford. Hello. Thank you for allowing me to represent the community. Uh, you're most welcome. Number six, I have Ashling Ryan. Good afternoon. I'm here as well. Welcome. Um, number seven, I have Joyce Pittman. No? I don't believe they've checked in. Okay. Uh, number eight, Grant Pittman. Same, same. Okay. Number nine, Cal Rathall. Yes, I'm here. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Number 10, I have Eugene Drapaka. Eugene? 
I don't believe they've checked in. Okay, uh, number 11, Shauna Faragini. Yes, thank you, I'm here. Welcome. Uh, thank you. Howard, Howard Gibb. Howard Gibb. No? I believe that they may have checked in and be participating by phone as well and would need to star six on their keypad to unmute. Hi, uh, it's Howard. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak. Welcome. Thank you. Um, number 13 is Roman Warkala. Roman? I don't know that they've, they've checked in yet. Okay. Uh, how about number 14, uh, Olivier Can? Good afternoon. I am here. Welcome. Number 15 is Graydon McRae. I am here, Mr. Mayor. Welcome. Number 16 is Landon Pisarchuk. Hello, I'm here. Welcome. And number 17 is Rosemary Seaver. Rosemary? No? Okay. Number 18, Don Ruse. How about Juanita Ruse? Okay, last but not least, number 20, Andre Nikiforek. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Anybody else wishing to speak to the Cromdale item who we've missed? Going once, going twice. Okay, not hearing any. Next up. Hello, this is Joyce Pittman. I missed my roll call earlier. Oh, okay. Uh, thank you. And is Grant Pittman with you as well? No, it'll just be Joyce. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. This is Barb J. Dollywall. I think I could, you guys couldn't hear you, so I just missed, I think. Oh, great. So I'm here. So you're, you're online then for when we get to your item. Thank you for letting us know. Hi, uh, this is Rosemary Seaver, and I registered to speak, but I, I'm not on the list. I called your name a couple minutes ago, I think, but... Um, oh, did you? Uh, you know what? I got booted out, and sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah, I Must missed have been it just then. then. I'm sorry. Well, thanks, thanks for what bearing number? with us. Thanks for speaking up. We've got you on the list I'm, as number 17 in opposition. Number 17. On the Crom. Perfect. Deal. Thank you. Yeah. And Mr. Well. Mayor, Roman Warchola reporting in. Oh, super. Welcome. Thank you. Not all at once, but not instantly, to be sure. Um, okay. How about the Evansdale Municipal Reserve removal? Is there anyone to speak to item 322, Evansdale Municipal Reserve removal? No. <laughs> no one registered, either in favor or opposition, on that one. Is there anyone to speak to item 323, Charter Bylaw 19676, to allow for the additional health services use class in an existing direct control provision broker? Uh, yes, we are. Yes, I'm here, Svetlana. Uh, and you might be Svetlana Pavlikam. Pavlikam. Welcome. And I have you down for uh, uh, questions only? Uh, answer questions. Great. Okay. Uh, and I have no one in opposition on the Grove Fair item. No. Is there anyone to speak to item 324, Charter Bylaw 19645, to allow for medium industrial development, Anthony Hende, Big Lake? Yes, I have Rob, J. Robert Van Druben. Yeah. yeah, I'm present. Thank Welcome. you. I have Janice Agrios from Kennedy Agrios LLP. Uh, yes, thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I have Jan Van Bruggen. Uh, Jan will not be attending today. He's, uh, he's unable to be here. Okay. And Nick Golden? Is Nick with us? And uh, Janice, is your delegation wishing to uh, present or questions only if there's no nobody in opposition? Uh, we have a short oh, presentation. Right, right, uh, it'll right. just be myself and Bob Van Bruggen. Right. Uh, um, okay, so uh, Jan, or Jan, and Nick, not so much, but uh, uh, the first two speakers will present. I, I have no one registered in opposition, but uh, it's been noted that it's with uh, admin non-support. So. Uh, thanks for clarifying that. I thank you for being there to answer, uh, to present and answer questions, Ms. Agrios. And Mr. Thank you. Um, next up, the Holyrood item. 
Is there anyone to speak to item 325, Charter Bylaw 19681, to allow for mixed-use, high-density, transit-oriented development, Holly Root? Yes, I have a Dan Zegelar to answer questions only from Regency. Yeah, uh, present, thank you. Welcome. I have Raj Dunna to answer questions only from Regency. Uh, I have a presentation as well, Mr. Mirror, if oh, required. Okay. Um, there, that might not be a bad idea. Uh, but it's entirely up to you. Uh, you will have five minutes, as you know. Next, no, I have Jim Durr to answer questions only from Durr Architecture. Jim, are you there? Okay, hopefully I, we'll be able I to get you. I can see that Jim Durr is, is muting and unmuting. I wonder if, if he might try leaving the meet and rejoining if his audio isn't working. Yeah, we are approaching that point where, scale-wise, where we may be testing the limits of Google Meet. So we'll talk about that more in a moment. But uh, next in opposition, I have Margaret Russell. Yes, I'm here. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, next, then, Rita Terry. I know that Rita Terry is working and unable to uh, join at this time. Okay, thanks for letting us know. Well, um, it will be a while before we get to this, so hopefully she will be able to join us. Her registration will stand. Uh, Jamie Forster with the Holyrood Development Committee. Good day, I'm here. Good day. Uh, Dave Sutherland, also with Holyrood Development Committee. I'm here. Good to see you again, Mr. Mayor and Councillors. Good afternoon. I have Mike Baran, also from HDC. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I have Carolyn Skinner, also with HDC. Carolyn, are you there? I know she just had to leave the meeting. She's ha having a little bit of tech difficulties as well, but she should be rejoining. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mark Harden, also. I'm here, Mr. Mayor. Welcome. And then um, I have Maria Kruzewski. Kruzewski, Mr. Mayor. Kruz Pretty good. Kruzewski. Yes. And Carolyn Skinner is here. <laughs> oh, welcome, Carolyn. Glad you could join us. Uh, next, I have Janet Sire. Sear. Uh, how about Carlos Frere? How about Alan Winter? Uh, Mr. Winter may be joining later. Okay. Thank you. Um, anybody else on the Holyrood item that we missed? No? Not that I'm aware okay. of. Okay. Next up is Garno. Items 326 and 327 will be dealt with together. Is there anyone to speak to item 326, bylaw 19592, amendment to the Garneau Area Redevelopment Plan, or item 327, charter bylaw 19593, to allow for ground-oriented multi-unit housing, Garneau? Yes, I have uh, Jared Candlish from Greenspace Alliance. Yes, good afternoon. Good afternoon. I have Dianesh Deshpande from, also from Greenspace Alliance. Um, Mr. Mayor, Dianesh is coming from another meeting. He will be joining later. Okay. I have Justin Wu. Yes, here. Welcome. I have Marcelo Figuera. Yes, good afternoon. Welcome. I have James Cowley. Yes. Welcome. Yes, good afternoon. How about Michelle Lafleur? Good afternoon. I'm here. Welcome. I have Dorothy Pinto. Good afternoon. Here, I'm here as well. Welcome. And Bryce Pinto. Good afternoon, Ms. Mayor. Welcome. And in opposition, I have Megan Rich. Good afternoon. Welcome. I have David Buchanan. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I have Nancy Hunt. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I have Douglas Gorman. Douglas Gorman. It's possible that Douglas has checked in and is participating by phone and would need to star six on his keypad to unmute. Okay, well, um, hopefully we'll be able to 
make a contact. Um, in the meantime, I'll carry on. Uh, Steph Newfeld. Present. Good day. Uh, Katie Jos. Hi, it's Katie Josie. Thanks. Josie. Josie. Okay. Um, Benjamin Gradanis. Hi, so it's Katie here again. Benjamin is my husband, so he uh, will. He's at work, so depending on what time this happens, he'll probably join. Okay, noted. Thank you. Um, and is that everybody for the first Garno item? As I far so. as I know, yes. Okay, then on the other Garno item. Uh, items 328 and 329 will be dealt with together. Is there anyone to speak to item 328, file a 19480, amendment to the Garneau Area Redevelopment Plan, or item 329, charter file a 19481 to allow for high-rise residential tower Garneau? Yes, I have Chris DeLabba to answer questions only from Belgian Developments. I'm here. Welcome. Uh, Croy Johnson from Belgian as well. Croy, are you there? He, Mr. Mayor, he is present. His mic might be having some technical difficulties. Okay. Well, we'll have a little bit of time between now and when we get to you to resolve that. So how about uh, days, perhaps, in fact? Uh, Tracy Bell. Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, and, and stay tuned on this question of agenda management. Quite clearly, this is more than we'll be able to manage in the allotted time today, so uh, we will give that some further thought here um, as, as the day unfolds. Uh, in opposition, though, I have a Byron Proc now. Byron Proc now. How about Lisa Pashniak? How about Megan Rich again? Yes, I'm here. Good afternoon. Okay, the system's still working. Then. Was that Lisa Pashniak? A moment ago? Yes. Ah, welcome. Thank you. Um, next up is Theo Moss from Strathcona Housing Cooperative. Yes, hello. Welcome. And Dana Miller? Yes, hello. Welcome. And Alexandra M. Benitez from Strathcona Housing Cooperative. I'm here as well. And Alexandra C. Benitez. Hello, I'm here. Hola. Hola. <laughs> and uh, next is Sharon Watanabe on behalf of Sander Veldhuizen Van Zanten from the Manhattan Lofts. Good afternoon. I'm here. Good afternoon. And next is David Buchanan. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Next is Angela Seehagen. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Next is Chris Sties. Hello, present. Welcome. Um, next is Ellen Armstrong. Hello, I'm here. Welcome. Next is Sarah Dawson. Yes, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Next is Andre Gasson. Andre Gasson. Très bien, Monsieur le Maire. Thank you. Uh, Dorian. Uh, next, I have uh, Bonnie Reeb. Hello, I'm present. Welcome. Next, Robert McVeigh. Robert McVeigh. How about Greg Miazga? Present. Welcome. And Bob Mc. Thank you. Uh, Bob McVeigh will be joining us shortly. Understood. Thank you so much. Uh, and last but not least, rounding out the cast of the Garneau Block for tonight is Michelle Mulder. Yes, I'm present. <laughs> and I mean that in the kindest way, just to be clear. <laughs> Welcome uh, to you all. Um, is there anybody else we've missed? 
Uh, yes. Could I please check in for the Virginia Cromdale? Uh, yes. It's what? Debbie Bocabella. Ah, welcome. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. What I'm going to ask. Do Mr. You have Mayor, I do have one additional request to speak uh, that we've just received. It's for, for questions only, I believe, um, for items 315, 316, and 317. Okay, um, and that's that's in in favor or in opposition? Um, it is in favor, and I misspoke. It is not for questions only, as far as I can tell. Um, the name is Romeo Deol. Apologies, but I've mispronounced. Okay, uh, Romeo, are you there? <laughs> Romeo, Romeo, where art thou? If, if they've registered in the last um, few minutes, okay. they may not have received the link yet. And I've just received another uh, registration um, on item 318. Mm -hmm. um, they are in favor. They are for questions only. And the name is Niraj Nath. Niraj Nath. Hello, Mr. Mayor. Welcome. And questions only in favor on the Calder item. Yes, sir. Welcome, Niraj. Okay, now um, clerks have asked me um, to ask for uh, some assistance from those of you who are on the Google Meet um, who are strictly here to observe. We've noticed that folks uh, get the link and then often share it with others so that they can watch along. And um, normally that's not a big deal if there's only a handful of people on the meeting. Um, but in this case, because we have, as you can tell, so many people signed in, uh, just so we don't crash or overwhelm the, uh, the technical system, if you're just here to watch, I'm just going to give you uh, alternatives where you can also watch from through a different streaming system that won't conflict with what we're trying to do here. And so that's at edmonton.ca slash council. You can find the council on the web. Uh, a page and you can follow us either uh, on YouTube or through the city's live streaming service and monitor what's happening here in City Council and not have to be logged in through this system. So, And Mr. Mayor, it, it's edmonton.ca slash meetings that, oh, that those me. options are edmonton. available Edmonton.ca slash meetings. Sorry, thank you. Um, so, um, and, and for those of you who are sort of keeping tabs on this meeting, um, you can, and, and we're not at your item, you may also follow along that way rather than be logged in here. If it's easier for you to monitor that on a different device or on a phone or something like that, and then log back into this when your item comes up. Um, apologies, we just have a couple of, of people that are on the meet still that we just want to confirm there's no intention to speak because if, if there's been some confusion, we'd like to get them registered. Is there anybody else wishing to speak who we haven't called upon so far? Speak now or before we get to your item, but preferably now so we can organize this occasion. Okay, not hearing anyone, I am going to take it on good faith that we have everybody who wishes to speak accounted for, if not present yet but at least accounted for. Okay, thank you for your patience. That only took 40 minutes just to register people. So that tells you what kind of day it's gonna be. Um, but bear with us, we will, we will soldier forth. We are statutorily obliged to, to deal with all of these items. We will simply struggle to do so in the allotted time before 9.30 today. Also from an agenda management point of view, it's been brought to my attention that Eid is, uh, is tonight. Uh, and so that for folks who are uh, observing uh, iftar and the conclusion of Ramadan tonight uh, that we we would like to know uh, if that is a conflict for you potentially later this evening. I understand sundown is at, at about nine minutes after nine tonight. If that's going to conflict with uh, evening prayers for you, uh, please let the city clerks know at city.clerk at edmonton.ca and if we're able to, um, as we're juggling this agenda, ensure that your item uh, does not conflict with uh, Iftar tonight, then please let us know and we'll, we'll do our best to, uh, 
to work around that. We're only scheduled to go till 9.30 tonight as it is. Um, council may wish to extend a little bit further to complete an item. That's always an option for us. But again, the sooner we know if there's uh, a Ramadan conflict tonight uh, for any of you, again, we'll do our very best to um, accommodate that and inshallah, you won't miss your item. Um, so what happens next? Now we uh, select items for debate. Councillors, Councillor Essinger. Uh, Councillor Henderson did pop up first, so I defer to him. Oh, okay. Sure. Well, yeah, he's, he's the, the man of the day here, award-wise. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, well, I'm not. It's, I wish that was true. <laughs> um, I, I'm, I have a quick question. I don't want to make today longer than it needs to be, but I do have a quick question of administration on three, 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 four, and three, five. Okay. Um, and then I'll grab uh, the three. Uh, so um, uh, three. 3.25, the Hollywood item, 3.26 and 2.7, 3.28 and 3.29, which are all the Garno items. I'm assuming Councillor Knack is going to grab um, 3.24, so I'll leave it for him. If he doesn't, I would grab it, but it's his area. Okay. So. Yeah, he's on the list, yep. so we'll give him a chance. Ward courtesy prevails on public hearing days um, and most of the rest of the time, too. So, Councillor uh, Essinger, go ahead. Uh, 3.18. 318 for Councillor Essinger. Thank you. Councillor Katarina. Mr. Mayor, I'll select uh, 319, 20, and 21. The Cromdale items. Councillor Katarina. Yep. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Hamilton. Uh, Councillor Henderson got the items. I was uh, some of the items I was going to ask a question on, which was 33 to 35, but I do have a um, uh, sort of question, but just for administration on 3, 2, 3, 6, and 3, 7. Sorry, 3, 2, 3, 6. 3, 6, seven. and 3, 7, yeah. Okay. But it's just for administration. It's not for the applicant. Okay, good to know. Uh, questions for admin on those items? Councillor Knack is now, or sorry, Councillor Walters. Thank you. Pick three, 15, 16, and 17, please. Thanks. The Richford items, thank you. And um, Councillor Knack. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll select item 3.24. Got it. Councillor Knack selects the Anthony Hende Big Lake item and Councillor Banga. Councillor Banga. Mr. Mayor, I want to select. 312, but I missed that part. See if there are any speakers on it uh, uh, in a position I only then. I think there were, no, but there were two speakers to answer questions only um, for the applicant. No, no registered in opposition. Thank you. That's all. So no, no selection for oh. that then? Okay. <sighs> no, no, 312 has not been selected my understanding okay um so mr mayor if uh, that's all the selection i'll move closure of the public hearing please on three sorry mr mayor i said please go ahead well uh three one uh, three eight to three fourteen uh three twenty two twenty three and that'll be second. the omnibus yeah i i confirm that's it second okay Thank you. Uh, please vote to close public hearing, uh, seconded by Council Nickel on the omnibus. Hearings, I guess. Please vote. And we have 12 votes, Mr. Mayor. Display the vote. Carried. Unanimous. Carried. First reading. Mr. Mayor, I'll move first reading of the omnibus as stated. Second. Please vote on first reading. We're just missing Councillor Zadik's vote. Yes. Thank you. We have 12 votes, Mr. Mayor. Display the vote, please. And that's carried. I'll move second reading of the omnibus as stated, Mr. Mayor. Second. Second reading, please vote.
We have 12 votes. Display the vote, please. Carried. I move consideration for a third reading uh, on the omnibus as stated. Second. On to allow third reading to proceed, please vote. And we have 12 votes. Display the vote. Carried. Yeah. Mr. Mayor, I'll move third reading of bylaw 19678, 19670, 19671, 19688, 19636, 19655, 19683, 19684. Uh, the um, uh, recommendation in 22, do you want to do that after? Yeah. We can do it. Subsequently. Okay. And then uh, bylaw 19676. Second. Please vote. On the listed bylaws, third reading. Councillor Henderson, we're just missing your vote. Thank you. We have 12 votes. Display the vote. Carried. And Mr. Mayor, I'll move the recommendation on 3.22. Second. Second. Is that a... Oh, sorry. I'll, 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 seven defer. Now. <laughs> I'll defer. Sorry. Thank you. Seconded by Councillor um, Zadek. Please vote on the MR recommendation. And we have 12 votes. Display the vote. Carried. Um, okay, so first item up, um, then. Mr. Mayor, I'm just wondering as a process question. Mm -hmm. I, I just, because I mean, we have some people that are going to be sitting with us all day and we're not going to get them to the, to the, today. Mm -hmm. um, you know, because I think if we get to the Hollywood item, we'll be lucky. Uh, but I can't see getting to the Garneau items. Um, so I'm just wondering uh, if, well, I, you know what, I'm just, I'm not suggesting we yeah. move anything right now, but I'm wondering if we have a process we can you know, notify people when we get there rather than making them sit all day waiting? I, there may not be a way to do it. I just thought I'd ask that question. Yes, we, we do have resources that we could, um, it, would, it would probably be most effective to send in an email if that was an option for the speakers to keep tabs ra rather than making potentially 20 phone calls um, urgently. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. yeah um it is a safe bet that the first batch of items three, two through three, seven will take perhaps half an hour to an hour of questions of administration on these items. Those should go fairly quickly. Then we're gonna get into the Richford item, which has a dozen speakers on it. So that's gonna be a couple hours. So um, everybody after that can probably check in at 3.30, I would think. Uh, though if you're on the Calder item, uh, I would I would stay with us just in case things move quickly. Um, then we'll be into Cromdale uh, in the in the afternoon, and then perhaps into Big Lake in the afternoon or into the evening. Then we will get to Holyrood uh, late afternoon or or early evening, and we'll get started on that. It's possible we could finish it, so we'll need to keep in touch. But I, I do think, and I am notoriously bad at estimating these things, but I do think that the law of gravity basically, unless something significant changes, means there's no way we're talking about either of the Garneau items before dinner. So if you are here for one of the Garneau items and you have something better to do with yourself for the next several hours, um, you might check back in with us at... Uh, at 7 p.m. Uh, when we continue, unless we want to change orders. That's the other question uh, to council is whether we wish to make some changes to orders on the front end now. Um, the first of which would be continuing tomorrow morning. We have time freed up from council uh, not continuing. So for those people whose items may spill into the overflow time, uh, um, the first recommended overflow time, which again, probably won't be sufficient to complete all the items, would be tomorrow morning. So. Let's do, let's do agenda management right now first, uh, so we can give advice to people about making 
uh, fruitful use of, of each of your time, the hundreds of you who are signed up. Uh, so thank you for flagging that, Councillor Henderson, before we get into the business. Um, so first on changes to orders of the day. Well, I, I would move that we add that we continue we continue public hearing tomorrow morning at 9.30 from 9.30 to noon. Yeah. One suggestion was we could start as early as 9. I don't know if that conflicts for people, but uh, the clerks were checking in with folks about timing. The default would be 9.30 to noon. <coughs> Does anybody object to starting at 9 instead of 9.30? That would give us just an extra half hour to keep trucking tomorrow. So I'm not hearing objection to that. Is that friendly, Councillor Henderson? Okay, yep. so we would ex we would extend orders to carry on this meeting at 9 a.m. tomorrow until noon. Uh, so um, we can just take consent on that if you want, or do you want to vote for that one? Uh, we always <coughs> prefer a vote, but I would defer to you, Mr. Chair, if, if unanimous consent I did, is I sufficient. I didn't hear any objections, so I think uh, we'll presume unanimous consent uh, for 9 to noon tomorrow continuation. Do we want to make any other changes at this time by, for instance, shortening the dinner break uh, by half an hour um, to resume at 6.30, so we would have an extra half hour this, this evening? I might why I think it might be better to make that decision later because if people have the ability if it if we're almost finished an item it's at 530 it might be worth going oh to six. we might want to okay um, okay good point we'll leave the flexibility we may shorten the break the but if we sh end up shaving it off the back end and we tell people to be back here at seven and we actually start at 630 then I just as long as we don't get into the Garno items we're probably fine if we do that so okay let's leave the dinner break question and we'll just say that we're not going to start the Garno items before 7 p.m. Okay? Okay, so if you're, if you're on for Garno right now, check back in with us at 7, and when we uh, convene at 7 o'clock, we'll give an update as to where we think we're at agenda management-wise and what, other, what, if any, other times we've laid on. Safe bet that we, even if we start with you tonight, we won't finish with you tonight, and, we, and so you may wish to make arrangements to try to attend tomorrow from 9 till noon. And then that still may not be sufficient, and we are looking for additional overflow times. At this point, those may run into next week because of other council business that's before us. Um, so I think that's as much as we can do right now, but thank you for that, Councillor Henderson. Any other agenda management questions? Uh, apologies, Mr. Mayor. While we didn't need a vote, we do need a seconder on that order as well. I'll second. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Second. Councillor Nichol seconds the change to the orders to add tomorrow morning. Okay. So then I'll test again. Unanimous consent to that. Any objections? Hearing none. So ordered. Um, all right. Uh, Councillor Hamilton, you had questions on. Item 3.2, the uplands. Yes, yes, which will no doubt win me the favor of everybody on the line today. But um, item uh, in the report for item 3.2, um, could you explain to me why you went to the Wedgwood Community League for uh, at, as part of the notice um, for this item? on the line to answer that question? Hey, um, when we do our circulation, we there everything is in the, the our technical system and it attaches itself to the closest community league that it finds. And that is the one that came up for this application. So what I'm struggling with is that there is a community league to the north and one to the east both of which are physically closer. And uh, we have like five or six applications here that consult a community league that have no physical um, tie uh, to these this area and are in fact on the opposite side of the Anthony Hende. It may have something to do with it being a 2020 file. I'm not entirely sure. Uh, we are doing an audit of our community league contact information. When we get the we we get the information from the Edmonton Federation of Community Leagues, 
and they get it from the community leagues. So it, there is a time lag there often as what ha what's happened recently. So All right. I, well, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I just, that's, it's the way it's set up and it is for the community leagues to contact the Edmonton Federation of Community Leagues, but we are trying to get on top of that. And thank you for pointing out a few of them. All right. Um, yeah, I'm, I, it's like three, two for, through three, seven, I believe contacts uh, sort of aren't current. Um, and, and I had, did have a specific concern about no shade to the Wedgwood community league, just that they don't have a physical or economic tie to the area. So um, I'm just flagging that for you. Um, I have no further questions. So if nobody else has further questions, Mr. Mayor on this, I will move um, closure. I must check. quickly check to see if there's new information. Big surprise, there's none. So um, uh, I will accept the motion to close public hearing, uh, seconded by Councillor Banga. Please vote. And we have 12 votes, Mr. Mayor. Display the vote, please. I'll move first reading. Second. Uh, please vote on first reading. We have 12 votes. Display the vote, please. Carried. I'll move second reading. Second. Please vote. And we have 12 votes, Mr. Mayor. Display the vote, please. Carried. Um, I'll move consideration of third reading. Second. To allow third reading to proceed, please vote. We have 12 votes, Mr. Mayor. Display the vote. Carried. And I'll move third reading of Charter Bylaw 19677. Second. On third and final reading, please vote. We have 12 votes. Display, please. Carried. Next, then, Councillor Henderson had questions on. Well, if uh, Councillor Hamilton has questions first, I would defer to her. Mine are fairly specific. Okay. Councillor Hamilton, as ward councillor, do you want to go ahead on 3-3 three, three to 3-5? Three, Thank you. Um, I also have fairly specific um, questions about this. I'm just pulling up my notes here. Um, uh, something I flagged in this was that as part of this plan amendment, um, there's the removal of a direct connection between the town centre from 192 Street Collector um, and the uh, a less direct connection, albeit a shared use use a shared use path, um, is being provided along Muskegosi Arterial and 192 Street. I want to understand this choice a little bit better. Muskegosi is a fairly busy road, and I know there's um, some upgrades happening to it as we speak, but. Um, uh, Councillor Knack pointed out to me that removing that direct connection to the town centre might be something that we really regret in a couple of years. So could you help me understand that a little bit better? Thanks, Councillor. Uh, Mr. Fazal Saeed will field that question. Uh, Councillor Hamilton, uh, uh, you're correct in identifying that uh, this, this connection makes sense and that's where we have highlighted in the report as well that um, removing that connection will uh, will not necessarily be uh, complying to the policy direction provided in the plan as well. Uh, we have had this discussion with the applicant um, and um, the request uh, that we communicated was to keep it intact, but, uh, uh, but it was uh, not accepted. Uh, the justification that was provided was uh, that a connection is available through Muskegon Sea Trail, which uh, we think is more of a district uh, connector type connection, not necessarily a localized connection. 
and a direct connection as shown in the current plan will definitely be beneficial. Um, so to understand what you're saying, that I'm correct in understanding that uh, a direct connection is being removed, but the added piece is, uh, is the less sort of a, a connection through Muskegosi. Uh, what you see in cyan color uh, uh, labeled as added, uh, that is uh, that is done more for clarity because um, um, this uh, collector roadway, which is uh, within the pedestrian zone, uh, is already identified as a pedestrian friendly uh, uh, type uh, better or enhanced um, uh, pedestrian realm uh, that should be provided within this collector roadway. So this, this uh, cyan color is primarily providing more clarity to the plan. Um, uh, policy spoke about it, but it was not shown on the plan. So that's the change happening in terms of adding that connection. Sorry, so are you, I'm, I'm really, I don't know if it's, you know, a Tuesday issue, I'm not understanding. Are you expecting people to walk or bike down Muskegosi Road instead of having that internal network connection within the neighborhood? Uh, that's, that's what I mentioned earlier that uh, our position uh, originally uh, has been that we retain this connection, but uh, um, the applicant uh, uh, was not acceptable to to that uh, um, option, and uh, uh, we have have uh, we have seen a subdivision uh, uh, submission which does not include that connection, and that's where um, I think the applicant would be in a better position to uh, to clarify their position. And and so thank you for your your clarity. Um, before I go to the applicant, could I ask you if you're aware, um, I don't have this offhand, what the speed limit on Muskegosi is and if there are what if there are segregated pedestrian um, uh, and cyclist thoroughfares being uh, implemented on that road? Yes, and that road is yet to be constructed. Uh, so mm -hmm. but it will be an arterial with a shared use path which will be three meters wide. Uh, mm -hmm. on both sides of the roadway. And as far as uh, speed is concerned, it will be uh, 70 kilometers per hour, uh, but this is the road that will carry significant amount of traffic. Yeah, as it already does. And I just wanna flag, this is another community where, again, um, there wasn't, the, the notice went out to Wedgwood Ravine community and not to Edgemont, which I thought might have something to say about um, pedestrian connections so close to their boundaries. Um, uh, okay, I'll leave it there and uh, see if Councillor Henderson has questions and then maybe ask questions of the developer under new information. Thank you, um, Councillor Henderson. Yeah, uh, my, my question was on the same subject and I, you know, I think Councillor Hamilton's covered most of it, but I, I had a, I wanted to augment it slightly because my other concern about this is we're taking a direct route that connects into the neighborhood and making it circuitous. And that's one thing to do for vehicles, but you know, not connecting to actually the destination where people wanna go from where people are starting from has a much more severe implication for pedestrians and for cyclists. They won't go around in the same kind of way. And we've been desperately trying not to do that. That's why this stuff was put forward in this plan in this kind of way. And I'm really concerned. It feels like a kind of, in terms of these active transportation links, a kind of bait and switch at this point, quite frankly. Um, and, uh, and I just wouldn't mind administrations thinking on that piece of the puzzle. Because I'm guessing we're adding significant distance for, the, for, the, for both the pedestrian and for, the, and for the, the cyclist here to actually get to the destination that's supposed to be pedestrian friendly, correct? It will be a circuitous route, you are correct. And, and the destiny in it, this is connecting the residential neighborhood into the core, which we want people to be able to easily get to using something other than getting in their car. And that's the intent of these policies, correct? That is correct. Okay, well, I, I share Councillor Hamels's concerns about this. I'm not sure how to rectify this, um, but I would be interested also in hearing from the uh, applicant. Thanks. 
Thank you. Um, Councillor, I don't have the list up. Councillor Knack, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Sorry, just one last uh, maybe qu question. So if I heard you correct, Mr. Saeed, uh, independent of this application, there's going to be a multi-use trail on the Skekochi Drive. I th think I butchered that name. I got to work on it. Sorry. But that, that's happening either way, correct? That is correct. Okay. The expectation is that that circular collector would have proper connectivity because that has been identified as a pedestrian friendly area. So again, independent of this application, we would actually likely expect that. We, we are gonna formalize it now, but but we wouldn't give them a, let that not be included as a part of a development permit, correct? Th that is correct, yes. So then truly from a transportation perspective, this doesn't add anything new. It formalizes something we would have done, and then it actually removes a direct connection. That's so. This is that's my interpretation. Is that correct? That is absolutely correct. Like I said, right. that it provides that's more clarity. That's helpful. Yeah, I, I would be very interested to hear from our uh, applicant because I don't know if that's the right decision. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so uh, we went to questions of administration first. Uh, and so then now under new information, um, perhaps Ms. Raymond, some questions have been put um, under new information. You've got up to five minutes and then there may be some follow-ups if you're, are you with us, Ms. Raymond? I am, thank you. Go ahead. Uh, I guess uh, to start off, I think it's important to note that when this application was, when the policy was originally written, it was before we had the complete streets and it was before the inclusion of shared use paths along arterial roads on, on both sides. So this application came back or when we originally did this uh, and this stage has actually been zoned already that we're speaking of. Um, so when we did it originally, we had conversations with a transportation group in 192 Street as a collector. It's a sorry, it's a complete street. And part of that is it's an enhanced focus on pedestrian connectivity. And at the time, the arterial didn't have the two, the two shared use paths on both sides. So essentially, it was a redundancy of infrastructure within 100 meters of each other. Since then, we've had the conversation with administration on focusing that uh, connection along those uh, Riverview Boulevard is what it's called there, or Uplands Boulevard, sorry, and working together with them to provide that connection and holistic connection throughout. So this is, is tech. Technically, it's a cleanup item for conversations that we've been having to date. We actually, the lands are already zoned. This one is just amending uh, the one use uh, for that block shell. And it's more of a formalization of conversations that were had multiple years ago. And unfortunately, I don't know if Kelly Sizer is available to speak to that, but that's really what this is. It's more of a cleanup item. And that, like uh, Basil said, it's that clarity of adding in the Sienna lines that uh, Qualico has committed to providing that extra connection and connectivity. So I guess that's one point of clarity on that one is it's not an official removal. This is more of a cleanup item for conversations and agreements that have been had many uh, before, like this whole stage has been designed and is ready to go for development. And actually, if it wasn't for COVID last year, we would have constructed it in 2020. So it's not that we're looking to go backwards and we're definitely not looking to take anything away. Qualico has spent a lot of time with uh, administration in enhancements. And what you'll actually note on that uh, map that you've seen is there's the addition of extra connections into Mill Creek Ravine as well. So we're not looking just to take away. We're definitely focused on where the priority um, and where we can get the best use of, of providing this extra infrastructure. And Again, that link along 192 Street, which also has a shared use path, that at the original time that this policy was drafted, didn't have the two shared use paths along the arterial like we do now. So that cross-section design standards have changed, and we also have the implementation of complete streets. So we've been able to modify and work to collectively with the design team on where we are today. And from our perspective, this is more of a cleanup item, um, at which has we've, in our opinion, we've um, maximized the connections and we, we feel we've met that intent. 
through uh, conversations with administration. So I would be surprised to hear otherwise. Thank you. Um, I'll go to Councillor Hamilton first. Um, I'm, I, I was just hanging off for a second. I wanted to hear from Councillor Henderson and Nack, so I'll see you okay. to them. Sure, Councillor Henderson. Yeah, I, well, unfortunately, I don't know the area as well as others. So, uh, uh, but um, my, my concern is, uh, is about the distance question um, and the direct route question, because as, as I understand it, and this is, you know, we're not picking this out of thin air, this is in our reports. Um, we have we had a direct connection through to what's designed to be a pedestrian friendly core central area um, that had a central connection as I saw it out to the residential part of the neighborhood. So you actually had destination connected to where people were living that is now turning into a circuitous route that's going to add distance, and and that's why I think you know we you know we we spend an awful lot of time looking in the past, many years ago, at active transportation connections that went nowhere. Um, and my concern, is, and we were great that we were beginning to get these plans that actually had active transportation connections that were connecting to the places people want to go. So I'm very concerned to see them coming out because pedestrians will not go around in the way a vehicle will. So your thoughts on that? The, the intent of the active modes was definitely, it's, it's twofold. It's not just a focus on pedestrians. It's a focus on cyclists as well. Absolutely. So, yeah. Part, yeah. So, and I think that was a key thing um, with the interpretation of the way it was done in the policy is it's, um, the intent into the city or the commercial area there was not necessarily focused on cyclists. So again, I, unfortunately, I don't have a plan in front of me, but to go backwards in time, when the, when the in initial policy was drafted with this neighborhood, it was the other components that weren't available. Like there wasn't this shared use path in the arterials on both sides. And from our perspective, what we've done is we've enhanced it. Uh, we've worked collectively. We've worked together with administration to provide the complete streets design and I, I honestly we've gone above and beyond in our opinion in some of these extra connections especially on the west unfortunately this they're connected here but on the west you'll see some changes as well so from my perspective and the conversations that i've had with administration is this collectively is a better route and it's well planned out and it, it works and i it wasn't at any point ever communicated to us that we were taking anything away, and it was never our, our impression or of that as well. So the connections are there, and it's just a matter of making sure. And this was a cleanup item from our perspective. So I'm a little caught off guard by this. Well, I, you know, I, it, which is why I asked to ask questions to the administration first, because I was responding to their comments in the report that come from transportation. So... Um, and I, you know, and it's and it's frustrating because I do I do think it's one thing to have to have good separated infrastructure, which it sounds like you have, but it's also the the connectivity, which is much more important, the direct connectivity, which is much more important for a bike or a pedestrian than it is for a vehicle, which will easily go around in ways that pedestrians and bikes won't. Um, okay, well, I'll wait to see what Councillor Nack asks. That th those those are my concerns. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Knack. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so Councillor Anderson asked most of my questions. I guess the, the one remaining for me is, is retaining this connection, how does that harm the development if, if that was to be retained? Like from our, based off of conversations that we've had in the past, so this entire area is it's designed, it's already zoned, the subdivision's approved and the engineering drawings are approved and we're ready to sign a servicing agreement and get constructing on it uh, imminently, like next week. So this would uh, definitely impact that stage directly. It would, it would be a complete change to the design. So there was no plan to have any type of like even uh, like, so this connect and, and forgive me because I want it. That's what I'm trying to understand here. So um, sometimes these direct connections are put in through utility right of ways. Um, so was that like, were we already going to have that? And this would have just, you know, capitalized on that or would this actually be 
requiring you to, you know, take out a row of homes to, to maintain a connection. Do you have any, that's what I'm trying to understand. Like, oh, how, how does that? Yeah. I guess there's, there's opportunity to provide connection through an existing local road. Um, so that, that exists, but as far as adding additional walkways, then yes, that would definitely change the entire subdivision plan. Okay. So, so the, that, that local road, so again, walk me through it because I won't have as much. The, lo the local, now. the local yeah. road connection that I'm speaking of is essentially 35 meters off of Muskego Sea Trail. So that's the redundancy of the infrastructure that we're speaking of. So it com we come down 192 street and that, lo that connection is literally 35 meters north of Muskego Sea Trail. So you'd have shared use path running parallel, um, potentially shared use path. It doesn't necessarily um, need to be shared use path if it's it's an active mode. So it's it's not specific to cyclists. So I guess there that was just the intent of, of removing the shared use path component. There's still pedestrian connectivity. There's still local roads. There's still walkways. That's that connection that you see with that orange arrow still exists. It's just not enhanced for any to uh, to uh, for cyclists. I guess would be the the main point of it, and that was because of the proximity to uh, Muskego Sea Trail and so, the duplicate. Okay, that's help. That's helping. So so yeah. let me just ask this one last question then to to make sure I'm I'm interpreting it right. If I was living on those homes along that road and I wanted to access the town center would i be required under this change to go on to muskego uh, yeah. muskego c drive or can i still is there still a pathway a sidewalk a, there's still yes. an opening to get me into there i yes. might ride my bike on a sidewalk which i know we don't necessarily love but but i can yeah. walk directly without being required to exit out onto an arterial road a thousand percent. Yeah, that road okay. connection, everything is still there. It's just the, the title of it being an active mode. That focus was put on to the connection along to on Muskego Sea Trail. And it's still okay. and it, okay. so the road, the connection, everything still exists. It's just the designation. And that was where the work that we've done with administration. Oh. We really want to focus on providing that extra enhanced collector experience along the the commercial area and everything that you see in there so yeah. and, that's and the, that's the difference yeah. we're not removing a road there's still connection there's still local yeah. internal you can walk there you could yeah. bike at all of those okay that's that's helpful context i really mm -hmm. appreciate and there's nothing stopping you uh from making sure that's a nice pathway for people to use instead of because you would want that for your uh customers even if it's not labeled that way okay correct yeah it's just Good. the label that that's being removed <laughs> okay all yeah. right i think i've answered that have my questions thank you very much thank you councillor hamilton i think councillor knack got the substance of what i was getting at but just for the the um posterity could um someone from administration throw up the map that mr saeed showed us earlier we can get slide four up please yeah. Thank you. So, um, Ms. Raymond, um, that that orange connection marked removed, that was a shared use path. Now it's a local road and sidewalk. So we're missing that third component, but it's a redundancy because you don't need a shared use path on a local road. Um, but again, just to confirm that that access uh, that's what you're referring to that, that that access still remains it's just yeah so that arrow that you see is actually a road still it yeah. just doesn't have a shared like that connection is still there 1000 percent. yeah all right okay so i think that answers <laughs> i want to speak for my colleagues but i think that answers the substance of our concerns around uh the uh um uh, access into the neighborhood I could um, see if we were taking that, I could see the concerns if that you were thinking yeah. that that exact connection and road was completely removed. So yes, I'm glad we had the opportunity to clarify this. Yes, excellent. Um, I, uh, if there's no other questions or new information, uh, Mayor Iveson, I can move closure. Uh, let me just verify that there's no new information. Yeah. Not hearing any, then uh, I'll take your motion to close public hearing. Yeah. Uh, moving closure. I'll second. second. Uh, Councillor Henderson got that one. Please vote on closure of the public hearing.
And we're just missing Councillor Zadig's vote. Councillor Zadig. Yes. Thank you. Display Thanks. the vote. I'll move first reading. Carried. Second. First reading is moved and seconded. Please vote. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Zadig. Display the vote. And apologies, we're just missing oh. Councillor Katarina still. And we have 12 votes, Mr. Mayor. Display the vote, please. Carried. I'll move second reading. Second. Please vote. I'm a yes. My systems. Thank you. We have 12 votes. Display the vote. Carried. I'll move consideration of third reading. Second. Please vote to allow third reading to proceed. I'm a yes. We have 12 votes. Display the vote. Carried. I'll move third reading of bylaw 19689, bylaw 19672, and charter bylaw 19673. Second. Please vote on third and final reading. I'm a yes. We have 12 votes. Display the vote. Carried. Okay, that takes care of. Three three to three five. Next is three six. Councillor Hamilton had questions on that one as well. Go ahead. Yeah, that related to the earlier question. I exempted all of them that I identified a, uh, a issue with the community league consultation. So maybe a follow up for administration is. Um, and I don't want to debate the policy on consulting community leagues, but how are you updating? Uh, I know you rely on EFCL to get that information, but um, obviously it's not going to be much fun if we, we have to exempt it every time to point this out. So how are, what are we doing about this? Councillor Hamilton, it's uh, Tim Ford here. We, we will yeah. take note of that and um, make sure we do contact all the surrounding community leagues. I do notice with this one, we did uh, notify additional ones, which is the Cameron Heights and even the Greater Windermere Community League. So we'll, we'll take that to note, and any applications out here, we will, we will endeavour to uh, contact all community leagues surrounding the area. Yeah, because, yeah, Edgemont's excluded once again. I don't right. think it, it affects, this application affects them directly, but I don't think we're getting the best feedback either. Correct. Yeah, and we did have trouble with the previous Edgemont one, so we, we've noted that going forward, so we will with these as well. All right, thank you. Um, uh, and that was my issue with 3-7 as well, Mr. Mayor, if we wanted to bring it forward to Omnibus that. But I don't know if we can. Um, if, we, if I call for new information on 3-6 and there's none, then if it's the will of council, we can cross-reference the two and take a motion to close public hearing on 3-6 and 3-7 Omnibus. Second. Thank you. So uh, uh, closing first reading per Councillor Hamilton's motion, or pardon me, closing public hearing before mm -hmm. first reading. Please vote. We're missing... Councillor Walters, who your vote just came through. And I'm a yes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We have 12 votes. Display the vote. Carry I'll on. move first reading of, I just want to clarify that includes 3 6 and 3 7. Correct. Or just 3 6. Nope, both. Second. Yeah, we can do, we can do both. Okay. Because hearings are closed. So stacked up, first reading of those two items, please vote.
Sophia yeah, Kvapil. I mean, yes. Thank you. Display the vote. Carried. I'll move second reading. Second. Please vote. We have 12 votes, Mr. Mayor. Uh, display the vote, please. Carried. Um, I'll move consideration of third reading. To Second. Allow, to allow third to proceed, please vote. We have 12 votes. Display the vote. And I'll move third reading of Charter Bylaw 19674 and 19663. Consideration Second. was carried, so we can do third reading. Thank you. I accept that motion. Please vote. And we have 12 votes, Mr. Mayor. Display the vote. Carried. Okay. That takes care of the uplands and river view items. Okay, so we are coming up on three o'clock with the Richford item. Now. So uh, to the uh, Calder folks and the Cromdale folks, we are not going to get to you before the three thirty break. And um, but hang in there because we may still get to you before dinner. So. We'll keep on trucking without further ado. Uh, well, let's get the presentation on the Richford and from the administration. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Good afternoon and uh, to the members of council. Items 3, 15, 16 and 17 pertain to two plan amendments and the rezoning of land in the Richford neighborhood in Southwest Edmonton. The plan amendments propose to amend both the Heritage Valley servicing concept design brief and the Richford neighborhood area structure plan to change the land use designation for the subject site from residential to commercial. The rezoning proposes to change the zoning of the land from RR, rural residential zone, to CB1, low intensity commercial zone. Slide number one shows the land in context of the Heritage Valley SCDV. The Richford neighborhood is located in the northeasternmost corner of the plan area. Slide number two shows the Richford neighborhood area structure plan, which was originally approved in 1999. And slide number three shows the subject site in context of the neighborhood plan. Subject site is 0 0.8 hectares in area, was created as part of a residential acreage subdivision in 1981 and was incorporated into the uh, City of Edmonton as part of the 1982 annexation. As can be seen on this slide, the property is located at the southeastern edge of the neighborhood and abuts a major arterial roadway, that being Ellerslie Road. Slide number four shows the subject lands in more detail within the context of the surrounding lands and zoning. Suburban style residential housing is located both east and west of the site on land zoned RF1 single detached residential. The westerly housing is separated from the site by the 107th Street Road right-of-way, which is physically closed and does not provide vehicular connection or access to Ellerslie Road. Single detached acreage style housing is located north of the site on land zoned RR, rural residential. To the south across Ellerslie Road is a religious assembly on land zone US urban services and more singly attached housing to the southwest on land zoned RF1. Slide number five shows the subject site overlaid on an air photo and the surrounding zoning context. From this, we can see that most of the surrounding lands are developed. Water, storm and sanitary sewer services are available to serve the site from the adjacent roadways, but will require some extension and connection. EPCOR Water has advised that a water main extension and addition of hydrants Additional hydrants will be required to provide sufficient fire protection for commercial land uses. 
All utility servicing requirements can be addressed at the development permit stage at the expense of the landowner. The transportation impact assessment was provided by the applicant and it was reviewed by the administration. Highlights of the review concluded that the site's existing vehicular access to 107 Street must be removed and all directional access to the site will not be permitted from Ellerslie Road. Vehicular access to the site will be limited to a single right in and right out movement as illustrated in slide number six. As part of the review, administration considered collision reports near this location. Over the past five years, 22 collisions have occurred at the residential access located east of the subject site. The bulk of these accidents were rear end collisions caused by following too closely. This is not considered to be a high number of collisions during this time frame, and is attributed to the lack of a westbound turning lane into the residential subdivision. Lastly, an eastbound or left in vehicular access to the subject site from Ellerslie Road may be possible with the removal of the left out egress from the church, but this option will require further review, including, but not limited to, the impact of the church, the overall traffic safety and operational concerns, and design considerations for Ellerslie Road from both the short-term and long-term perspective. The northeastern boundary of the site, as well as the northerly adjacent properties, also accommodates a private roadway that is protected by an easement and provides physical access to a northern, northerly neighboring property located at number 53, 10550 Ellerslie Road. This access must remain in place to serve the said property. The CB1 zone is intended to allow small scale commercial office and service uses along the borders of residential areas and along arterial roadways. As such, the zone would be, a suitable, would be suitable at the proposed location. While commercial developments exist to the east along Calgary Trail and beyond, and to the west around the intersection of 111 Street and Ellerslie Road, there are limited commercial sites north and east of this intersection, and the proposal before you will add the prospect of a small scale walkable commercial site within the Richford neighborhood. With regard to city plan, this application is located in the Southwest District, is located along a secondary corridor, being Ellerslie Road, and would constitute a local node that will help Edmontonians to live closer to the goods and services that they need on a daily basis. This application would be consistent with a number of city plan initiatives, specifically supporting the ability to live locally and facilitate walkable and attractive mixed use development nodes along corridors that are integrated with transit. With regard to public engagement, advanced notifications were sent to 398 surrounding landowners in January. 41 responses were received and an open house was not held. One of the responses expressed support for the proposal and one was neutral. 39 expressed opposition. While more information about the nature of the opposition is contained in the report, most of the feedback can be generalized about additional traffic congestion, opposition to perceived noises and activities from the commercial uses, negative impacts upon property values and crime safety and loss of privacy. Administration received additional objections to the bylaws in response to the notice of public hearing and after the report had been signed off by the department and entered into the public hearing queue. The objections included uh, an informal petition as well as a letter of objection from the Black Mud Creek Community League. The most recent count shows 143 parties opposed and four in support. The reasons for the objections repeated the previously mentioned concerns and added challenges regarding the need for, for the, the need for the change that commercial uses would be better located elsewhere, such as closer to Calgary Trail, and a desire to retain the area for single detached, high value and high end homes. Administration supports this application as an appropriate use of the land at this location and recommends that council approve these bylaws. This concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. Um... Let me just get to the right page here. So, uh, Mr. Eidick, go 
go ahead. Thank you. Yes. Uh, good afternoon, Your Worship and Council. I did uh, submit a uh, presentation to the clerk. Oh, perfect. Nice. Um, yeah, uh, Your Worship Council, thanks for the opportunity to speak. I'm Ryan Eidick with Heinz Consulting. We're the applicant for the file. Next slide, please. I want to focus on two main things for uh, my presentation. The first is that um, the application, which Mr. Heinrichs already mentioned, um, from a land use perspective, conforms to higher level policy at the city plan level, but also the ASP level. Um, and the second is that we do want to acknowledge that the concerns that we will hear from uh, surrounding residents, they are real. However, we definitely believe that they can be mitigated through development permit phasing and um, through administrative, uh, through work with administration. Next slide, please. The first thing I want to touch on is um, just a note that Richford has not historically been a purely residential neighborhood. Um, in fact, in uh, 1999, when the NSP was approved, there was a 1.6 hectare parcel of commercial designated land on the southwest corner of the plan area. Um, next slide, please. That was removed in 2008 uh, through an amendment to the plans and a rezoning application. Some of you were on council at that time. Um, but what we've seen over the past 20 years as the neighborhood and surrounding neighborhoods have built out is that um, there's more of a uh, demand and a need for small scale commercial uses to be reintroduced um, back into the neighborhood from when it was lost in 2008. Next slide, please. Um, I just want to focus on the ASP. I think um, Mr. Heinrichs uh, talked a little bit about the, um, the conformance to city plan. Next slide, please. But the, uh, the Heritage Valley servicing concept design brief contains um, quite a bit of policy that supports this type of application. So um, mix of land uses within uh, and close to residential neighborhoods to create walkable communities. Next slide, please. Uh, creating local employment opportunities, very timely piece of policy that uh, allows residents to work nearby where they live. Next slide, please. Um, locating development where services exist rather than extending services beyond uh, city boundaries and uh, beyond where they already are. Next slide, please. Um, locating commercial areas, especially those that are small scale um, and pedestrian oriented near transit and residential neighborhoods. Next slide, please. And um, locating business employment areas close to residential neighborhoods and integrating them within the neighborhoods as well. Next slide, please. So this site checks off a lot of those boxes. Um, there's two transit stops that are on either side of the parcel in question. Um, uh, there's existing services, uh, even though the parcel is not connected to any of them other than municipal water, the parcel does have uh, um, services along Ellerslie Road. There's also a shared use path on the south side of Ellerslie Road. So this is very much an urbanized boundary adjacent to a rural parcel at this point. Next slide, please. The CB1 zone, as Mr. Heinrichs alluded to, is the most appropriate based on that higher level policy. Um, I've highlighted the purpose statement here. It's to provide low intensity commercial office and service uses located along arterial roadways that border residential areas. This is a very common um, zone in this type of circumstance. And I think we're going to hear a lot from the residents uh, nearby about the possible use classes that are permitted on site. But I do want to make the distinction that a lot of the ones that we heard um, were the more egregious ones fall under fall under the discretionary use class. So um, residents will definitely continue to maintain a high level of um, control over those types of businesses moving into their neighborhood um, through the permitting and appeal processes that follow. Next slide, please. Um, in addition, development regulations within CB1 related to additional setbacks um, adjacent to um, residential zone properties and a max height of 12 uh, meters re further reduces that impact as well. Next slide, please. This is illustrated through the potential development boundary uh, of the site in question. So um, there's an easement, a 12 meter wide easement on the east side of the parcel that has to be maintained for that access. So no development can occur within that first 12 meters that provides a natural barrier between um, those residences to the east. And then to the west and to the north, um, they uh, have almost 30 meters of physical distance landscaping that will be maintained um, and a three meter setback on the property itself before any commercial building can be built. 
In addition, all the access has to come south off of Ellerslie Road. Next slide, please. And this has been something that's been very consistent with the Transportation Department the entire time that we've been working with them. Um, they've limited it to a right-in, right-out access onto Ellerslie only, with the ability to have a left-in access dependent on uh, the church group, as um, indicated by Mr. Heinrichs. In our discussion with the church group, it appears that they are not willing to give up that left out, and that is completely fair enough. So it, it's appearing that uh, our access will be limited to Ellerslie road. Regardless, um, developers still believes that there's potential for the site for commercial and it wants to proceed accordingly, including um, urbanizing the site to include on-site stormwater management requirements and tying in and extending services for water and hydrants as necessary, all of which will be paid for by the developer. Next slide, please. And that's really what I want to leave off on is that this has land use policy that supports this type of application. Council has been very consistent in supporting this type of application. Um, and we just ask that council trust administration there's policy built into the land use bylaw um, and uh, our discussions already with transportation and drainage departments that will further mitigate some of these concerns. Happy to answer any questions though. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Questions for Mr. Adick? Council yep, I'm on the list. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Thanks, uh, Mr. Mayor. Thanks uh, for the presentation, uh, Mr. Edick. Um, so just as it relates to the road, to Ellerslie Road, uh, so you, you said the church is not willing to uh, relinquish their left turn um, heading back west. Uh, you know, is this something that you feel your client will persist on in the future uh, in terms of providing that left uh, northern access uh, off of Ellerslie Road? Is you, so you don't you don't get it today. Administration wouldn't support it today. But is that something that you'll persist on uh, down the road in your estimation? Through your worship to, to Councillor Walters, I mean, the question is definitely going to be asked if there's a situation where we can both maintain a left out for the church and design it in a way that allows for a left into the site. Um, but regardless, the application is going to proceed with whatever access we end up getting. Okay, so those are questions I'll have of administration. But just from your perspective, and, and you know, I know that the transportation planner from Bunt is on later, that, you know, my knowledge is that's as you head east onto Calgary Trail, Ellerslie Road and Calgary Trail is one of the busier intersections in the city. In fact, you know, we're working with the province at some point to overhaul that whole thing. Uh, doesn't seem, doesn't automatically seem like a wise thing for us to do is to, even in the future, sort of gum up that and any more uh, traffic on Ellerslie Road. So I guess if you live there and we're trying to, kind of navigate that road you know, each and every day, what would your feeling be? I know that's a hypothetical question, but I think it's, I think it's relevant. Yeah, through your worship to Council Walters, again, that, that is a hypothetical question. Um, I live in a central neighborhood where I don't drive much, and I do that on purpose. So it's hard to even make that, uh, that hypothetical answer. So I'll defer those questions to administration for sure. Oh, yeah, and, we'll, and I know your transportation uh, planner is up soon. Um, on the map that you showed, there's some trees on the north side uh, that separate the lot that in question here and the neighbor. Uh, what's the future status of those trees uh, in your view? Are those your trees or their trees? Uh, once again, through to Councillor Walters, uh, a little bit of both. Some are, uh, the majority are on our parcel, and uh, the proposal is to maintain as many of them as possible because you get credit for them towards your landscape standards and you can create a better buffer area anyways. You have to have a three meter buffer. There's no sense in removing the trees just to plant new ones. Yeah, that was a brilliant policy move by city council back in the day, for sure. The uh, But why would you need to remove a single tree considering the size of the parcel? Because I think if this, you know, I'm not, you know, presuming anything yet, we, we need to have a long public hearing ahead of us, but in the event that this was to proceed, why would any of those trees need to be removed? Uh, through to Councillor Walters one more time, I don't think any of them have to be removed. Um, so that that's not the intention to remove any of them. We want to create the, cre keep that buffer along the north and western edges as much as possible. Sure. And then on the on the western edge, uh, the buffer that you talked about in the in your presentation as well. So there's that little sort of round off there right now. So you're right in, right off right in right out will be a little bit uh east of that that land is made who owns that little strip is that a utility corridor of some kind that just remind me you might have you might have said that well, on the western side of the property correct uh that's it's road right of way 
it's all road right away. But that little bulb is going to stay, so it's not. There won't be a cut through where people can cut through off of Ellers or off 111th Street, and then come out there. So that remains is your intent. Um, and then you're going you're going to maintain that 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 whole piece through, throughout. Uh, so to Councillor Walters again, I, I, it's just like any road right of way. So it's maintained by the city. It, it currently is, and it continue, and it will continue to be. Um, yeah, but no access, no vehicular access will be there. Um, maybe a pedestrian access might be incorporated, but no vehicular access for sure. Okay, those are all the questions I had for now. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, um, Councillor Nickel. Councillor Walters asked most of my questions. I just want to confirm that. Uh, who will be speaking on behalf of your uh, TIA? Uh, will it be just administration or do you have somebody coming up? I, I, I missed that. There's a, a <laughs> presenter from Bunt Engineering for questions only. Okay, it's Bunt coming up? Okay, yeah. thank you, Mr. Mayor. You're most welcome, Councillor Banga. Thank you. Uh, just um, wanted to confirm a couple of uh, things. Uh, so again, um, you said uh, there is a possibility that there could be a pedestrian exit out of that uh, uh, that dead end street there. Uh, yeah, through to Councillor Banga, um, through your worship. Yeah, I mean there 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 is some discussion about creating a, a pedestrian linkage um, from the site to that bulb, but um, it would be pedestrian only. Okay. And from the from your uh, application, is there only one entrance in, one out, or is is there more than one? That's uh, what. Uh, through to Councillor Bango one more time. The the entrance that was contemplated in the TIA was only one entrance onto Ellerslie. If that does change and transportation allows multiple accesses, a new TIA would have to be completed prior to development to support that. For for now, it's only one. Correct. Okay. And uh, in your discussions with uh, uh, with uh, the traffic people from uh, administration, is there any room for indentation into the into the property for uh, right turners and uh, left turn? Uh, yeah, right turners again from both sides. Uh, through your worship to Councillor Bangi, you mean like a right turn bay into the site? Yeah. I would have to defer to administration on that. It all depends on the, the ultimate design for Ellerslie. Okay. And, but you never discussed that part there, right? No. And I might let Nicole from Bunt answer that if that was part of um, the TIA, but um, our discussions were pure, purely land use and, uh, and location of access more so than the design of the accesses themselves. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other questions for Mr. Eidek? Seeing none, we'll go to, were we able, yes, we did get Joe Marchese on the phone. Joe, are you there? Still? Star six, Joe? Please press star six. I am here. Can you hear me? To participate in the public hearing. Go ahead. Can you hear me, sir? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, my apologies. Good afternoon, Cal. I'll be brief with my comments respecting your time. The fact that there are several other speakers. Uh, my name is Joe Marchese. I'm a resident of Blackburn. My home is approximately two kilometers north of the proposed site by foot. Uh, as a family, we're active walkers. We're very familiar with the proposed site. We often walk to the existing commercial on Ellerslie and 111 to shop for groceries and do our banking. Despite the existing commercial amenity, there is a lack of local businesses and service, such as restaurants and lounge. For residents of Blackburn, McEwen, Rutherford, Southbrook, Richford, even Twin Brooks, we have to drive to South Common, to the current Windermere or Summerside for additional commercial needs, including dinner and drinks. Given the lack of community-based commercial businesses that are walkable to so many nearby communities, I am in support of additional commercial development at this proposed site. Thank you for your time and uh, happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you. Any questions for Mr. Merchis? 
Yes. Councilor Walters, go ahead. Can you not see me on the speaker's list, Don? No, <coughs> I, I, it's oh. not being displayed to oh. me, but uh, let me oh, see if I can open it in a different window here. Go ahead. I'll just... Uh, I'll, I'll check in with you as the default, so go ahead. I can just remember to speak up. <clears throat> uh, uh, Mr. Marchese, thanks for being here. Have you been given any indication by the applicant about what kind of businesses <laughs> they're going to provide to the community if this was to go ahead? It, through discussion with the applicant, uh, the one that popped up was the was, uh, opportunity for, for restaurant lounge, uh, more restaurant, I suppose, more than lounge. Uh, is the answer to that. So that's the one. Are you aware of any other types? Just in terms uh, of... Not, not that I recollect, no. Okay. Okay. And, uh, you know, I appreciate you taking the time here. Um, maybe just to repeat, how walkable would you describe your community right now, knowing that's a big emphasis of the city plan, which is our sort of in the hierarchy of documents, the sort of master here? Uh, so how how walkable is your community now and 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 you and do you see this as making it more so our community is extremely walkable as i mentioned I'm in blackburn so we've got some some top of bank trail we, we have our, our arterial road that collects the elders we uh through through the the west of my entrance to my home to the east um i can head out through uh through the Ellersley gift and garden be immediately on Ellersley road um Lots of walkers out every day. Ellerslie Road is busy with walkers. It's certainly uh, a gathering spot for a local commercial amenity, I, I think, would be very, very important uh, to to the overall community uh, from a walkability perspective. Okay. All right. Well, thanks for taking the time to be here. That's all I have. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. I can now see the speakers list here because uh, I'm in the portal, which, as long as it doesn't overwhelm the system will uh, allow me to see what's up. So I see no further questions from this interface for you, Mr. Marchese. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Farn, based on the questions that have been asked to date, did you want to say anything before we go to questions or just uh, uh, await questions? I'm happy to answer questions. Okay. Uh, Councilor Walters. Free time. Councilor Walters, go ahead. Uh, thanks, uh, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thanks for being here, Ms. Farn. Uh, so I guess the you know, the major worry uh, with any development on new development on Ellerslie Road, considering the traffic volumes on that road, is is any further impediment uh, there. Uh, noting that this is right in, right out, um, and, and I have looked through the TIA, but maybe it's an opportunity for you to verbalize what you'd be concerned about. Uh, if you were a resident there, uh, having the, the technical intelligence and know-how that you do, uh, and any kind of disruption on that road on the surface to me seems a bit challenging uh, considering how busy it is. So I'll ask you to just comment generally on what what changes, what gets worse, does anything get worse? What should be people be prepared for if this was to proceed? Sure, I think that access can be designed appropriately for this site. Um, specifically a right in, right out access. Uh, you'll note that I did not um, recommend a right, a right turn bay in the assessment that was completed. However, that could be an option at this site to be further reviewed, I guess, by transportation services, but that would remove any slow moving uh, westbound right turning vehicles from the corridor, um, which would allow for vehicles again to enter the, enter the site um, without again, impacting those through vehicles westbound on Ellerslie Road. Um, obviously, any traffic exiting the site will, if there's experienced delays, that delay will be accommodated on the commercial site and should not impact um, the Ellerslie Road corridor itself. So why didn't you recommend a, a right turn bay, so like a right turn lane? Uh, I think as, as Ryan alluded to earlier, we were looking more of the function of the access, sort of as a right in, right out, as opposed to the ultimate design of what the access would be, knowing that that would be revisited obviously, at the development permit stage. Okay, because I think that's one of the worries is that, you know, if the kinds of businesses are, you know, for example, a, a, a daycare that, you know, there's a lot of traffic around rush hour, or if there was to be, you know, we could all dream about a restaurant, but it could be a takeout restaurant, right, that is traffic oriented and people picking up stuff on the way home from work. I think that road, and I tend not to get uh, too fired up about sites these kinds of sites on on main roads like this but because of the traffic on this road which is really troubling uh 
uh, I just I, I have some concern about that. So if the type of businesses are sort of drop off, pick up, peak hour types of businesses, do you think that could be a problem without the sufficient um, term lane? I think that um, depending on the ultimate uses that go on the site, um, so at a rezoning level, I assumed a generic sort of commercial land use, which has a certain set of generating characteristics. If d different land uses that might be perhaps more intense generators are ultimately considered at the development permit stage, for example, that vary considerably from what was assumed, I think that a new and a revised TIA will be requested at that time. Um, and when details such as right turn bay um, requirement can be fleshed out at that time. I know that the city's access control management guidelines um, for right turn bays on arterial roadways um, identify that they should be on a context, a set context on a case by case basis. And so I think that's why once more is known about the site in terms of specifics and specific generating characteristics, as you say, um, if that movement will be more significant than originally anticipated, then I think that it's certainly a candidate for right turn bay development. So at the de development permit stage, um, I guess maybe educate me in terms of your knowledge of, you know, if the development permit doesn't necessarily um, speak to this very specific kind of business, I think we'd get to that at the business licensing stage. So I, I guess from your perspective, how can we be sure that we're going to make the right mm -hmm. uh, call on what kind of access should be there? Noting that trip generators at if, it trip, if they're chip generating businesses that are peak hour oriented, how does the development permit stage in your perspective ensure that we're gonna get the right access facility? I think that I would have to defer that to administration to how they control that sort of in the steps moving forward from this um, right. initial well, rezoning stage. I will definitely ask them that, but I just wanted to see uh, if you had any thoughts on that, but that's, uh, I think that's, that's all I had, Mr. Mayor, thanks. <laughs> Thank you, um, Councillor Nichol. Uh, thank you very much, uh, very much, Your Worship. In the same line of questioning as Councillor Walters, uh, not having the TIA, which unfortunately I, I, I don't see here, can you give me the, when you did your TIA traffic uh, impact assessment, uh, did you make an assessment of 111th Street and 9th Ave in terms of the performance as they exist today and the projections going forward? Um, no, I did not. Our assessment did not extend to include that intersection. Okay, and it, it does not extend it all the way to the east side as well. Did you go down that way at all in your TIA? Did not, no, sir. Okay, I'll ask. I'll ask administration those questions. Maybe they have uh, some answers for me there. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, and Councillor Banga. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, my my turn big question has been asked already, and uh, I just wanted to uh, explore uh, another angle there uh, on um, oh, just for uh, that. There's also right turn, uh, right in right access uh, turn uh, access only from the development. Uh, East uh, of the site, is is uh, did you guys uh, consider, I guess, uh, backing up of the uh, traffic lane outside traffic lane in conjunction with that uh, development that's already there? I believe you're referring to the all directional access that's um, upstream from our site into the. Uh, uh, residential development um uh, it's east of yeah by right by the ravine sure we looked when we looked at our site access there was no significant queuing identified along the ellersley road corridor that would have impacted that um upstream intersection okay and uh, how far is the next set of lights to the east from the location to the east, um, if you just allow me to make a measurement here. It's a pro to the east is approximately from where we're proposing, when we were proposing access is approximately 
800 meters. To the east. That would be at 103rd A Street. Sorry, about 500 meters, again, give or take. Is that all you need, Councillor Banga? Okay, that's good. For some reason, I got kicked out of the system, but now I'm back on. So um, would that set of lights would have any interference with uh, this new proposed development? So that traffic signal is located to the east of our site. Um, I mean, there will be eastbound vehicles queuing at that intersection, but since we're only talking about a right in, right out in the westbound direction, um, that should have no impact aside from providing potentially gaps in the westbound traffic flows that will facilitate the ability for traffic exiting the proposed site um, to move onto Ellerslie Road. Okay, all right, thanks. Thank you. Um, that is a good time to take the 3.30 break. So uh, we will resume with uh, Romeo Deal at 3.45, um, let's make it 3.47 ish 347 uh so when we're in recess for the next 15 minutes thanks
gone to sleep here. All right, everybody. Sorry, my computer had just gone to sleep. Um, so I'm going to call this back to order. The mayor st stuck on a call briefly. Um, so welcome back. Uh, should I should I do a roll call, or are we all right? Uh, of the councillors, that would be helpful. All right, I will do a roll call of councillors. So, um, uh, where's my just so I don't forget anybody. Um, so, <laughs> councillor, I think we start with that. I don't have the list in front of me. So, councillor Zadek. Yep, I'm here. Thanks. Uh, Councillor Katarina, I'm going backwards here. Uh, yes, I'm here. My, my, my alphabetical abilities are challenged. Uh, Councillor uh, Cartmel. Good afternoon. Uh, what does that bring us to? Councillor Essinger. Good afternoon. Uh, uh, Councillor Hamilton. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm here myself. Uh, Councillor uh, Nickel. Good afternoon. Nack. Good afternoon. Councillor Paquette. <coughs> Councillor Paquette. Okay. Uh, Councillor Walters. Present. Councillor Banga. I'm here, sir. Uh, I'm guessing Councillor McKean hasn't joined us. No, so I'll try Councillor Paquette again. All right, well, there's still... Um, yeah, I'm here. Oh, you're here. Great. Okay, so... Uh, all right, so I think that's everybody but the Mayor and Councillor McKean. Um, did I miss anybody? Great. Um, then uh, my understanding is Mr. Uh, Deol has, um, has uh, withdrawn. Uh, so we will now go to those speaking in opposition. And we will start with... Uh, Corey Fogad, and um, the next five minutes are yours. Thank you, um, Council. It's great to meet with you. I am here. I am a homeowner in the Richford area, specifically Royal Gardens, and I'm here to share some information I think will help with your decision making. So, next slide. Of the 204 uh, residences we knocked on their door and spoke to, 197 were in opposition, which makes for a 96% um, residence against the development. Next slide. We are on the west side of the development. Next slide. For visual, um, the left picture is our Royal Gardens, the applicants, and then the right is Ravines. Next picture. North is a $2.5 million estate. South is the church. Next picture. But I really want to draw attention to this map. So there are six um, arterial roads in the area for our Heritage Valley residents of nine, 96,132. That's a lot of business, uh, that's a lot of traffic on our road and it's very difficult um, to get back and forth. Emergency vehicles also travel along this route and we are very close to the intersection, the Gong Show, the greenhouse, uh, Ellerslie greenhouse and uh, Ellerslie um, intersection that people have been known to drive over berms, et cetera, to get to where they're going. Next slide, please. The traffic counts in the TIA mentioned approximately 25,000 vehicles per day based on 2018 data. Looking around at commercial uh, real estate that was being um, offered for sale, there's other, there's varying traffic counts. So 38,500 and my colleague Jasmine will talk about the 3,200 uh, traffic count that they found. Next slide, please. This is me standing where this intersection will be facing um, traffic that is coming west. Uh, this is non-COVID time. I can tell you in COVID time, there is no space between the vehicles. Next slide, please. This is the east slide, uh, travel, traffic, traffic traveling east. Next slide, please. There is a serious safety concern with residents in the Royal Garden area. The entrance is, going to going, is only going to be 315 meters away. And I can tell you that there is only one entrance and exit for 158 homes in that area. And from personal experience, I can tell you that if you have an emergency during rush hour, your times are significantly delayed because people can't get, or because the emergency vehicles can't get through the traffic. Next slide, please. The traffic impact assessment report mentioned that there is going to be a growth 
um, an expansion with the Ellerslie Road to Six Lanes, which is going to be an issue. There's potential land acquisition we'll talk about. Pedestrians is a bit of an issue. They're encouraging us to travel different routes. Well, the only way we can get to our house is actually through that in-out exit. And the, it's based on conservative numbers, which I would encourage them to think about larger long-term numbers. Continue. Uh, next slide. Uh, there was a new TIA um, created um, in response to our concerns, but I don't believe that this should be, um, it should not be rezoned just because of the traffic. Next slide, please. One of the big concerns we have is potential land acquisition. In the TIA report, it mentioned that they were interested in buying the Keyhole Crescent and developing out that, that direction. Next slide, please. That's where it is. Next slide, please. As you can see, the residents are standing 3.0 meters from their property line. Next slide, please. And next slide, please. We recommend that there's changes to bylaw 196. Uh, four nine, so that the western side also has a buffer included in that particular area between um, any development that is made if it is uh, even approved. Next slide, please. But not to leave you empty-handed, we're providing options. Next slide, please. My personal favorite is to create a BMX bike course sports field for people um, and also make a bike trail through the 107th Street and Fifth Avenue that connects and makes a safe trail for cyclists that are traveling, uh, trying to connect in with other parts of the, the city. Next slide, please. I believe that a CB1 is not required because under um, RR1, there is a number of different opportunities for the applicant, supportive housing, urban gardens, childcare services, lodging homes, et cetera. And they can also subdivide into two lots for two houses and uh, one exits on 107th and the other exits on a private road with permission. Next slide, please. Um, in response to we need more commercial space, there was actually just a rezoning of RR1 into CB1 on the other end at Fifth Avenue. And uh, there is also a space available in the northwest section of the Ellerslie Rugby Club that has a transportation corridor and nobody living there that would be a great opportunity for a bar, restaurant, or anything else. Next slide, please. And in conclusion, the Royal Gardens area is an island in a sea of traffic and commercial activity, and the proposal will impact the safety and the quality of life for people living in the area. I'm not opposed to development, but this does not make sense. And just in light of May the 4th, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, do we have any questions for Ms. Fogut? Yeah, just one. Uh, Councillor Walters. Thanks, Ray. Didn't click on. Uh, thanks, Ms. Fogut, for taking the time to be here. Uh, so the, just in your slide, the option one, you had an, an amendment. Um, I don't know if the clerk can put that back up, but that that would be an amendment. Your contention in terms of one of the options would be an amendment to just increase buffer if this was to proceed for to increase mm -hmm. buffer through what you proposed in that amendment. Well, I, I do not want that property sold to the city and then anything that is developed, we want that buffer that we want to be included in that con in that conversation about a buffer. Okay, so. Right, so you don't want that property sold to the city. All right, we don't want the property. Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. So what do you mean you don't want that property sold to the city? You're talking right, about sold, the... Sold to the developer. So the in, developer. In, the, in the TIA, it mentioned that there was a potential land acquisition, and that right. was the area that they wanted to acquire, and uh, we are against the, the acquiring of that land. Okay. That's an emergency vehicle turnaround area. Sure. Okay. You'd also mentioned that something is 350 meters. Uh, I didn't get from what to what. Can you just repeat? Clarify so where, that? yeah, where the in-out exit is for the proper for the development proposed development to our in-out exit for our residents is 315 meters. Okay, and the concern about that specifically is well, it, that it's not very far. So when I pull up to get out of my area in the morning, the traffic is backed up along Ellerslie East, and it's backed up along Ellerslie West. There's been many times that I've just turned around and went back home and told them I would be late for work because I can't get out of my own area. 
Okay, I see. I just wanted to clarify that. Yeah. And so then the argument is, you know, if that right in, right out is there, and that's impeding traffic even more, backing it up even further, those delays just get exacerbated. Yeah. yeah. And the other thing about the in-out access, like if anybody has ever dropped kids off at daycare, they know that they usually don't, you usually go left in because the majority of people living in the Heritage Valley area are going to be traveling east to Calgary Trail. So they're going to drop their kids off. They're going to have to make a left-hand turn in, right? And a right-hand turn to pick them up at the end of the day. So it's going to back up traffic any way you slice it. Okay, that's all I had. Thanks for uh, all the work. Yep, Appreciate thank you. Here. Thank you. I've uh, got Councillor Banga next. Thank you. Ms. Fogan, uh, in your uh, presentation, you mentioned... Ellerslie greenhouse traffic there. How is that impacting uh, your, uh, I guess, neighborhood and uh, or any of uh, this proposed development? So in uh, non-COVID times, the turn off as you go, as you come off Calgary Trail to turn right, there is a development that you would turn left to that backs up traffic and that backs up traffic on Ellerslie Road. So um, sometimes it's so busy that the backup of traffic goes down Calgary Trail. Like people will line up to turn right onto Ellerslie Road from there. And then it's just inching along. Okay. So during uh, non-COVID times, uh, you said uh, it's an issue. And uh, of course, COVID is not going to stay uh, stick around forever. And uh, uh, is that issue still exist at this, this time? Well, nobody's going to work anywhere. So, I mean, there's there's very few that are actually traveling for work. So it's a less of an issue. Okay. But there still is traffic uh, at four thirty that four thirty five rush hour that is an issue. Okay. That left turn from the church side on the opposite side, uh -huh. would that be, if somehow that can be negotiated, uh, let's say uh, the applicant negotiate that, uh, what they suggest in, the, in their own presentation, would that help if there is no left turn from that? I don't believe so. I think what we want on that Ellerslie Road is to have as much through traffic as possible and major uh, commercial buildings on corners and in major intersections, not in the middle of a street. There's a reason we don't have farm access on the Anthony Hendy. It's because it slows down traffic and it, and it creates problems. So, um, no, I, I don't, I'm not a traffic expert, but I, I, would, I would argue, no, I don't think it's going to help things. Okay. All right, thanks a lot. Uh, Councillor Nichol. Thank you very much. Uh, Ma'am, you might have heard my earlier questions with regards to uh, 111th Street, 9th Ave. You mentioned the greenhouse, and I did ask the applicant with regards to the traffic impact assessment. And But as we know, these are all network effects. And so I will we'll be asking administration what because uh, they come up with a rating right it goes through a through e or f or d or so, i forget anyways in terms of, so we can put it in context uh what is the experience pre well, let's talk about pre-covid conditions we, we're, this mm -hmm. is not the right word to use right what is uh what what are your the delay times you're experiencing on 111 street as they exist today as they exist at this moment oh, no, pre -COVID. my apologies pre-covid Pre-COVID, it would yeah. take me about a half an hour to get from my intersection to across the Anthony Hendy Bridge. All right. What about the, in, the folks in, uh, that have to use 9th Ave, for example? Yeah, that would be us. Or, or, okay. Sorry. Yeah. So we got 111th Street at one end, right? Yep. I'm very, I actually, I'm very familiar with the area. I actually oh, I'm very familiar with the properties in question because way back in the day they had i think the greenfield uh used to own one of the properties he was a former president of bombardier that i and i went to university with him mm -hmm. and uh that's why i know these properties quite well quite well so and so i'm just curious and contextually 
uh, 111th Street, uh, the greenhouse, right? What these delays that you're experiencing are up to a half an hour pre-COVID conditions. Yeah. So once you hit the, so if I was leaving in the morning on 109th, minute I turned right, there's a backup of traffic. It would take me about half an hour to turn the corner and get over the bridge. And then if I was traveling east, it would take about a half an hour for me to get onto Calgary Trail North. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Greatly appreciate it. Yep. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Fogad. That's all the questions I think we have for you. So we will go next to- um, Thank you. Uh, Ali Halat. Ali Halat is my husband and unfortunately he's um, he's been stuck in a an emergency meeting, so he might not be able to attend. Fair I've been enough. trying to get on. Um, you're, you're up next, um, and uh, if he's available um, before we've ended the public hearing, he's more than well, welcome to weigh in at that time. Thank you for understanding. I do have a presentation, which I'll just use. <laughs> Perfect. That is my presentation. So um, I kind of did this on behalf of my husband and I. So we... Are, if you move to the next slide, I just want to explain our location. We are the property that has an easement um, to gain access to our property through the opposed rezoning. Okay. So as you can see there, we have to turn right through that property to get into our property. It is our only access. Okay. It's the only way we can get in and the only way we can get out. So obviously we can't lose our access. And I know it's already been spoken that we will not lose our access. The thing is, is that turning right, if you move on to the next slide, maybe this will be easier to explain. Turning, like turning to our property, as you can tell on the left-hand photo, it's right after that bus stop, okay? It's already an issue, kind of letting people know, like we're, we're signaling far ahead, letting people know that, hey, we're turning right. Okay, to get into this hidden driveway. So it's already an issue. I have people honking at us. You know, it's 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 pretty, um, I'm not saying it's scary to get into our property, but we do have to give people notice that our property is coming and that we are turning right. Okay, it does it does look like it's it's a trail, but it is a hidden driveway. Not only that, when we leaving our property, as you can tell by the next photo, that's yeah. Oh, if you go back, sorry go back, sorry, to the photo to the right, that's what we see. We see a bus stop. So it's already scary leaving our property. We kind of have to shift our car back or forth to kind of be able to see what cars are coming or not coming. Now, if you move to the next video, I'm gonna actually show you guys a video. We actually, uh, sorry, this one, sorry, this one is from Ellerslie Road. This is at five o'clock on a weekday. This is where that greenhouse is before the set of lights to the property. This was five o'clock. It was, it took me, I think about 10 minutes to do the turn to even get there. That's how backed up this road is at five o'clock. This is going east, okay? So this is going east towards our property and the property that we are, we are in opposition about, okay? If you go to the next slide, uh, there should be a video on this one. It looks like the video isn't working. Can you try to see if you can get the video to work? Okay. Uh, we, we sometimes have trouble with videos. Oh, maybe there it is. is it okay, so now just go to the bottom of the uh, bottom of the picture. There should be like a play button there. Yeah, I... I... Okay. Unfortunately, we sometimes have videos are sometimes challenging for us. Um, okay. Do we think there's a solution to this or probably not? No, I'm, af I'm afraid. Yeah. Uh, it, I believe that uh, the format we have it in, it's, an, it's coming through as, as an image, not as a video. Yeah, it's, coming through, it's, it's coming through as an image, not, not, as a, not as a video. So I don't think we have any way of doing the video. Okay. Yeah. So this was just showing you guys looking outside of our driveway looking left and right, just to show you guys the traffic at five o'clock. Like this is when the light had just turned green 
like a, we kind of waited for that moment where all the traffic was coming. And I wanted you guys to see at five o'clock how busy, again, during COVID times, how busy that road is. So I can't even imagine, we purchased this property last summer during COVID times. And we already have, we're already starting to wonder what it's going to be like during non-COVID times going to work in the mornings and coming home. Because just as the, the property that like they're, they're um, proposing to develop, we only have a right-hand turn. We do not have a left. So our only way to get out of our po property and into our property is through a right, but we can only leave through the, only leave going right. So that's already going to be an issue. And we already see it at five, like at five o'clock. We see it coming home and we see it leaving. Even coming to the property is, is, is hard as is. If you, um, the, the other thing is, is again, we're, we're a hidden driveway. And uh, if you move to the next, uh, next slide, this was me, this is me and a, a, another neighbor of mine through the acreages, writing down exactly what is in the vicinity and how far it would take to get to these made to these amenities okay so within five to ten minutes we have you know two main two main grocery stores we have save on we have sobeys you know we even have a dollar store <laughs> you know we have a lot of things there are seven restaurants like if you look at what we have to the east and then like to the northeast like there's a lot there's a lot even to the left within five minutes driving within five minutes we're at south edmonton common like Everything is so close by. I just don't see why, or we just don't see why we need more in that area. If you go to the next slide, that's that's exactly the areas that I'm kind of speaking about. Anything in red, the area in yellow is the uh, you know proposed development. The blue is my driveway. And then in red, anything that's squared off in red is amenities or, you know, we even have dealerships that are nearby. So those are all areas that are businesses. As you can see, like we're, we're pretty surrounded. So if you move on to the next slide, this is just my, the concerns that we had. So it's a high density traffic area. LZ is already has traffic flow issues as I've noticed. And I know most of the people that will be speaking will can, uh, can agree with me. Adding another destination point will affect the traffic flow. I do believe it will attract, will affect the traffic flow. Um, like I said, it's already leaving, approaching and leaving our driveway is already, we do it with the utmost caution as is, okay? We've even gone into our driveway and seen people on our driveway, just walking, taking strolls. Another concern is if you put Ms. a, a Ms. development Helen. there and people turn into our driveway, it's a very, 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 very narrow Ms. lane to get in. We're, we're so, at the end of the five minutes, if you could sum up. Oh, sorry. Yeah, that's uh, pretty much all my slideshow has everything. My only concern is, again, the last point is if somebody drives into our driveway to get in or out, it's very narrow. It'll be very difficult for them. Thank you. And for us. And, and if they block it, we're, we're blocked into our property. Thank you, Ms. Halat. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you to Councillor Henderson for getting us restarted. I was just caught up on the phone there for a minute. Um, uh, so, uh, is uh, Ali able to join us or not yet? Michael doesn't Henderson. look like. Okay. Well, we'll we'll come back to him in a minute. Oh, uh, Councillor Walters, go ahead with questions. Uh, yeah, just one question. And, and Ms. Hella, thanks for taking the time to be here and and uh, outlining your concerns. Have you 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 said that it's. Not necessarily scary getting in and out of there, but it does sound pretty problematic uh, at the best of times. Uh, can you just kind of give me anecdotal information as much as you have about any accidents or the level of accidents or near misses that you've seen in a spot like this? I think that's often good local intelligence. I'll ask for organization for more specific data, but just what you experience. <clears throat> you know, I am not currently living in the property. I, I'll, I won't uh, deny that, I'm not. So, but me and my husband are there pretty much every evening and uh, we work there. We're, we're building our own property right now. And uh, we did a lot of work during the summer. What I have seen is I have, you know, driven into our driveway, done a right-hand turn and there are people right in the middle of our driveway walking, okay? Which is fine, we know that. So we take the utmost, Precaution when coming into our driveway or leaving 
right? Turning left, sorry, when we're trying to turn right off of our driveway, the bus stop does create a little bit of a safety hazard. I'm not going to deny it. It does. We have now learned how to kind of either move forward or move back to see what traffic is coming, okay, as is. Mm -hmm. My concern is if the, the I know when I spoke to Ryan, the proposed was a daycare. You know, there are going to be kids around. You know, I think safety, safety is probably my number one concern. Okay. By far, safety. And then obviously traffic. Right. So we have the bus stop, your so as we're heading east to west, we have the yes. bus stop, your driveway, the proposed right in, right out, and then the right in, right out, or the um the access to Royal Gardens. That's kind of the right. Correct. So that's yeah. You know, so I think questions we'll have for administration are how we how those all can function uh, collectively. So thanks for your time and for raising it. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councilor Banga. Go ahead. Thank you, Miss Hallett. Uh, just a couple of questions for you. I know when you. Uh, First of all, uh, I kind of, I drove around yesterday and I tried to see what the situation is uh, there already. And for some reason, I I missed your driveway. I don't know how I did it, but uh, <laughs> I, I, I couldn't find it. Anyway, uh, so this is between uh, the proposed development and, and, uh, uh, the homes to the east uh, by the ravine there? Correct. Okay. And uh, then you said, uh, yeah, of course, uh, uh, the traffic, whatever is there already, um, you have concerns even without the, uh, this development, do you? I have very strong concerns about this. And, and again, I know Corey and, and other people have focused on where this is during non-COVID times. I can't even imagine, or sorry, during COVID times. I can't even imagine during non-COVID times what it will be like. Okay. So you said your main concern is just the safety. Could you be able to uh, tell me how this uh, uh, right in, right out, from this proposed, uh, I guess, fee zoning would affect you coming in and out from your property. So coming in, the the way it would have to ha the way it would work is when I'm coming in, there could be cars in front of me. Depending on what is going to be in that development, obviously we don't know yet. You know, if there's multiple cars, for example, daycare five o'clock, and they're all trying to get in. It could impact me getting into my property. And then number two, when I am leaving my property going right, and if other cars are trying to get in to go into the development, that it, that can impact me too. Okay. Right? Because I, I could be turning into like traffic that it's, it's completely stopped, trying to do their own right-hand turn. Just being um, devil's advocate, wouldn't actually that help you get out? No. Of your driveway? No, because it's already going to be backed up if people are trying to turn right. Because oh. I have to turn, I have to turn right like after them. So if they're kind of waiting for a car to leave or they have to slow down to turn right, then I'm trying to turn right after them. So no, it won't. That that will be probably even worse. But they won't help my situation. All right. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any other questions for Ms. Halat? Not seeing any, then let's turn to Laura Buckler. Good afternoon, Your Worship and Councillors. Thank you so much for your time today. My name is Laura Buckler and my husband and I own and reside in the second house west of the proposed rezoning location. We are the closest property on the west side, which backs onto Ellerslie Road. We're strongly opposed with this rezoning. According to my understanding of the latest public reports and documents, here are our main concerns. Noise pollution, traffic and pedestrian safety, 
disruption of the natural environment and the surplus of available commercial space already in our immediate area. The rezoning is not needed, it's not wanted, it simply does not belong. The constant traffic and inclusion of frequent sirens is already at a very high level of noise, hardly get through a night with a full night's sleep, not woken up by traffic. Working from home the last 13 months, I can tell you that it's noisy all the time and we're not even back to normal commutes. The risk of a pub or a restaurant that can allow anywhere up to 199 people with loud music and partying is a huge concern for us. The zone change would dramatically impact traffic on an already overloaded roadway, and I'm worried about the negative effect and the impact with traffic and pedestrian safety. Creating an intersection, and I would like to emphasize controlled or not, with right in, right out, doesn't eliminate the potential of problems. Vehicles entering and exiting the site will still need to yield to frequent foot and bike traffic resulting in showing, slowing down the traffic even further. For now or in the future, I can't imagine trying to learn, turn left from the proposed site onto Ellerslie Road eastbound, even with the ability to cross halfway and hold up at the meridian. The closest lights at 109th Street have flashing arrows, which should be a good indication of what a nightmare this would create, adding any style of intersection as indicated in the TIA. It is estimated that 80% of the commercial generated primary trips will be from the west on Ellerslie Road. So if there's a left-hand turning lane into the site from the west, it'll also be challenging, especially during peak hours, making it more likely that rushed, impatient, and frustrated drivers will cause left turn accidents. Addressing the westbound traffic approach, similar to what Paula was saying, at the top of the hill, it's at the top of the hill that you get a full horizontal, completely unobstructed view of traffic ahead. And it's not achieved till you're actually at the east side of the site development property line, right where Paula's entrance is. And that makes sense. And she's saying she gets honked at. This gives you very little time to slow down for vehicles lined up waiting for those to make a right turn into the entrance. The zone change is not consistent with the area. We are situated in a natural environment. This should be preserved as low density residential, not disrupting the many various wildlife in our area. Uh, I've had a moose that just walks by my, walks by my um, east side uh, window. With a combined method of drive-bys, Google Maps, and Google Satellite, I, I took a look at every neighborhood in Heritage Valley and didn't find one CB1 with three of its borders as residential. I ask that you remove considering, please, that the most recent rezoning approval of 441 on 111th Street is similar or like to the one that we are addressing today. That property is at a fully controlled intersection immediately across from another commercial property and borders only one residential. It is in no way similar. While we understand and are sensitive that the city in general supports more intensive development along major, major roadways, there is just not enough current information to make a sound decision to approve this particular rezoning. The TIA's traffic report count is from 2018. The zoning maps of TIA have made this process for our community very confusing and unclear. The notice and zoning maps show the CB1 overlapping the west property line right to the middle of 107th Street. The TIA report shows the subject site ending on the property line. As the intent is not 100% clear, I'm also strongly opposed to the applicant's interest in extending the existing site property by buying the city's property located on the west side of the site. This would bring the development much too close to existing houses. More appropriate commercial space is available with many less issues and uncertainties. And until these parking lots are even close to full of active consumer activity, I question where really is the demand for more commercial? I thank you in advance for your dedication, for you receiving the concerns from myself and the community and the merits therein. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> any questions for Ms. Buckler? Okay, not seeing any, thank you. Um, Jim Ross was registered for questions only. Are there any questions for Mr. Ross from the Homeowners Association? Okay, not seeing any. Oh, sorry, Mr. Mayor. Maybe I will ask uh, Mr. Ross one question. Go ahead. 
Uh, thanks, uh, Mr. Mayor. So, Mr. Ross, just maybe um, we'd heard earlier about the challenge and the difficulty getting out of your area, out of Royal Gardens, um, whether you're going east or west um, onto Ellerslie Road. I just maybe wanted you to corroborate uh, the earlier story with your experience. <clears throat> it's so. Okay, Let's try again. Okay. Bit of echo there, but carry on. It's terrible. Uh, I'm using the microphone at the bottom of Google Meets. Yeah, we can hear you, but there's uh, quite a bit of echo when you speak. Perhaps if you turn down the volume on your device. Okay. Okay, is that better? Yes, marvelous, yeah. carry on. Okay, it's terrible getting out of here most times. If some newbie tries to leave, we've got a, we've got a double entrance, uh, incoming to the east and outgoing to the west side with a little boulevard. If a newbie comes, goes to go out and they sit in the middle of the, the lane, we all have to sit and wait to get out either east or west. I personally, on a weekend, will not turn east because the traffic on Ellerslie going to Calgary Trail is easily backed up to that property. And it takes three or four lights to even get through it, let alone to be able to take the overpass and go north onto Calgary Trail. I'll take 111th Street and go through that simply to avoid it. Um, our road capacity is very heavy and as, it, as it's mentioned, this property is at the top of the hill coming out of Blackbud Creek. And you don't get visuals, and I feel sorry for Paula, because uh, you're literally on her driveway before you suddenly realize you can see. Um, it's almost as if <laughs> the roadway should have been leveled higher or something with a match to original bridge. There is also the greenhouse, the Ellisley greenhouse has been sold. And that is a magnificent property adjacent to traffic lights and a high traffic area for whoever is going to develop it to put the small commercial in that area. But um, well, no, we have got one exit in and out of our entire homeowners area. Thanks, thanks, Mr. Ross. I, I will ask questions about presumed use for that Ellerslie greenhouse area for transportation purposes uh, as much as we can talk about that later. So I've heard that, yeah. yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. That's all, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Um, I see no further questions for you, Mr. Ross. Thank you very much. Uh, next up would be Parbji Daliwal. Welcome. Sorry. Hello. Yeah. Hey, sorry. I'm going to speak on behalf of my mom. Uh, my name's Mina. Um, okay, hold, hold, so, hold on, hold on uh, I'm going to read for have my mom. So I, Pinky Dollywell, along with my family, have been a minute. resident of Royal Gardens Please at Richford since 2002. Um, this is our for, forever I'm sorry, home. we have to, um, we, I'm sorry, yeah. we have to just adjust the registration. So, uh, what was your okay, name? Okay. I can, I can, I can speak. Okay. No, it's, it's okay. We just have to, we just have to uh, make sure that we have the, the yeah, right yeah, I, uh, that's fine. Um, um, I am Pinky Dollywell, along with my family, have been residents of the Royal Garden at Richwood since 2002. This is our forever home. Our entire neighborhood is speaking against the rezoning of 741 107th Street from RR2CB1, and we are requesting our city to listen to our concern and not destroy the peace of we all have. Along with the peace of our residents' family, and many seniors that live here, the city must preserve the peace of the wildlife, as wildlife is often seen on and near the site asking for rezoning. Our neighborhood is a natural habitat for many animals that are often seen and heard in our area, including but not limited to great horned owl, moose, deer, many type of birds, woodkeeper, uh, wood uh, woodpeckers, uh, coyotes, beavers, muskets, rabbit, and hares. There is also shortage of mature trees in our area and the site asking for rezoning. It is surrounded by mature trees. These trees alone, the site have been 
neglected and should be preserved. If the rezoning is granted, all these trees will be cut down. This is the natural wildlife corridor and should not be disturbed with commercial development. The other concern to be noted are the notice of rezoning was poorly distributed and the sign on the property was hidden in the trees for months and then top half folded over the with no visibility to the um, pedestrian or driving by vehicles. Otherwise, may more opposing ladders and speakers <coughs> would be here today. What study or research shows that more commercial sites are needed? Since so much commercial already exists, much more commercial is already being developed in and surrounding area. In the past 19 year, in the night, in the 19 years that I have lived here, I have never felt the lack of commercial service. The site is surrounded by three close communities. A gated community named Ravines, it has community board, Royal Gardens at Richwood has homeowners association and the acreage. Both the Ravine and Royal Garden pay monthly and yearly mandatory fee to their boards. We also pay high taxes for where we live. Will the city be lowering our taxes? What about the resale of our proper property values? How many buyers would want to purchase a home that has a pub or restaurant in the backyard? Would you buy a home house that is CB1 zoning right next to a home? Why did the developer conduct the church and the traffic department, yet not the people that actually live here? People do not offset the balanced communities we have by building a commercial site right into our residence. Our roads and resi residents will not be able to handle any more the traffic. So we, the homeowner, do not have hundreds of thousands of dollars to fund our defense, nor is this prim our primary job. We also do not have access to the information that other parties have, and we have cobbled together as best as we are able. The reason and intention for the land dispute coordinate conductory information provided by the city and developer. We are doing this as a volunteer and for the love for our community. We have a huge vested interest, but hardly any of the resources the developer has. If the city truly believe in this, its mission statement to think about the impact to its citizens of its division, we are speaking loud and clear now. I had just, uh, if you give me a few seconds, I have another see, thing. See. I see we added pressure, panic, or even a scare to the applicant after submitting the opposed material yesterday. As the applicant reached out to many requesting to speak and writing in support for the rezoning as of yesterday. Thank you very much for my time. Thank you. Um, uh, questions? Not seeing any questions. Um, next then would be Ranji Daliwal. Your Honour Mayor and Honourable Councillors, I'm Ranjita Daliwal and am one of the many original homeowners in the Royal Gardens at Redsport community for the last 19 years. My house backs on the 107 street and we love the privacy and all the uh, wide open area. If this development goes through, there is a pub. <coughs> and uh, all the noise we're gonna get is not, uh, it's not healthy for us. I have two teenager kids and uh, when they can open their door, uh, sorry, window at night, they're gonna hear that noise. What do you think, uh, uh, what they're gonna do? And uh, 
it it's gonna um, be very uh, bad for our uh, I guess uh, for our uh, bad for the kids and for us because it, it's not gonna be healthy for our kids. And also in summer, they would like to set up the tents in the backyard. And uh, because of the noise from the pubs and uh, the other stuff, they won't be able to do that. And we also uh, have lots of people walk on that uh, 107th Street and also uh, walk on the Ellerslie Road next to that property. And when there is a traffic, and it's gonna be, it's not gonna be safe for us to, even there are a lot of seniors, and it's not gonna be safe to walk on that uh, uh, sidewalk. And also uh, there is a house uh, on sale, that, that acreage house north of that building. And I think that uh, it is a multi-million house. And uh, that house uh, is on sale for last four or five months. When somebody see that there is a development uh, around that area, uh, there are gonna be a pub or something else like that, who's gonna buy that property? That's multi-million dollar property and and very soon looks like that also is gonna be uh, next for the rezoning and they're gonna be another one after that so we don't want that and also this property owner doesn't look like he's a uh, environment friendly there were large trees on that uh, Ellerslie road and on 107th Street. The large trees has died since he moved into that house because he's killing those trees one by one. And all those trees on that uh, 107th Street are dying right now because he did something to those trees. And all like why all those trees only on that property dying, no, nowhere else. And we, we supposed to plant the trees and uh, uh, help the environment, and and this guy is uh, is killing the trees. And uh, uh, how can he keep those trees uh, the way that guy said uh, earlier? Uh, Like if, if you have the property where we have the property and uh, have kids growing up, would you uh, approve that kind of property for the pubs and uh, for that kind of uh, uh, development or you would leave for the residential area? That, that's the big question for, for all of you who, who are the decision makers. And, and and we, we don't want any pubs or, or uh, restaurants in our backyards. We, we love our area and we, we want to keep it uh, nice and quiet. And I think there is enough uh, uh, space uh, for the commercial uh, building, uh, commercial for the pubs and stuff what we don't need in our backyards. Thank you, Mr. Dollywall. Thank you. Any questions for Mr. Dollywall? Not seeing any. Um, next then is Jasmine Nijar. Good afternoon, Your Worship and the Honour of our Councillors. I, Jasmine, am representing the homeowners of Richford, strongly opposing the rezoning. The public consultation shows that five phone calls and 39 emails responses were received. When in, sorry, next slide. 
In fact, 96.2% are strongly opposed. If you can see on that chart, uh, out of the 398 recipients, 232 were personally contacted. Out of those, 204 are opposed. Eight are in favor. That is one of those eight is the applicant and 20 were unreachable. The numbers are shown uh, clearly on the next slide. The public notice was not fairly distributed. I directly back onto the applicant's property and was not notified of the rezoning. Many residents in our neighborhood said they did not receive the rezoning public notice. Out of the 398 recipients, 155 are highlighted in the green is the condominium that is located on the corner of 111th Street. In the yellow showing the, the area that is closely affected but was not notified. Yet homeowners were notified directly on the other uh, neighborhoods. My home is also uh, highlighted on there uh, and, and you can see that I, I was also one that was not notified. Next slide. This rezoning would be dangerous to pedestrians. Many pet owners, seniors, families, and small children use Elegy Road North sidewalk for daily walking, bike riding, and access to path into their rings all year round. And not and the development of and not using the crossing on the church side because of the in and out access of the traffic. Um, this rezoning would make it very uh, dangerous to the pedestrians that are using those sidewalks. Next slide. On here, you can clearly see these are pictures. All the time is noted on top. These pictures are all taken minutes apart from one another. You can see um, families, those with disabilities, pet owners using both 107th Street and the Elegy Road for their recreational walking. Next slide. The proposal is to contribute to a well-balanced neighborhood. This, uh, this map is actually missing from the Heritage Valley that was presented earlier by the developer. Uh, everything is within 15 minutes. All those sections that are highlighted in red are all commercial areas within walking distance and eyesight from the site asking for rezoning. Next slide. Next slide. What it looks like from the ground. So here uh, is a breakdown of the services that are within eyesight within less than 15 minutes of walking from the, uh, the site. Next slide. I hope I have proved that we have enough commercial real estate in the area uh, and our area is well balanced. Commercial development of the acreages was just approved on 111th Street. Where is the market research that proves more commercial is needed? Uh, Paula had also, um, I noticed very similar stats to mine. Within two kilometers of the radiance of uh, the, the property is a large list of services that already exist. Next slide. Commercial and land is available uh, within less than half kilometer of the rezoning site. This is uh, this uh, is coming. The village is coming with uh, is already ground is broken and uh, construction is supposed to start as of October. Twenty thousand square feet available. Let me repeat: half kilometer from the site that is asking. This this space is for retail condos. Next slide. The, next slide. The village is one kilometer from the site. The village is another construction coming to our area. It, it's one kilometer from the rezoning site with almost 15 acres of land developed, shovel ready for uh, uh, retail. Next slide. In the, in the shops for LRG, this is the uh, close to the Walker Lake that, uh, sorry, um, the bar request that came out as, uh, as a person in, in supporting uh, or in favor of. Here you go on this list, you can see that the bars in the neighborhood public, all the services that the um, applicant is requesting for already exist within half kilometer from the site. Thank you. Next. 
Thank you, Ms. Najjar. We're at the five minutes. If you have a closing thought, very brief, please. Yes, I would like to go to, uh, sorry, the, um, my, my second last slide on 16. I'll just conclude it with 16 and 17. Um, CBI 1 is unfairly affected to further resale value of the properties with a minimum of 5 to 10% reduction on Sorry, sale Ms. price Ms. values Ms. of the surrounding homes. I, I have to enforce the, the five minute limit with some rigor given the number of people who've registered to speak today. So there may be, I've got to stop you there, but we do all have access to your presentation. So um, I will pause to see if there are any questions. Uh, Councillor Walters, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, Mr. Najjar, thank you. Uh, so just one question. Uh, you know, I know that you've spoken to a lot of your neighbors. Uh, just the sentiment that you share personally today about the, there's an adequate amount of commercial in the area. Uh, so noting the sort of traffic and access challenges on that road created by a new commercial uh, uh, ventures such as this. Uh, Fair to say, like maybe give me a sense of is that is that sentiment that you shared uh, shared by most of the people that you've spoken to that yes. they, they feel like that there's adequate provision of commercial in the area. I just wanted to confirm. Yes, so please. Thank you very much, uh, Michael Walters, for your uh, your question. Yes, the answer, uh, the information that I provided is actually not just by me. This is the information that was provided by all my, my fellow neighbors within Royal Gardens as I am a member of the, uh, on our homeowners association. So many felt comfortable and confident in bringing me their concerns, as well as a lot of friends in the acreages, as well as their reviews. Okay, thank you for providing the information and taking the time. Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, no further questions for you, Ms. Najjar. Thank you for your presentation. Next is George Schmidt. Mr. Schmidt, are you there? Good afternoon, Mayor, Council. Um, I'm a homeowner, a taxpaying homeowner in the ravines of Richford. And um, there's 49 homeowners in the uh, ravines there. And 46 oppose the uh, rezoning of um, 741 107th Street rezoning. Um, the um, point was brought up earlier about the uh, surface and underground utilities and both deep utilities and shallow utilities being uh, covered by uh, any changes that needed to be all the upgrades and changes were gonna be covered by the uh, uh, developer. Um, I don't know if there was any mention of what the costs would be for uh, all of the uh, infrastructure um changes that were being proposed and tossed around here um that these costs are you know we're talking millions of dollars by the time you do all the asphalt concrete signage entryway that's up to property line as well as the deep utilities that have to be pulled to pl currently there's a water service there's no sanitary or storm system hookup to that lot. Um, that is uh, something that I think is a concern. Also, the concern that I'm brought to, uh, into play was the uh, EPCOR uh, identified that the uh, insufficient water flow for uh, the additional requirement for commercial. Um, there's no uh, volumes or any kind of uh, stats put out with that uh, requirement but uh, without water um, there becomes a, a fire hazard uh, without uh, proper water volumes and pressures to the uh, community uh, of our community of the Richard Greens as well as all the other ones 
that are serviced by the water mains in Ellison Road. So this may require uh, an additional water main or upgraded water um, volume to be um, put in um, in order just to have uh, proper water for the, the area. Um, the other thing that um, was brought to my attention regarding um, uh, right in, right out for uh, access and egress to the proposed uh, development is um, what would people, uh, um, how would they access if they're going west or eastbound on Ellerslie Road and uh, they want to access the property, the new development, would they uh, have to go um, into the church parking lot or would they do a U-turn at our entryway and uh, to do an, a U-turn to go back to the west in order to uh, be heading in the right direction? We already have a lot of that happening in our uh, entryway as even without uh, there being a, a commercial development in the area. So um, a lot of those questions are, uh, you know, come to play because of higher volume of traffic and um, the directional flow of being right in, right out for access, as well as the bus stop, which is between our entryway at the ravines uh, of Richard and the uh, proposed entryway. So um, I guess if there's any uh, other information regarding the uh, public part of this, uh, which is uh, the mains water sanitary and uh, storm sewer lines, and do they have the capacity to handle uh, increased sanitary flow, storm flow, um, as well as the water that's required that EPCOR states is not currently there to uh, Mr. upgrade Schmidt. this uh, proposed development. Mr. Schmidt, we're, uh, we're at the five minutes. Have you got a closing thought? Uh, my closing thought would be, uh, is this all gonna be financed by private or is the public uh, taxpayers going to be responsible for any of the costs incurred here? Thank you, Mr. Schmidt. Um, Councillor Banga has questions for you. Thank you, Mr. Schmidt. Uh, I, I don't know where you exactly live uh, in, uh, I guess, in uh, conjunction to this uh, proposed uh, development. I just wanted to ask you, uh, are you in the in the Royal Gardens or are you in that gated community east of it? We're in the gated community, Richard Reigns. The gated community, yes. Okay, there, okay. No, that's fair. Then uh, I, I guess some of those questions that you did ask, yeah, they're valid questions. And definitely, we'll ask those questions from uh, from administration uh, about who is picking up the tab for improvements, if there are any, and if they're needed. If that's any comfort to you. Um, other than that, do you have any other concerns? Uh, safety of uh, trying to cross Ellerslie Road on foot right now is um, is very uh, questionable. It becomes, uh, uh, you sometimes wait five minutes or 10 minutes to get across just to go for a walk down the pathway. My wife and I some, you know, go out that direction a lot of times to our entryway and try to cross Ellerslie Road. And with increased stop starts, uh, it's going to be a challenge for us to uh, access and egress uh, the uh, entryway we have at uh, off of Ellerslie Road. 
as well as uh, there'll be more stops with people trying to make right turns. The right lane will be uh, congested a lot as well for traffic and safety of uh, of motors and pedestrians as well, for sure. Okay. So in front of uh, your, uh, I guess, uh, gated community, is it, uh, is there a crosswalk or is there a set of lights? I, I just wanted to get the feel of it. To tell you the truth, they don't even have a stop sign there right now. There's been a lot of questions about that, why we don't have a stop sign for traffic leaving the ravines of Richford. Um, there's no lights, no crosswalk at all, no. No. Okay. Did you ever took up that, uh, that question with your uh, homeowners association about uh, yeah. having some kind of traffic control device? Yes, it was brought to the uh, um, annual general meetings, AGMs, I think two or three times, and uh, someone on the board took it to uh, um, public works, I believe, or to engineering. And um, the answers have been, uh, you know, that if we were willing to pay for street lights, we'd probably be able to, they might look at it, I believe was what the... Uh, comments were at the AGM. Okay. All right. Thanks a lot. Uh, the water. Go ahead. Quite vital because if there's not enough water for uh, fire suppression, um, you know, a new water main would have to be installed to up the volumes. Yeah, we'll ask those questions. Thanks. Thank you. Um... I see no further questions for Mr. Schmidt, so let's hear next from Shelby McLeod. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak today to this rezoning proposal near my property and for listening to my neighbours and I who have made great points so far. It's close to my home, so as the saying goes, it's close to my heart. But please bear with me as it's my first time speaking to Council, but as a staff member with the Peter Lougheed Leadership College, where we teach university students to speak up to their values, I had to walk the talk and come here today. You will have heard most of this already, so I'll go quickly to echo my neighbor's great points. This engagement process has been difficult to participate in and even feels one-sided until today. So while I'm not the best spokesperson for our neighborhood, I wish to speak in support of those who couldn't do so today. I feel that we have to speak for ourselves because despite nearly 300 signatures and a 96% opposition, we're told the administration supports this proposal. I'm hearing business interests be represented more than us nearby citizens, choosing to benefit few at the detriment of the majority. I thank my neighbors for canvassing as volunteers to make up for this deficit. I especially give them kudos for doing this largely thankless task during the COVID pandemic, when there are other stressors and risks to going door to door. And I believe COVID has actually impaired other steps in this process as well. Uh, engagement between the community and the developer or proposed business owners has not occurred. I worry alongside my neighbors that the estimation of traffic cannot be accurate. And as is, there's already U-turns going on at the entrance to our neighborhood uh, 109th, which makes it unpredictable when I'm driving, biking, or walking. I'm also a bus user at that stop that's been discussed. The route to Century Park seems very simple, but it's already so complicated by the traffic. Uh, lastly, we have a long list of businesses conveniently nearby and require no more commercial access as stated. Um, as it is, I already can and have walked to lounges down Ellerslie Road and that option's there. We've been given no reason to believe that business owners will be good neighbours due to the lack of engagement, but they could be if they followed the example of the tireless homeowners who have spoken today. In conclusion, having never seen a business revert back to a residential property, this decision has long-lasting impact on our neighbourhood security property values, and more importantly, the security and convenience of our community and those that travel throughout it. I purchased this property less than five years ago and plan to live my life here, so I'm asking now for future plans. What backups are there, namely in mitigating future traffic issues for the new right-in, right-out intersection, possible decrease in safety for our neighbourhood, as it's so tightly interconnected with the new complex because of the access through our cul-de-sac, 
If you can provide any assurances or have any other options for future recourse, I'd appreciate hearing them as well. Thank you in advance, and thanks again for the opportunity to speak against irreparable damage the proposal could do to our community. Thank you. Um, questions for Shelby? Councillor Walters, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Ms. McLeod, for the uh, time to be here today. Uh, so you're very clear about what you were concerned about. Uh, often, uh, and, and I guess, uh, well, the overwhelming majority of people are opposed. There are a couple people that are in favor. Uh, so trying to speak for everybody. Uh, what do you see as advantageous uh, in this application? Do you think there's anything positive uh, that should be considered as we think about this kind of development? You know, and people make applications to uh, do all sorts of things uh, to add to the quality of life in the city. And uh, so I, I I wondered about your view on, on benefits, if any. Yeah, thank you for asking, Councillor Walters. It's great to see the, pers the situation from all perspectives, so glad to speak to that. I know there are benefits, especially for some more than others. Of course, people see the opportunities that they could be making business and getting a uh, business from the people who are already in this area. That doesn't benefit everyone, that benefits very few people. I know another aspect is that they might want to have more businesses everywhere. Edmonton is great for local businesses and entrepreneurs. However, we're also known for our green space. And I think that loss is a very short term benefit and that one, one that we would regret in the long term, particularly when I encourage those entrepreneurs with business ideas to go to one of the nearby properties that my neighbors have pointed out. Uh, could be the greenhouse, could be the other one down Ellerslie. There's already so much room for opportunity without taking away a green space and all of the benefits of this area as it is. Okay, thank you for taking the time. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Walters. Um, any other questions? Not seeing any. We'll go next then to Glinda Schuster. Glinda had a medical emergency is un and is unable to speak. Oh, I'm so, so I apologize on her behalf. I'm so sorry to hear that. Please give her our uh, our, our best wishes. Um, well, next, I have uh, Ravneet Mali. Oh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Thanks for this opportunity. Um, I'll try to keep it brief since uh, most of my points are mentioned by my fellow neighbors. I've been a resident of uh, Richford from last 11 years. So I share uh, the concerns mentioned by previous speakers about increased traffic flow. The area is already a hub of traffic related issues for all the commuters of Richford. And this development proposal will only contribute to the problem. I work in critical care and health sector. I already have to give myself extra 30 minutes to get to the bridge on Handy or Calgary Trail so that I'm not disrupting the transition of shift change at my workplace due to traffic delay. And there are already enough business space available um, near my area, um, as mentioned by previous speakers, like the one on 103 A Street, um, right around 111th Street, Ellerslie Road, and not to forget the new development just happening around the corner of McEwen and 111th Street. So what I'm struggling to understand is why there is a need to create another business space in the lush green community of Richford when there are several other business complexes already in existence within proximity. And definitely the business center on 103 A Street corner can use some support as some of the old businesses have been shut down and the spaces have been emptied for months. So we do need to encourage um, uh, to occupy uh, the already existing uh, business spaces available. Along with my senior parents, use Ellerslie Road and 107th Street sidewalks to access the ravine area for walking and biking throughout the year. And I know a number of seniors and other residents use the same pathway for morning walk, walking their pets and children biking. 
my friends from other neighborhood come to Richford for their runs because of the green space we have, the quietness, and the peaceful environment of Richford. The new proposed changes to convert this green residential area into a business zone just doesn't make sense to me. And it doesn't fit into the idea behind when this community was created, which was a low density and a quiet area. I choose to live in this community to raise my family because of what it was, not what it would become if this proposal went. As a healthcare worker, I believe this peaceful, wildlife friendly neighborhood in this nucleus of high traffic area does contribute to both physical and mental health of not just Richford residents, but also to the big community of Black Mud Creek. <coughs> I can say with full confidence, if a moose representing wildlife would be attending this meeting today, he will say to all of us, what on earth everyone was thinking to propose this new business zone? Please, we must all play our part to keep this space strictly residential as it was. Thank you. Thank you. Um, other questions for... Not seeing any. Thank you very much. And last but not least is Ashes Ray. Hey there. Go ahead. Hello. You may have muted yourself again. Try star six again. Unmuted. Okay. I Go got it. Go for it. We can hear you loud I, and clear. I, I, heard, I heard everybody. And um, everybody made all the concerns I have except one. My backyard, uh, I'm li living in the Richmond area. We were, what is it, Ravin Richport. And my backyard shares the proposed property. And where I see the proposed land use change, which includes uh, bars and pubs and convenience stores, I mean, having those on my backyard, I see nothing but um, disturbances. And that, as, as a family person, uh, I sure don't want to share that. So this is a, another concern beside other concerns I heard from everybody else about uh, cost of improvement of this land to develop the new space. Um, the traffic is a big, big concern on this area to go to work in the morning. It is terrible to get out. So, you know, I oppose strongly on this thing. So please think about all of us, these 196 uh, signatories that we did. Um, I request you to reconsider. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ray. Any questions for Mr. Ray? Seeing none, we'll turn now to questions of administration. Councillor Walters. Thank you. Uh, so probably have a couple rounds. I'll try and be quick though. Uh, so Mr. Heinrichs, at, at what point, just more generally speaking, did we think uh, from a planning perspective that it was okay to rezone uh, these acreage sites, particularly these rural residential sites along these main roads? When did that thinking take hold? Is that a city thing or we've been doing that for a long time? Thank you, Councillor. Um, well, we, we simply respond to the applications that they submitted to us. Sorry, that we're, we're not able to hear you very well. Sorry about that. No worries, go ahead. Have to lower my microphone, boom. Thanks for pointing that out. Um, so as, as, I, uh, as I was starting to say, um, we simply respond to the applications as they are applied to us. Uh, there are pockets of these types of residential, rural acreage residences scattered around the city that we inherited through annexation back in the 1980s. Um, some of them do have uh, commercial operations on those sites uh, uh, already. That's one of the reasons some people like to live in these uh, rural acreage areas. This particular one uh, is uh, in, in Richmond is entirely residential. So it's not so much um, a consideration of dedicating any, any focused thought towards 
converting or rezoning rural properties, rural acreages. Um, it's just simply a matter of applying city policy, right. city plan, recognizing the access in the frontage on a major arterial roadway. Et so if it was middle of Fifth Avenue, it wouldn't. You probably wouldn't receive an application, but you wouldn't support rezoning of anything that wasn't on the arterial or on the main roadway. Correct. Well, likely. Okay. Uh, there's lots of worry about precedent, about it creeping from one, you know, the next. So if you put a commercial there, then who's to say you can't put another one? And then who's to say you can't put another one? But I guess from a legal perspective, we don't deal with, we don't presume precedent. Uh, and, and if another application came, what would you do? to the adjacent site, uh, what would you do with that? Yeah, just on the surface, um, from a planning perspective and planning principles, it would be uh, difficult to envision supporting any expansion of commercial into the interior of the neighborhood, right. um, particularly the residential component that's that's existing there now. So I don't know if it's you or Mr. Saeed, you know, I, I do, the concern that I have about this, which has been raised is it is, you know, one of the busiest roadways in the city and particularly as you approach QE2 and Calgary Trail there, that overall intersection is, is is certainly a traffic nightmare relative to many other parts of Edmonton. So you have QE2, you have the bus stop there, you have the private driveway, you have the proposed access, then you have the Royal Gardens access. All, to me, you know, this isn't a very technical term, but very jammed together. And I wonder about any encumbrance, any further encumbrance on that road, just making it increasingly difficult for the access and enjoyment that people have of their properties there. So maybe some of your thinking on why it's okay. I'll defer to Mr. Saeed. Thank you. Uh, yes, Councilor Walters, um, definitely all that went into our thought process to see uh, how the site is going to be accessed, what the impacts are going to be to Ellersley. Um, in terms of the scale, uh, of this development, uh, the contribution okay. of uh, traffic from this commercial development to Ellersley is uh, in the realm of about 5% increase. Um, the issues that we have heard about, uh, as you already know, we, we, we know, those have been discussed at different committees. We are aware of uh, the congestion along Ellersley. Uh, so what we did, we focused on the access management strat uh, strategy for this site. Uh, and uh, as mentioned earlier, that uh, we looked at the collision data, we looked at what can be provided, and we were we concluded that an all directional access cannot be supported over here based mm -hmm. on all of those reasons. And a right in right out only access will be granted. And most likely, it will be with uh, with an auxiliary or a right turn uh, lane. So that right turn lane will bite into the property or into, exactly. the, into the existing boulevard before the tr the pedestrian trail. So that pedestrian trail gets interrupted. Um, correct. It gets. It will be uh, moved. Uh, because there is already a ro road right of way there. Currently, it is a five lane section. It is. Uh, uh, ultimately going to be a six lane section. So we do have the road right of way to push, uh, uh, to have a new lane added to the north and then push the walkway for the north. That was a quick five minutes. I'll uh, need one more go, Mr. Mayor, in due time. Thank you. Noted. Um, oh, I've been clicked on there for some reason, but uh, let me just see if I can delete myself. Uh, Councillor Nichol is next. Thank you very much. To continue on with uh, Councillor Walter's question, Mr. Saeed. So when you did your TIA with regards to uh, the site, uh, you used pre-COVID numbers? That's correct. Thank you. Uh, so I just wanted the base that to work from. So on 111th and Ellerslie, uh, what is the rating of that intersection as it stands pre-COVID? Uh, the numbers uh, west of 11, 11 Street are about 18,000. It's a uh, um, divided four-lane road, so I would suggest that it's in the realm of about C to D, and in some movements would be uh, even E uh, during the peak hours. 
And Mr. Saeed, with regards to also, let's so regards to a projection going forward in five to 10 years, it would, is that going to get better? I, or I would imagine that D to E rating might, might also become the standard, if not worse, in terms of its functionality? Uh, as a projection, let's say five, five to 10 years from now, so. So if you look at the traffic growth along Millersley, we have, if you look at last five years, the volumes have been fairly consistent. Uh, and the reason behind that is that as we increase the development in the broader context uh, yeah, on, around the broader network, there are some improvements happening uh, alongside. Um, some of the examples would be uh, widening of James Mowat Trail, uh, improvements along 41 Avenue, um, opening of a right and right out ramp along 135. So there is there are opportunities to disperse the traffic and take it away from the pinch point that we all know is uh, Ellers Lee section. So uh, and on top of that, in the longer term, uh, this uh, part of the roadway is slated for a six lane roadway. It is already anticipated that the volumes will increase and it, uh, there will be time when we will require additional capacity over here. Uh, Mr. Saheed, but the six laner is not really on the books, right? It's it's planned for. It, 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 we, it, we wouldn't say it's funded at this point, would we? It is not, it is long-term and definitely there are other priorities uh, that oh, are for sure. specific into that. So as I so I understand to reduce some of the congestion in this area, we are, we, we are anticipating with other expansion of other areas to to do that okay what about ninth what about ninth app do you have any functionality with regards to ninth app so the ninth avenue will be yeah just you see just, what i'm saying here right sorry you know which area i'm talking about right so ninth avenue um is uh, are you talking about the access just east of this site to the Correct. subdivision? Yeah, yeah. Yes. So it is unsignalized intersection at the moment serving about 4950 dwelling units and serving church to the south. Um, it is unsignalized and the... Um, <laughs> And the reason behind uh, not being able to signalize this intersection is first and foremost because of uh, uh, the inadequate spacing uh, between the intersections. Um, and uh, so, yeah, we know the, the left turns at that intersection are problematic during the Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Saeed. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Councillor Bang is next. Thank you. Uh, so there were some questions from folks. I, I don't know who's the right person to answer those. And first, let's stick to um, Mr. Said uh, right in, right out. And then along with the possibility of providing a sort of merge lane or whatever you want to call it. What prompts the development officer to um, uh, have the merge lane in there? Is it your recommendation or who, who recommends it? So, uh, so the next stage of the development will be the development permit is going to be submitted. And as part of the development permit, uh, transportation team reviewing that permit will look into all of those considerations. Uh, we have already uh, discussed this site with uh, the team uh, at uh, the development permit, uh, the development permit team, and uh, and they have indicated that there this this site does qualify to have an additional uh, a right turn lane, and that can be conditioned as part of uh, the development permit. Okay, but uh, I mean, they have indicated that the, this condition might be uh, put in there, but uh, it's not finalized yet, eh? Can it change? Uh, it is not because we don't have a site plan yet. So uh, there are design considerations uh, uh, associated with it, but uh, uh, from the safety perspective, we are of the opinion and we have recommended that a right then be constructed. 
Okay. When you're saying the site plan, what are you referring to? Like what kind of businesses go in there? Is that, uh, is that the thinking? Yes. Uh, at development permit stage, you get uh, a detailed layout of the site, how it is configured, uh, uh, and um, where the access is going to be or is being proposed by the proponent. All those things are uh, provided at that stage of uh, development. Okay, and uh, 18,000 vehicles per day, it's, it's category C or D. Could you, uh, uh, for everybody's uh, benefit there, could you uh, tell us, like, is it, what is C and D categories? So C and, C and D categories uh, refer to the delay that uh, individual experience in making a certain movement. For instance, if it is uh, if I am delayed by over 80 seconds to make a left turn, that will be categorized as, as F. Then, if I'm taking uh, 10 seconds to do the same turn, it's going to be A. So those are the categories uh, just based on the timings in seconds. So in this uh, development. What intersection would we be talking about if we are talking about C or D? So when we looked at this site, uh, uh, an analysis was provided for uh, for an all directional access by the applicant, and the left end movements were experiencing significant delays. Like anyone trying to get out of the site were experiencing level of service F, meaning that they were being delayed over 80 seconds. And that was primarily because of uh, the significant through traffic. And that uh, itself poses a safety concern uh, when someone is trying to take a risk and make that left turn uh, unsafely and try to cross four lanes. Thank you. And uh, my next question is uh, in regards to, uh, uh, I guess, lack of engagement. What, what what kind of engagements did we do in the, in this case? Thank you, Councillor. Um, we did direct mail outs for uh, advance notice um, to the surrounding property owners. We did a, a almost 400 count uh, mail out for the public hearing notice to the entire na uh, Richford neighborhood. Um, there are requirements in the zoning bylaw to have the site signed um, as well when there's a plan amendment involved so that passers-by the site or those who may be outside of the area would uh, would uh, also get uh, notification or be aware that something's happening on the site. And of course, the community leagues, um, we send notification to them and rely on a little bit of word of mouth for notification through that. Okay. Would it be fair to say, uh, see that uh, if... Uh those um, people in the Royal Gardens would be notified? Uh, yes, the entire Richford neighborhood north of Ellerslie Drive or Ellerslie Road was sent, um, was, was on the notification list, yes. Thank you, my time's up, I'll come back. Thank you, Councillor Henderson. Well, I'm, I'm just curious, you know, looking at the site, I'm trying to imagine um, you know, and this is part of the problem of having rural residential that we inherit in the middle of areas that then develop out. I'm trying to imagine what else you could do with this site. Um, are there any other possibilities? Under, you know, because I, you know, it, you know, rural residential on, a, on, a, on an arterial road clearly isn't going to be attractive to anybody, which is why I suspect that this is being looked at. Um, so what else would be possible? Are you, uh, any thoughts? Thank you, Councillor. Um, well, it's it's uh, speculative, but um, it wouldn't be unusual, in, in my experience, to um, see some interest in a property like this for multi-unit housing, um, if if not commercial. Uh, that that's a possibility. Um, so you could go to an owner could seven or an RA eight there. Do, it's do it's a stories, yeah. big enough parcel that yes, RA seven or RA eight. Um, is something that probably could be considered on the site, correct? But it, the same access problems would exist from a traffic point of view unless unless you actually let the access go back into the neighborhood, correct? 
Um, correct. Yes, that would require a little different analysis based on yeah. the trip generations for residential are different than commercial. Yeah, because I mean, because you, you, I mean, if you wouldn't want to have anything that was facing it with more entrances, that just makes the problem worse. Correct. So you couldn't subdivide it. If you subdivided it and faced LSE Road, you'd have a much larger number of entrances and exits, which exacerbates the problem. Yeah. Uh, potentially, I, I suppose you could engineer or design a shared access. Um, those those are things right. that could be conditioned with the subdivision. Because you might have the depth there to do that. I mean, I mean, obviously, it's a really unusual shape of site. Yeah, I'm I'm just trying to imagine because I mean, I can you know, I'm just trying to, to I mean, I understand why this seems the most self-evident answer, but I don't know what the other answers would be. Um, okay, just curious about that. Thanks. Thank you. Um, anybody else on the first round? Um, I'll move, uh, well, before I move the second round, can I suggest that we extend for half an hour? I don't, I'm not convinced we'll finish this item in half an hour, but I think uh, that would uh, probably, that makes more sense than breaking coming back earlier. Yeah, we could, we could try up to half an hour and see where we're at at six if folks, I, I, unless folks have a, a conflict or an objection to that. Any challenge with up to 30 more minutes to see if we can complete this item and then we'll check back in, in well, I guess 35, but uh, so to take us to six and then we'll reevaluate if we're not done this item then. I was just gonna say I can't stay, um, but uh, I'm gonna have to leave shortly, but I have no problem with council continuing. Okay, thank you, Councillor Hamilton. Um, Same comment on my end. Okay, Councillor Zadig. Zadig. Anybody yeah. else we would lose? Just want to make sure we'll maintain quorum. I got to duck out for 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, yeah, around quarter two. Yeah, I have a, I just got to do something. Yeah, I'm sorry. Then we can't. Then it's we'll lose yeah, quorum. We're, okay, we're, then we I'll withdraw quorum, that so. thought. Okay. okay, sorry. I will move for a second round for Councillor Walters. Thank and you. You can probably just sneak in. Yeah. Um, any objection to a second round of questions? Hearing none, then on the second round, Councillor Walters. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Saeed, uh, just to confirm, what is the rating of that road and the intersection uh, just further east up at Calgary Trail and QE2? Sure. Uh, we looked at that and presented at one of uh, the Urban Planning Committee. I just pulled that right. information over here. Just give me a second, please. Well, while you're looking up that question, I'd ask Mr. Hendricks a different question. Uh, what would ever compel us to sell the little strip of land to the west in between this uh, site and Royal Gardens? Um, well, most road closure um, purchases are driven by an, a, a budding landowner. So in this case, if the landowner of this site um, expressed an interest, they would approach the city. We would look at it, determine if we need it. If it's not needed for municipal purposes, then it could be declared surplus. Um, at that point, um, all abutting landowners are, are also given an opportunity to express an interest in the closure area if they wish to acquire it as well. So right. the properties located to the west would have an opportunity to purchase half of the road right away if they also wished to. What, what would the risk be of us, like, you know, it seems like that would have been done if it's necessary, it would have been done now. What are the risks of it happening separate from this in a different process? Like if, then it's not planned into this, it's kind of a jagged add on. Yeah, what? One, one of the considerations to determine if if it's needed for municipal purposes, in this case, I would say it was is probably going to be emergency access. Right. Um, 107 Street and connecting over to 111 Avenue. That's a very long roadway with uh, mm. residents access or using that for access. Um, and so for emergency access, there might be a municipal reason to keep that right. um, well, emergency access. I, I, I may have just a heads up, Mr. Mayor, I may have a subsequent motion on just looking at that, regardless of what happens today and just the overall safety of that whole road, uh, Fifth Avenue. Understand because there's a lot of sort of shortcutting traffic that gets stuck in there because you actually can't shortcut. Uh, I understand from the community there. So, uh, anyways, back to Mr. Said. If you had the answer to my other question about the rating, sure. 
So mm. at the interchange, we are looking at uh, C to D uh, as the worst uh, movements, which means that you are uh, in delays between 20 to 55 seconds. Okay. And I don't know if we can say much about this, but you know, there I know in the past we've spoken publicly about the province's future plans with QE2 on that stretch. Um, what can you, are there any updates on that? Uh, tell us what you know. Uh, nothing significant. Uh, the only thing we know is uh, just earlier this year, a report was made public uh, for Highway 2 study that was done between Calgary and Edmonton. And that study did highlight this interchange as uh, one of the ones which will require uh, upgrades. Uh, as part of our regular meetings with Alberta Transportation, they have not indicated any timelines or any details for to that. Okay, and then just on the trip generation, so at the development permit stage, once you have a better sense of what kind of businesses are going in there, that will then tip you over on the right, if this was approved, uh, you know, just spitballing either scenario here, if, if it was approved by council, uh, those development permit applications would de determine the extent to which you'd manage the access, namely compelling the right turn bay, right? So it's at that. That is point. correct. And at that point, uh, citizens could appeal um, through SDAB on some of those. So that yes. It's not the last opportunity necessarily to influence this. I know that's not what people are hoping for uh, primarily, uh, but just, just to be clear about that. Um, what kind of transit is on this? Can you describe, Mr. Said, the degree of transit uh, as, a, as part of the, the BNR, the new system? Yes, part. so uh, this this is this segment will continue to be served by transit, um, a regular transit. And uh, the bus stop here uh, can directly connect to two major LRT and transit centers, namely Millwoods and Century Park. Is this an ex this is an, an express route though? It's categorically a local route, right? It is uh, a regular uh, daytime service. Daytime service. Yeah. Okay, I think those are all the questions I had for now uh, on this matter. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we're at uh, 5.30 now. Uh, we've still got uh, a few more questions. Um, can folks extend a couple of minutes of, to finish questions of admin and then we come back with new information? And, and the other question would be, um, do you want to come back to at 6.30 or uh, do folks have the, require the whole break? So first question, do folks require the whole break or can we shorten it? I'm happy to extend for Councillor Banga to ask, and I can come back at 6.30. <clears throat> yeah, 6.30 will be fine. Good to extend. Okay. Any objection, be good to, be too. any objection to coming back at 6.30? Any objection to extending for five minutes so we can complete some questions of admin? I will move both of those things. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Henderson. That will only give us 53 minutes for second. Sarah, but... Uh, um, that's what's before us. Uh, seconder for that? Second. Thank you, Councillor Banga. I'll just seek unanimous consent. Any objections to those changes to orders? Not hearing any. Then, Councillor Banga, ask your questions, please. Thank you. Um, not to presume the outcome of today's uh, public hearing, uh, can the administration uh, tell me that uh, if this property, or uh, let, let's put it this way, if this uh, zoning is approved, would it be, would it have access to, I know there is access to LRC Road, of course, to the, to 107 Street, which can only go north? Councillor Banga, uh, access from this property to 107 Street will not be granted. Okay, and what is the reasoning for that? The reasoning is the commercial nature of uh, the development. Okay. No, just so there won't be any shortcutting, I suppose, in, into the neighborhood. That's correct. Uh, 105 Avenue and, uh, and also 107 Street. 
Yes. Okay. All right. And uh, the other thing, uh, when we, uh, I guess this is probably a law question, uh, when an application comes before us, is it under our, I guess, jurisdiction or whatever you want to call it, and that uh, we consider what other opportunities for development are available um, to the applicant, or do we just not, uh, we just work on this one? Counselor, as an application comes in, uh, we, we look uh, to see what the highest and best use is, and that's a consideration of council as well. So. Okay. Yeah. And uh, if, let's say, comparing the green space, uh, I know there are lots of questions about green space elimination. How is uh, green space in this uh, neighborhood as compared to some of those others? Uh, thank you, Councillor. Um, I don't have the numbers in front of me, uh, but Richford, on, on a relative scale, it's a small neighbourhood compared to, uh, to others. Uh, the large green space that is in the neighbourhood right now is, the, of course, the Ellerslie Rugby Club, um, which in the long term um, is planned to be redeveloped for residential purposes. Uh, but the largest parks or, or green space benefits for this neighborhood comes from the fact that uh, a good portion of it backs onto the ravine and uh, many of the residents have commented on uh, on the enjoyment they get from that. Okay. I know uh, the current zoning is, uh, uh, I guess, uh, rural uh, residential. Uh, if another applicant comes along for the same property to have it uh, zoned RA7 or RA8, how would we have, uh, I guess, capacity to say no to it? Uh, thank you, Councillor. Yes. Um, as always, it would go through the same process that this application has gone through. It would go through a review. We would look at the proposed uh, uses and the um, assess the uh, the impacts and the, the fit and the feasibility, and then we would make a recommendation to you, and, and there would be a, another okay. public hearing. Okay. And uh, uh, just to uh, – I didn't really want to say it, but uh, let's say if a uh, – a condo complex uh, application comes there. Uh, what kind of traffic would that generate? I know we don't have any application before us, but uh, I don't know uh, how many units can be developed there. Council um, Bangor, uh, in terms of uh, the amount of traffic that is uh, obviously related to the number of units proposed um, and um, so it like uh, Mr. Heinrichs mentioned that if, if he gets uh, such proposal it will be looked at in detail from all of those perspectives. Okay fair enough my time is done. I don't want to stop people from going having dinner. That is wise. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, let's pause until um, uh, 6.30 and then we will resume uh, at that time on this item with new information. So um, to our speakers, come back for then and we'll check for new information and then we'll see where we're at at that time. So, uh, And then uh, to the others, um, we will uh, in due course carry on with the next item in order. Uh, which would be the Cromdale item, and by 6.30 or 7, uh, we will have some thoughts about agenda management uh, for how we're going to cope with the several days' worth of meetings we need to add to finish. So, uh, until then, um, go attend to your blood sugar. That's what I will do. And shop local, if you can.
And we'll roll call in a moment here. Okay, good uh, evening, I suppose. Um, let's start with Councillor Essinger on roll call. Good evening. Evening, Councillor Hamilton. Councillor Hamilton? Mr. Mayor, she said she wouldn't be able to join us until 7. Oh, okay, I missed that. Um, oh, I'm, I'm, okay, I missed that. Thank you for the heads up. I will look for her to rejoin us. Councillor Henderson, I can see. I'm here. Councillor Knack? Uh, good evening. Councillor McKean, I think, still is in a better place. <laughs> um, pain management style. Uh, Councillor Nickel. Good evening. Thank you. Councillor Paquette. Hello. Councillor Walters. Good evening, everybody. Councillor Banga. <clears throat> Councillor Banga. No? Okay, Councillor Carmel. I'm here, but I'm going to go out and come back. My sound is not working properly. Okay, uh, check back in once once you're in, and I finish the rest of the roll call. Councillor Katarina. Good evening. Good evening, and Councillor Zadig. Uh, was Councillor Zadig also not able to? Okay. Well, we're short four at present, I think. So nine's enough to get going. It's a little tight, but uh, but that assumes uh, Councillor uh, Carmel, you back? I'm, I'm back. Thank you. Okay, rock and roll. That's nine. Let's uh, let's resume. Um, oh, Councillor Henderson, uh, another question for me. Yeah, just go before ahead. we go into it, I, I'm I'm curious. You know, with all this talk about the the pullout, but the bus the bus stop does not have a pullout, does it? If I'm looking at it correctly. So the buses are stopping in that traffic and right now, are they not? Is that my imagination? I'm just looking on, on the magical Google Mappy thing. I believe you're correct, there is no pullout. Okay. Um, so presumably if you were gonna put in a, pull, a write in pullout that you'd probably wanna look at the bus stops as well, I presume, and that may be part of the road widening piece down the road. Is Mr. Saeed uh, on the call? It's not a critical me? question. I just, if he is a B, I'd be interested to know, but I don't want to take a lot of time to get it answered. Uh, that's correct, uh, Councillor Henderson. It will be looked at uh, from this intersection all the way to the intersection to the yeah. site. So right now when the buses stop, that lane is blocked? That's correct. Yeah, okay, thanks. Thank you. Any other questions for <clears throat> administration? How about new information? Um, Madam Clerk, did we email or do you want me to? Um, we have not okay. emailed. If, if for the- um, For the other ones. For, for the, the other item. items, okay. um, we could just have those wishing to speak to new information email okay. us. Okay, well, yeah, we may use a different process for some of the other ones uh, later on, but uh, what I'll do right now is just roll through this and double check. Um, Mr. Eidick, did you have new information? Uh, no, I'm good. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Marchese, did you have new information? I 
think he left the call. Oh, okay. Uh, um, Ms. Farn? Sorry, it took me a minute there. I think it just might be prudent to acknowledge some of the comments that we've received regarding the business of Ellerslie Road. And I think that we certainly acknowledge that it is a busy corridor. And uh, I also think that part of what makes it an attractive uh, land use, a commercial and attractive land use for the site is the busyness of Ellerslie Road in that there's the ability to draw patronage from existing traffic that's already on the road, already passing the site, as opposed to a, uh, a use that might generate all new traffic into an already busy area. So I just wanted to mention that and I will leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. Any uh, questions for Ms. Farn? Not seeing any. Uh, Mr. Deal? Any new information that arose from the public hearing? He didn't speak in the end. He, he, he withdrew. Oh, okay. Um, <clears throat> uh, Corey Fogid. New information. All right, coming off mute here. Um, yeah, I do have things to. I have a few things to say. Okay, I think on. that the city of Edmonton. Um, focus on walkability and bikeability and by putting in a right hand turn lane to get into this establishment you are now disconnecting us from the ravine area that we so enjoy walking in so that's my first point my second point is uh, i'm just going to reiterate that i don't believe that cb1 it needs to be rezoned to cb1 under the uh, current zoning there is an opportunity for lodges home senior lodges uh, supportive housing, all kinds of different things that I think would fit the bill quite nicely uh, for what they're looking for, for the reestablishment. The other thing that I think is really important that we factor in is that the rugby park has been sold. That land will be uh, built into houses and our area will double in density. So that is something to consider. And so when I made my proposal, I said that a pro appropriate place for CB1 would be on the north west part of Ellerslie Rugby Park, where there is a transportation corridor where you can't build on it. And so people moving into the area would know what's in their backyard and would um, be transparent in what what's happening within that area. And so I think that that is um, definitely something we want to bring attention to. Um, and I think that's probably it that I had to say. So. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions on Ms. Fogut's new information? No? Okay. How about, um, uh, was Ali Halat able to join us in the end? So uh, I'll, um, Ali is still not available to attend, so it's Paula Halat. Go ahead. Uh, there is just one thing that I want to just kind of go back on. The traffic reports, if I remember correctly, they're from 2018. You know, the just one thing that I want to note is that the area has grown in the last, you know, three years. So I just want to just keep that in mind that the area has grown and maybe a new traffic assessment should be done before any of this is even considered. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. I don't see any questions for you, Ms. Halat. Thank you. Uh, how about Laura Buckler? New information? Um, thank you for the opportunity, but I don't have any more comments or questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Ross? <coughs> um, um, uh, just expanding on what um, Corey had said, remember that an awful lot of the traffic on Ellerslie Road is not for our immediate area. It's for the entire area west and south of us the ones that don't go all the way down to 40th. So our traffic has increased to cover all those neighborhoods. Understood. Thank you, sir. Any questions on Mr. Ross's new information? Seeing none. Uh, Parbjit Dhaliwal? How about Ranji Dhaliwal? Yeah, I believe that uh, uh, the new um, a uh, bus stop at uh, 127th Street, uh, that's going to increase the uh, traffic on that Ellerslie also. Thank you. I see, oh, Councillor Paquette, go ahead. 
Yeah, thanks. I just, just to clarify, when you're talking about increase of profit, uh, Sir Dolly, well, I'm just wondering what percentage increase you're talking about. Like, what do you foresee happening? Well, I, I don't have a math to uh, what percentage, but uh, it definitely uh, it's going to increase that traffic. Also, uh, in the future, the new hospital there, uh, the only way to get from uh, east of that property uh, to the hospital uh, in the future and, and to that uh, uh, bus parking lot, it's going to definitely increase the uh, traffic. Sure, and that's the nature of a growing city, that more things are built um, every single year and traffic will increase. And, you know, like the traffic in Edmonton is not going anywhere except heavier. And so I'm just wondering, like I'm just trying to wrap my head around the concern based on the fact that we're a growing city that is going to continue to grow no matter what. Uh, and I understand that, but like uh, we we go drop off the kids in the morning and, and uh, it, it's kind of a nightmare. Like uh, we uh, starting from 109 to all the way to the uh, Calgary Trail, uh, turning left, there is uh, sometimes it's a parking lot. It, it's well, in the morning, mostly. Well, one thing I won't dispute is the fact that uh, maybe we built a city that's far too dependent on cars. Uh, but um, I'm, when you say a nightmare, I'm just wondering if you can maybe expand on that. Like basically how many minutes are you waiting uh, to constitute sort of the, the nightmare scenario? Uh, it, it takes uh, uh, just about to maybe one kilometer uh, to cover that to probably need uh, 25 minutes. Okay. Yeah. And that, that can be definitely frustrating. Um, yeah. especially if using a vehicle, a car is, is the only way to, to proceed. Um, uh, there is no, no other way to other than, uh, dropping the kids off because, uh, uh we had, the, uh, first of all, we, we had a, a school nearby, uh, I, I believe it was Johnny Bright and for that, uh, the zoning was changed three times. Then we have all the way to the DS McKenzie. So okay. it, it takes extra, like there is no planning uh, for anything, but uh, this uh, this gonna, uh, development gonna increase, uh, add into that, I guess. Okay. Yeah, no, I, I see where you're coming from. I'm just, I'm, I'm, tr I'm, I'm extremely compassionate with the position you're in. It sounds like it's already kind of frustrating and as the city grows and then the area grows, which will, it's going to get more frustrating. What I'm just trying to wrap my head around as far as land use is um, whether this development goes through or not right now, something else will get in there eventually. And there will be other things around it that will increase the traffic in the area. Like there's no way around it. So I'm just trying to wrap my head around as a land use uh, decision. Does it matter if this goes in now? or in eight months from now, or 12 months from now, even 18 months from now, the result is going to be the same eventually. So I'm just wondering how we get around that. Uh, I guess leaving that uh, uh, as a resident, so uh, John, that would be the uh, answer to this. Uh, I, I don't think we need uh, any more commercial when there is enough commercial around that area. So uh, if you leave that residential area alone and uh, leave all those communities as they are, uh, I, I guess uh, that would be the right answer. Right. And, and, and I'm trying to square that with the idea that there's going to be growth anyway. And as you said, a lot of that traffic is coming through. It's not even from the area. It's, it's through traffic. So to see the, the frustration I'm having is that I, I am very sympathetic to your position, but I'm also just looking at the reality of uh, the expansion of a city as, as um, unsatisfactory as that is, because I agree. Maybe we, we've built a city so reliant on cars that we literally cannot build ourselves out of the traffic anymore. So anyway, thank you for taking my questions. Thank you.
Thank you. I see no further questions for Mr. Dhaliwal. Uh, next, uh, Yasmin Nijar, do you have new information? Yasmin? No? Okay. How about Hello? You? Hi. Yes. <laughs> Thank you for the opportunity to, to speak again. We have very strict uh, structural restrictions in our area. How will the new development meet those restrictions? That's one of the questions I have. And another one is I, I keep hearing um, Mr. Mr. Banga, Councillor Banga, asking for other rezoning options. Um, I, I thought at this point we're working on CBI one, and uh, and that's what we're opposing at this point. We are we're prepared or to uh, to other RA seven or RA eight that that are coming up. Um, and another one is uh, Heritage Valley Amendment Notice. It was not part of the notice that was publicly distributed, as well as it was not on the public notice that's poorly displayed on the site itself. So was that, should that have not been public information when this application was put in place? Hello? Yes, uh, it, it's not a Q&A in new information, so you can certainly raise uh, questions that have arisen in your mind to, to flag, but w we hear the question that you've, you've raised. I'm not in a position to answer it in a back and forth under new information, but um, so you do have a few more minutes if there are any other points you want to raise. So that would be my, my concern to raise is that Heritage Valley Amendment Notice should have been given out as that covers a much larger area than just uh, just uh, what, what was notified. And and again, you know, it's and that's that's just what I have. If anybody has any questions for me, I'm open to answering. Great. Thank you. Um, questions on uh, Ms. Najjar's new information? Okay, not seeing any at this point, so we'll go next to George Schmidt. Mr. Schmidt, still with us? No? This looks like he dropped off. Uh, how about uh, Shelby McLeod? Any new information? Yes. Go ahead. Thank you. I just want to point out, of course, with growing city traffic will increase. I lament that green space will never increase, but I, to say again how difficult Ellerslie is as an arterial road for walkability, I know if we are going to increase traffic that we should still do so safely or allow for increased traffic. If there is going to be that deceleration lane for traffic safety, to perhaps decide that now as part of this plan and not kick it down the road, uh, people come first and I would assume traffic second, again, that we could have a more walkable city and perhaps this isn't suitable for a CB1 in that case after all. Thank you. Any questions? Not seeing any. Uh, thank you. Uh, next is uh, Glinda Schuster, or, or she was not able to join us, I think. Um, uh, Ravneet Mali, do you have any new information? Make a quick point about um, whatever uh, city planning decisions we have done in past, that doesn't mean we continue to do so in future as well, or at present, maybe we need to relook at our approach and we continue to work on more eco-friendly, bikeable and pedestrian friendly um, opportunities uh, in this, um, um, like the, the land we are cautioning today. So I'm pretty sure uh, we have awesome people on the city admin who can propose something more eco-friendly and maybe try to keep this uh, land into residential zone. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any questions for Ms. Mali? No? Okay. Uh, then Ashes Ray, any new information? I don't think they're on the call oh, anymore. Oh, okay. Um, that is all of the new information, I believe. Uh, are there any questions arising uh, back to administration from the new information from members of council. Seeing none, then uh, oh. oh, sorry, it was uh, took a while to get through. Go ahead, council. Yeah, yeah, I, um, yeah, and pardon me if uh, my kids are getting loud in the background. Um, so, 
I was just wondering, so we've heard uh, some of the, the concerns from from the speakers in the, in, with new information, and part of it has to do with the fact that they feel like um, there's not really a commitment to walkability in the area. And um, I'm just wondering if we have any information that would add to this conversation about plans to add, uh, you know, other ways of getting around rather than just uh, motorized vehicles? Councillor, I think uh, we can point to the larger and just launched uh, bus network redesign uh, as well as the future construction and uh, complete street standards as roads uh, continue to be built out uh, in the area that include alternative modes. Sure. Um, I'm just wondering in the context of, of land use and how we uh, um, organize that, I, I, I suppose, what are the timelines that the, that the folks... Uh, concerned would be looking at here um, for these for these changes outside of the bus network redesign, which is already in place. Uh, Councillor, uh, maybe if you can just refrain uh, the question, um, just having trouble grasping what uh, specific apps, aspects you're uh, looking for. Okay, so if we're talking about multi-use paths, um, for example. Um, and you indicated that it's in the city plan and a new approach. That's that's all fantastic. But what sort of timeline are we looking at for to getting something like that in? If we know, just as a as a way to inform um, the way that we're looking at the land use here. So as each new land use development application comes forward, uh, that'll be implemented. Uh, those standards will be implemented through that review and approval process uh, for this neighborhood specifically it's largely built out um, so it'll be difficult to implement uh, a lot of uh, the new thinking in that respect uh, but as these sort of off pieces come through they are front and center in our uh, application review okay so no no changes in the immediate uh, or mid future um, okay so we're going to see uh, presumably, not just from this development, but in the development of the entire area, um, a general increase in vehicle traffic, which will mean a general increase in some of the issues that the community described. Is that right? If I can uh, add, uh, Councillor uh, Picard, uh, uh, in terms of um, as we grow as a city, uh, there are opportunities for new infrastructure to be built as well. So there will be opportunities for dispersing the traffic and not necessarily just using this corridor as a primary access. And uh, just uh, quickly on, uh, um, uh, on the walkability as it pertains to this development, uh, uh, even with the construction of uh, a turn bay, there will be a need for maintaining uh, the walkway connection that is there today. It will be similar to what is shown on the intersection at 109 Street, where uh, it accommodates an auxiliary lane and um, uh, and, a, and a walkway as well. So um, j just wanted to add a couple of points there. Okay, yeah, appreciate it. Uh, and I understand it's just, um... Got a couple of roads up in the northeast that uh, are, you know, very quickly starting to mirror what's going on there, and uh, I'm not quite sure we've got a satisfactory approach just yet. And uh, perhaps that'll be on council to figure out sooner than later. Okay, thank you. Uh, the mayor has stepped out again briefly. I had to do a call, so you're back to me, I'm afraid. Um, so uh, that opens up, I think, because we asked questions for administration again. We need to go back to new information. I don't think I need to go through each name again, do I? You, you just need to offer it out. There. Okay, so uh, back to everybody. Um, there's the opportunity if there's something that you've heard recently in Councillor Paquette's questions in particular that you would like to weigh in on. Uh, any of the speakers uh, interested in, in speaking again under new information? Um, I can. Oh, sorry. Yep. Yeah. Uh, who? Sorry, I just you have to identify yourself. I'm this is Corey. This yep. is Corey. Yep. yep. I can speak to the walkability piece. Um, the area that we're in does allow for some walkability, but where the development is going to take place, um, that is access to our ravine walkway. 
And so um, in the presentation that I provided, one of the suggestions was to build a bike lane down 107th Street and 5th Avenue that would allow um, people to walk as well as bike to connect with other parts of the river valley. So that was one of the suggestions that we had. Um, I just think that by adding a deceleration lane, it just makes it really dangerous for kids, people, bikers, whatever, to kind of cross that. That's, that's just what I was wanting to say. Great, uh, thank you very much. Um, any questions for uh, Ms. Fogut? Great, thank you. Anybody else with new information based on this last piece? Hearing none then, um, I would be prepared to hear, take a motion to close public hearing. I'll move to close the public hearing. Councillor Henderson. Uh, Councillor Nichols moved it. And is there a seconder? Second. Okay. Um, so uh, please vote. Yes, Zadok. Thank you, Councillor Zadek. Yes. Yes, as well for me, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Councillor Katarina. And we're just recirculating the vote because we have some additional councillors here. And Councillor Esslinger? Yes. Thank you. Councillor Banga is here too. Thank you, Councillor Banga. Yes. And we have 11 votes um, as Councillors Hamilton and McKean are still absent as far as I know. Okay, display the vote. Carried, 11 nothing. Um, that was closure, yes. Okay, someone want to move first reading? Okay, I'll move it. Thank you, uh, Councillor Carmel. Seconder? Second. Uh, Councillor Knack, okay. Debate? Anyone wishing to speak to Con it? Mr. Mayor. Go ahead, Mr. <clears throat> Walters. Thanks. So, you know, in 99 times out of 100, these kinds of applications uh, would be a slam dunk for me. Uh, and I conjure up the absent Councillor McKean uh, in order to say no, I got to be able to hang my hat on something substantial. Uh, when I, you know, thought through this application, read it, visited the site, I'm very familiar with the area. Think about traffic on B2 and Lesley Road, the bus stop there, the private driveway, the access, the access to the neighborhood to the west. I've been kind of uneasy about this all along. Uh, it seems like a bit of a mess on that road and, you know, I suppose this isn't going to make it that much worse, but any, any sort of adjustment to that road to make it even more difficult for folks who live along there is a bit of a stretch for me. So I, you know, I'm, uh, inclined to vote no to this right now The you know, the QE up to upgrade Ellerslie road upgrades are a long ways off and there's no certainty on that. And, and, you know, that may help in the long run, but. Uh, I don't have any certainty on that either. And this is no offense to this development. You know, I do think this does make the neighborhood more walkable. Ironically, getting a letter of opposition from the Black Mud Creek Community League was interesting in, in that they've often talked about needing more destination places um, in the area. So this is not a, uh, uh, me being necessarily opposed to the to the application and what's planned. I just, I feel really uncomfortable uh, as the local councillor with knowledge of this road to add another access <clears throat> to something that already seems very difficult to me. But again, I, I want to thank the developer for the application. I don't think this is a bad application in any way. I just feel that it's um, in my, uh, I just feel in my, in my gut and heart to, to sort of stand behind the neighborhood on this. We have a lot of local intelligence here and are, struggling with this, the busyness on this road already. So I'll, I'll vote no to this, um, unless I can be convinced otherwise by my colleagues. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Councillor Banga. 
Thank you. Uh, my sentiments are uh, pretty close to uh, Councillor uh, Councillor's uh, comments. Anyway, uh, uh, again, I if it was uh, I didn't know the area, I did not know the traffic in this area, and the concerns of the community. I, I would probably vote yes for it. But uh, knowing the area and how busy the traffic is, uh, and um, there is uncertainty of any measures um, for calming the traffic down at this point in time. Uh, and, uh, and I never seen uh, any community come out with uh, that kind of opposition to uh, any proposal like this. So again, uh, I would uh, probably vote no for this right now. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Knack. Uh, thanks, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, and uh, so haven't had much to say as I've been listening in because I think similar to Councillor Walters, um, I, I mean, commercial CV1 development on an arterial road is standard. I mean, that's, 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 that's what we do in the city. That's what we've been doing long before this council. That's a, that's a standard zone. So, I mean, in that aspect, I mean, that has always made sense to me because you concentrate commercial developments, higher density residential. We, we've done that on arterial roads for years and years and years. These councils, previous councils, people before my time, that's been the approach. Um, you know, I also really, but I also really appreciate, you know, anytime the ward councillors are, and, and people nearby are speaking up on this. And what, what I'm struggling with is how this actually, how refusing or accepting this actually solves anything of what we just heard today. Um, that, that's probably my biggest struggle. It sounds like there's massive issues about traffic and frankly, what, what I'm struggling with is how ap approving this or refusing this makes any difference whatsoever and and i don't mean to be so diminishing about it it's just truly like this sounds like one of the worst roads in our city right now to be living on so if so therefore in my mind part of what i'm struggling about is that if if i'm going to say no to this then should we be saying no to every other development along this road communities further you know in further in either direction um and is that the right thing to do? Should we hold up all development for until this gets addressed? And I'm not sure that's practical per se. Um, at the same time, I very much appreciate that as a very legitimate concern. So I, I'm similar to some other applications in the past. Um, my comments here are not necessarily uh, to convince anyone. I, I'm actually hoping for further guidance from other members of council because um, my gut says like any other arterial road, we approve commercial development because that's where it belongs. But I also really appreciate when ward councillors speak up about this. And, and, and so I'm struggling in that regards, but I'm not necessarily seeing where, where I struggle is that I'm not seeing necessarily a land use reason to say no. This is an appropriate land use on an arterial road. And, and I, I would say that on virtually any arterial road in the city. But is that traffic impact that's, that we're discussing something that needs that should, in fact, not only stop this, but then stop any other future development along this corridor until there is a different solution in place? And then just more generally, uh, can we get proper mass transit solutions for corridors like this? I mean, this is, this is a, I think, a good justification of why we need, uh, like, this probably would be a great opportunity if we're going to one day widen this to six lanes. Let's put BRT on a road like this, because all you're going to do widen it to three lanes is continue to make the same problem just further down the road. Um, so that's not necessarily what's before us, but if, if traffic's such a big concern, like, that's that's what we need to be solving. This is, this is uh, it's a little frustrating for me because it's such a weird 
challenge in front of us. So uh, I haven't convinced anyone. I haven't even necessarily convinced myself yet, um, but I'm truly interested in some other perspectives and I see some people on here, but I, I felt I just needed to share that out loud. So I, I and I want to thank the residents. I appreciate your concerns of what you're saying. And like, there's, there's obviously a legitimate traffic issue on this road. I'm just not sure opposing this is the right way to actually fix your problems. So, but at the same time, I, I very much appreciate what's been shared. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Carmel. Thank you. So I'm of two minds the, and just sort of speaking to the traffic impacts, I guess, first of all, and it's my understanding that the two intersections that serve uh, the highway are coordinated and managed by the province. And then the Yelp board intersections from there are coordinated and managed by the city. And if you add yet another intersection, controlled or under, uncontrolled, in this stretch of land, stretch of road, it, it chops it up to the point where it's unpredictable and difficult to manage, and then difficult to control. Uh, it's not lost to me that a lot of the people that are traveling on this road through this stretch of road through Richford are headed to the west and into Ward 9. And part of the journey along Ellerslie Road is uh, finding your way through the White Mud Creek Crossing, which is still the same rural constructed road that it was 40 years ago. Uh, and as long as that road doesn't get upgraded, the ability to put BRT or bus service between the neighborhoods along Ellerslie Road and take some of the vehicle pressure off is lost. We can't do it. It's, from that perspective, somewhat unpredictable. The assembly of intersections around the QE2 is somewhat unpredictable. The neighborhood 14 plan, which includes a hospital and all of the surrounding commercial development, uh, which will act as an employment node, is somewhat unpredictable. Uh, is it going to gather people from the neighborhood to go and work in the, and uh, take advantage of employment opportunities? Or is it going to be people from outside the neighborhood? Is traffic going to go up or is traffic going to go down? Are we going to get an LRT extension or are we not? Do we? All of these things that speak to what the mobility network is going to look like down there and how it's going to change over the next 10 and 20 years means that it's a great big wide open. So the question then is, is was this developed, for me anyway, is this development going to change that a whole lot or is it going to not really change at all? From a traffic perspective, does it really matter? So there's two other things that are compelling for me. One is there is no shortage of commercial space in this neighborhood. There's a mini power center at 111th Street and Ellerslie Road. There's the whole Heritage uh, Valley District Center forget what we're calling that, but where the two high schools and uh, maybe a rec center is going to be and all of that development, that's a mile and a half to the south. There is a ton of commercial stuff here. Uh, and while it might mean that there's a neighborhood pub for Richford, it's, I'm not sure that that justifies yet more commercial space in a place that has all kinds of commercial space. Um, I'm just not sure it makes sense to Put this here but then when the neighborhood comes out in numbers you know over 90 percent saying we as a community don't want it and there's it's it's not as we sometimes have is uh, you know a number of loud voices purporting to represent the community when the community comes out in high proportions both uh, you know in terms of the numbers of people here compared to the people that live in that neighborhood and the number of people that have expressed their non-support i think that at some point the community should have some say in what happens in their neighborhood. And, uh, you know, if this would be different for me, for instance, if there was a lot more of that transit built up, or if this was a transit center or transit oriented development, or there was a, a, a hub here, uh, there's no compelling argument here. There's nothing to say that the neighborhood or the community is going to be better for more commercial development at this lot. Uh, I just can't find a reason that, that this is better. So I won't support it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Henderson. Well, I'm, I'm struggling hearing some of these arguments given some of the conversations we've had recently on other rezonings. Um, because I, I look at this piece of land and it's, it's a vestigial piece left over because we had rural residential when we did the plan in this area. 
and that's always creates anomalies. We know that. And our intention always is, and our hope always is, that slowly but surely that land will get redeveloped into something that has, is a better use of land, quite frankly, which is something that the city is saying it wants to do. I'm really looking at this land and I can't imagine what else you would do with it if not this. Um, and rural residential may have other uses that are allowed, but those uses are about single family home only. It's a huge piece of land for a single family home. And I don't think that's our long-term plan for the city. Um, you know, so yeah, there, there probably are some residential uses that can be put here, but, but I think ultimately, I think they will create the same issues around traffic. They'll create the same generation around traffic. They will need the same right in, right out. Um, so I, you know, I, I, I don't, I think if we say no to this, we're ultimately sterilizing a large piece of land. And, um, and I, you know, and, and that, that puzzles me a bit because I don't think this is a hugely invasive use of that land. I'm also a little bit puzzled, I have to confess, I, you know, the number of neighborhoods around this city that would, if we're talking about walkability, that would kill for some, for some uh, 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 commercial that they could walk to without having to cross a road like Ellerslie um, is also something I think that other, you know, that, 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 that are opportunities that other neighborhoods beg for. So I, so I don't understand the walkability discussion either, really. Um, so I, you know, I'm, uh, I'll continue to listen, but I'm, I'm, I'm puzzled by this conversation because it seems there's a different standard we're applying in a suburban context from what we're supplying in an urban one, and I'm not sure why we would do that. Um, this feels like a remarkably non, I mean, I, I recognize we have a big problem out there in terms of not having maybe sufficiently created the transportation network we needed to for the amount of people we put out there. But I think that's a, that's, this, is, this is not a surrogate for that conversation because um, I don't think it's going to make a particular difference um, unless, as someone says, we're prepared to say we're not going to develop this land at all anymore, and I'm not sure we really mean that. Um, so, I mean, that's why I'm struggling with this a little bit. I'll continue to listen. Um, you know, I do recognize that I'm not familiar with this area, and, and there are other people that are, and I, and I put value in that. Um, but from some of the stuff I'm hearing, I, I just can't imagine what else you would do with this land um, that, would not be, that would not be a single family house. And I don't think there's gonna be a market for a single family house on a piece of land like this on, a, on, a, on an arterial road. I just, I understand why, it's, why the use is changing. I suspect it won't go further into the neighborhood because those other pieces of, of rural residential have other benefits to them and are, and are quieter. Um, so I, I'm just, I'm really struggling to imagine what else you would do with the land that was more appropriate if it was not this. Thank you, Councillor Henderson. Councillor Paquette. Yeah, thank you. And thank you, Councillor Henderson and everyone else who spoke. Um, I'm familiar with this area um, and I'm familiar with the traffic during rush hour in this area. And uh, it's, it's not a fun place to be. Um, but I'm, and that's sort of the gist of my questions earlier. I was just trying to figure out what actual difference approving this would make for that whole stretch of road. And it's really tough to, to find a difference that would actually be made. Like if, if you're talking about, um, serious, uh, weights when it comes to traffic, a few extra cars an hour is not going to be the difference maker. However, it's not just the few extra cars an hour. It's the fact that it's going to keep growing and more and more cars are going to be added to that road, adding to the stress of that commute. And this development is not the linchpin. It's just not. But it's definitely a brick in the wall. So the question is, do you stop developing until uh, things get better? Do you keep developing and everyone just sort of accepts the fact that this road is not a road that you want to be on and find alternate routes? I don't know. I don't know the answers. But I also know that um, it's not the density of this community that is causing that stress. It's the fact that there is a lot of cross traffic there that has nothing to do here to cause the issue. Um, now, Let's say we say no to this. Well, in five years, you're going to have 
the same traffic issue and the development that's planned here will literally make no difference to that. And so what we're really talking about here, um, we're talking about this land use, but conceptually on a higher level, we're talking about how do we manage car traffic? How do we manage foot traffic? How do we uh, manage a city that is so dependent on vehicles that folks are feeling like they're trapped? They're going to be trapped in their car on this road. And how do we manage things like crosswalks, safe crosswalks that people actually feel like uh, they are confident in utilizing? All of these questions um, surrounding the land issue question, and they're all valid and they should all actually be considered in this. So I'm, I'm of two minds here. On one hand, I'm saying, say no to this, and then just say no to further expansion until things are caught up or until we develop policy citywide, as Councillor Nack was talking about, for um, dedicated transit lanes and help relieve that pressure. It's not going to fix everything, but it will be a slight pressure relief. Um, so on one hand, I'm saying stop all development. Maybe that's the way to go. On the other hand, I'm saying, realistically, we probably can't stop all that development. Uh, I don't think we've got legal recourse to do that. So things are going to go forward anyway. And uh, do we have the footing on a land use question to deny this request? And uh, at this point, I am actually still deliberating. I am literally 50-50 on these uh, questions. And uh, I can see that uh, there's there's more folks who are going to weigh in, and I'm going to be listening very intently. Thank you. Councillor Essinger. Thank you. It's an interesting conversation um, because we would naturally support CB1 on our arterial road, um, which is a good land use for, for this spot. Walkability says you don't have to cross a major road to enjoy the benefits of the businesses uh, that are nearby. I just don't know if, if the traffic is the right reason to deny this development. Uh, for me, if I look at a land use for this space, it seems appropriate. And the conversation about traffic, will it change? Will, is it ever going to change? Well, I, I think the comment from one of the people in favor that said, that's why they want it here, because there's great traffic. Um, it's a place to go. I don't know if we can solve traffic issues by land use decisions. So I'm inclined to support this one. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Henderson, can you take the chair? Will do. Um, I'm inclined to agree with the last few comments um, that, and, and then just observing that while we have become much more parsimonious when it comes to right in, right outs uh, along arterial roads, um, there are design mitigations, uh, sight lines, all kinds of things to try to make that relatively safe. And those are not the places where we have um, significant traffic safety issues in my mind. Um, so if, if that was the case, I, so I hear fear about uh, the turning movements, but I haven't seen evidence to counter what we've heard from our experts uh, about what the engineering requirements would be uh, to safely do it, or as safely as possible, if there's no such thing as perfect. Um, so I'm inclined to agree that uh, the fear of that, again, which I hear loud and clear, is not a reason not to proceed with a land use that makes better sense than an acreage. Um, the only other land use I could think of that might make sense for a corner site like this would be medium density residential, which might not have quite the same trip generation and you might access it differently, but I imagine there would be fear about that change as well. And that's all very natural. Um, but based on uh, everything that I've heard today, mindful of, of 
uh, of all of the perspectives, I think that administration's recommendation is sound and uh, best practice based and should be supported, uh, which I will. So I will take the chair back and see if there's anyone else wishing to speak. Not seeing any, please vote. Yes, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Councillor Katarina. I'm a no, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Councillor Walters. And we're just missing Councillor Paquette. Yeah, sorry, just struggling kind of but through. I mean, we're going to be a yes. Thank you. We have all the votes, Mr. Mayor. Display the vote. That's carried seven to five. Second reading. Councillor Henderson, if you could take the chair. But, oh, I can put second reading on the table. Okay, you'll put uh, second reading. Thank you. Second. Second reading. By Councillor Zadick, I think. Yeah. Okay. Uh, please vote on second reading. Yes, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Councillor Katarina. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. No, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Councillor Walters. And Councillor Zadick? Yes. Thank you. We have all the votes, Mr. Mayor. Uh, display the vote. That's carried seven to five. Uh, I'll move consideration for third reading. Second. Seconded by Councillor Zadick. Please vote to allow third reading to proceed. Yes. Thank you. Yes, Madam Clerk. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Katarina, and thank you, Councillor Pacat. We have 12 votes, Mr. Mayor. Display the vote. Carried. And third reading. And I will move third reading of, where are we here? Bylaw. Oh, there they are. It's a, a bylaw. Do you want the recommendation first or um, bylaws first? Either is fine. Okay, I'll move third reading of the bylaws then. Bylaw 19649 and uh, Charter Bylaw 19650. Second. Thank you. Please vote on third and final reading. We're just missing Councillor Benga. No, Madam Clerk. Thank you. And Councillor Knack. And we have 12 votes, Mr. Mayor. Display the vote. Carried. And I will move uh, the amendment to the Heritage Service Valley Servicing Concept Design Brief, item 3.15. Second. Please vote. And we're just missing Councillor Benga. No. Thank you. We have 12 votes. Thank you. Display the vote. Carried 9 to 3. Okay. What's next? Calder. Right. So we do have... Um, Mr. Mayor, I'm wondering if we should redo the orders for the folks that are waiting to hear from those yes. other items. Yes, let's pause on. there. So for the Calder folks, we'll get to you shortly. But for everybody else who we asked to tune in after 7 with, uh, with an update on where we're at, we are most definitely not getting to many of you tonight. Uh, we, we have uh, Calder, uh, which uh, is only a couple speakers, and then Cromdale, which is uh, many. 
and that will uh, take us to uh, quit in time tonight. Okay. So we might also. I mean, I don't. What about the big the big valley? Might maybe I'm, we may or may not get to that yeah. tonight. I don't know. Um, that's. Uh, I'd stick around just just in case. Uh, it's possible, but then we know, I think, with certainty that Holyrood we won't get to tonight and neither of the Garneau items we will get to tonight. Again, we are going to continue and do what we can tomorrow morning from 9 to noon, and then we have also established uh, next Tuesday as uh, the next available overflow time in the afternoon, um, and then we also have next Friday. Uh, identified as additional overflow time in the afternoon. So, Councillor Henderson? Uh, just as I, I've had an email question from, from the people on the second Garneau item in particular, because this is the second time that they've taken time off to do this. So, I think they knew that this was a good possibility today, but the more certainty we can give them on the next day, I think would be appreciated, because they've been postponed once before. I just flagged that. I, there may be nothing we can do about it, but I did want to raise that concern on their behalf. Yeah, it's um, a far from perfect situation. And we may be in a position to make determinations about time specific after tomorrow once we have a better sense of where it's at. So we can, we can maybe get more specific about uh, the timing of certain items um, depending how the next several hours unfold. The, just to, if I may weigh in again, I, so you're thinking right now it would be most likely they would be next Friday afternoon. That's the most likely scenario for them? I know we can't guarantee that, but just to give them a rough idea? Uh, what, well, one, one option that we've considered, um, but weren't going to pull uh, the trigger on just yet, was to make Holyrood the Tuesday... Uh, item and Garno the Friday the two Garno items the Friday item the problem is if we do that and we finish Hollywood quick we might want that time back for one of the Garno items yeah, so we're I'm, just and I'm, and I'm not sure we could get both our Garno items into one afternoon that's why the straddle kicks in and it gets really difficult to balance three items across two days I understood it's the it's the second Garno item that is now having to wait for the second time. So I think those are the ones, I mean, obviously the first Garneau item will care as well, but it's that second item I think that may, if we, but I, that's why I'm not imagining getting to the, we may get to the, the first Garneau item on Tuesday, but it's very unlikely to get to the second Garneau item on, on Tuesday would be my guess. Well, one option is we could make the last item precedent to start at 1.30 on the Friday um, and if everything else is done then that's when it'll happen if not everything else is done we would pause whatever else we're doing do that and then resume whatever's unfinished which when you say it out loud is tricky to communicate but if it satisfies an issue of equity and both of those items are Garno and have some overlap in the delegations, then that's an option. I would say we could determine that today or we could determine that tomorrow once we see where we're at because we may still have two or three other I, items I, hanging around. I, so, I, I, In asking this question, I don't think we need to nail it down tonight. I just I, I think I think for the people on the on the on the on the, the last of the items, they can be fairly certain we won't get to them until next Friday afternoon. And I, and I, I think can, that's, that would be helpful for them to know at this point, and we can get them more detail well before then. Yes, yeah. I was going to say, I can offer our office can, can keep in communication with those speakers yeah. and, and update them as information's available. Okay. And we, we hopefully will be able to provide some more certainty as time goes. But as you can see from the last several hours, there are variables beyond our control. So... Uh, all right, um, so we've already added time to tomorrow. By the end of this meeting, or do you want to consider motions right now to secure those times just so people know that that's roughly when we're, that they should attempt to block out those times because those are the continuation times generally for the hearing and we'll try to give them more specific. We've already said Holyrood's probably Tuesday. The first Garneau might be Tuesday into Friday. The second Garneau is most likely Friday. 
I, I'm prepared to move those times. I know they've already shown up as a hold in our calendar, so. Okay, so uh, to extend orders further to have this meeting continue beyond tomorrow's already extended time now to uh, what's on the screen there is from 1.30 to 5.30 on uh, the 11th and uh, a further 1.30 to 5.30 on the 14th of May. Seconder? Second. Thank you, Councillor Knack. And Councillor Walters, I see you're on the board. Oh, oh yeah, that's because I had a subsequent from the last item, but oh, I will right. actually... No, I will just give that as notice at a different time. It's it's okay. fine. Okay. All right. Um, That's fine. Okay. We can loop back and do a subsequent if you want. It's uh, I've, I forgot that you had that. I apologize. So we can still take that. We haven't started the other sure. item yet. So. Yeah, it should be fairly non-contentious and very quick. Okay. <clears throat> Let's uh, do that. We'll come back to you for that just after we've done orders here. Um, so I see nobody else on the board. Um, uh, so... If, unless there are any objections to these extension of orders, then by unanimous consent, um, orders are ordered to be reordered accordingly. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> fried at this point. Um, Councillor Walters with the subsequent from the um, Richford item we just heard. Uh, so I will move that the administration conduct a safety review of Fifth Avenue Southwest, which is the road that leads from the other way to that site we just discussed. So the administration conduct a safety review of Fifth Avenue Southwest, looking into potential shortcutting and other traffic related concerns, including but not limited to an assessment of the intersection at 111th Street and Fifth Avenue and provide a memo to council by Q4 2021. And this relates to the road that's coming from the other way. Uh, that's been raised through this process as a cons shortcutting concern. Second. I don't know if there were. I think Councillor Henderson uh, seconded it a moment ago, so um, that's moved and seconded. Any questions on the subsequent? Not seeing any, please vote. We're just missing a couple of votes, Councillor Katarina. Yes, Madam Clerk. Thank you. And Councillor Walters. Oh, yes, I Thank submitted. But... We have 12 votes, mm -hmm. Mr. Mayor. Display the vote. Thank Carried. you. Carried. You're most welcome. Um, now we are on the Calder item. We should get the presentation because we have speakers, so go ahead. Okay. Mr. Mayor, members of council, first off, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Excellent. Thank you. Charter Bylaw 19680 proposes to amend the zoning bylaw to RF3, small scale infill development zone. The applicant's stated intent is to develop a four unit row house with four secondary suites. The site is a corner lot and is located in the north central area of the Calder neighborhood. The Calder neighborhood has a neighborhood improvement plan, or NIP a non-statutory approved by council, sorry, a non-statutory plan approved by council in 1977. While the area of the neighborhood is identified as single family district in the NIP, the proposed rezoning supports neighborhood renewal and will contribute to the provision of a variety of housing choices within the community. The proposed rezoning supports the direction outlined in the city plan to enable ongoing residential infill to occur at a variety of scales, densities, and designs within all parts of residential areas, and to accommodate future growth to a population of 1.25 million within Edmonton's existing boundaries. The residential infill guideline supports small-scale infill in certain locations. Row housing is considered small-scale infill, and while the site does not necessarily meet the guidelines for row house development, it does meet the general intent. It is a corner lot located in a mature neighborhood where intensification is generally desired from a citywide perspective. It's in close proximity, one block south of an arterial road. It's across the lane from a school site and it's within walking distance to the Keanu Park. The surrounding area is generally developed with older single detached housing, except for the, the school site to the west across the lane. 
the mature neighborhood overlay applies to the site, which can modify some RF3 regulations, setback and height, for example, in order to be sensitive to surrounding single family RF1 developments. The MNO also requires site access off the lane. Comments from affected city departments and utility agencies have been addressed. Advance notice was sent to the surrounding property owners, the community league and the area council. One response was received. The caller generally supported redevelopment of the site as the existing building is vacant and a nuisance, although they did express concern about the lack of parking options for the proposed number of dwellings. Administration is in support of this application because it supports development of housing within the missing middle. It contributes to the city plan goal to accommodate future growth to a population of 1.25 million within Edmonton's existing boundaries, and it provides renewal opportunities within the neighborhood. Well, thank you, that's my presentation. Thank you. Um, we've got uh, Niraj Nath. Um, yes, sir, the president. And you, uh, uh, did you have a presentation or just for questions? For questions only. Okay, any questions for Mr. Nath? Councillor Essinger? Yes, um, I just wondered if you're able to uh, tell us what the plan is for the site. Um, RF3 row housing, do you have garages in the back? I had a lot of concerns uh, just around the parking and where the cars are going here. Yeah, so this one's a 50 foot wide lot. Uh, so there will be a detached parking garage uh, with four stalls, four bays. Uh, the plan is to do a row house here, four units minimum. Okay. Um, I think that's all I needed to know for now. I might have questions later. And I, as the next door neighbor, do have Sorry. some questions also. Uh, is that you, Mr. Wisniak? Yes, it is, uh, your mayor. Okay, your, your, uh, your um, uh, opportunity to speak will come in just a moment, sir. So if you could just stand okay, by. Okay, no problem. Yeah, yeah, I'll come to you. Uh, Councillor Walters, or were you on the board from before? That was from before, Mr. Mayor, forgive me. Okay, uh, uh, you are forgiven. Um, Councillor, um, uh, or pardon me, uh, Mr. Nath, I see no further questions for you at this time, so thank you for being here. Mr. Wisniak, now is your time to shine. You have five minutes to share your uh, um your response and raise any questions you would hope to see dealt with. Yes, okay, well, thank you. It's sort of sad that 20 years of my existence here is gonna be limited to five minutes, and also the next 20 years of me living in this house will be limited to five minutes of talking. Uh, what I'm mostly concerned about, and I've brought it up with Cindy before, and I see they've addressed with the four parking spots, but uh, odd, on this particular 150 foot lot, there is a fire hydrant right 32 feet from the corner. And with the 16 feet no parking, that's already eliminated most of that one long side. <clears throat> and the other questions I have, I've been here for 20 years. I've never had a flooded base. I've had enjoyed it being on the school and everything else. But what is going to happen with four I, they, they've done this R3 over on 132nd and 117th Street. It's being built as we speak, and it is at least one whole floor or the roof height above anything in the area. I And, and I'm going to be living in the shadow of one of these. And uh, I would ask all 12 members, if this was being built next door to your place and you had to have the daylight gone for the rest of your existence on that property, not to mention it may bring down the values. And it seems like the city, in my opinion, is targeting uh, corner lots because they're only going to have one person to talk to. But getting out of all that, I would like to know when they develop this, because there is a clay area, and I used to be with facility management at my office over here, three blocks away with CN, there's a very high water table. So I'm quite concerned if they dig, I would like to see the next, uh, this development within 100 millimeters of the previous so that I don't all of a sudden have to deal with flooding in my sewer system when they have four new households flushing into the same system that before it was one. So I'm quite concerned that there could be some sewage backup where there's never been before. 
The other thing I'm quite concerned about is the amount of uh, drainage that's going to be created by this. And another question I'd have is how much of the lot, what percentage of the lot is going to be allocated. And so I'm just going through a few of the points I have. Uh, I had asked, and it's sort of like putting the cart before the horse, because I would like to see the elevation plans of what they're going to be erecting next to me and how deep they're going to go because of the much the same. Then also, when they fill the whole lot up with a row house, the space between us right now on, the, on my south side, the ice and snow stays for quite a while, much like on the uh, north or the south side of a riverbank, the ice stays there. It's going to become a big wind trap for snow in between our two structures. Uh, let me see what else I have here. It's, they've taken out some 60-year-old growth uh, trees because I've counted the annular rings, so the city must not be too concerned about uh, the environment when they knock down trees like crazy like that. When it's... <laughs> Uh, so I would really like to be assured that I'm not going to be flooded out when they develop and put, because I've already seen where they're doing, they're doing this on 113th and 100, or pardon me, 117th and 132nd. The stairs are already hanging off the sides and they're going to be raising their lot by about two feet. So if all this wash or all the water from the watershed of the roofs I'm quite concerned where that's going to go to. Uh, and the big one is, will the storms out, because it is a mature neighborhood. And I've seen, uh, they've had Ivis out here trying to clean the manholes for proper drainage that we, that I might get flooded out when this happens. It, like sewer back up from 30 extra feet or 20 extra feet of elevation from bathrooms on the pre next structure to me could have uh, to follow the past of path of least resistance into my basement possibly. And with that clay area there, I was wondering, did they do a, a geotech analysis to see if this is going to be a good place to put a structure like that? Um, and I haven't got these big, long slides of presentations because I sort of feel like David versus Goliath. I know that the developing company is probably doing another 20 of these as we speak around the city. And I know that the city is, of course, in favor of having four taxpayer bases rather than one when we're here. But in the studies that I've seen from infills in Calgary specifically, it takes away from young people being able to buy an affordable bungalow. What will happen here is there'll be four residences and there'll probably all be more than any of the existing homes that are for sale in this neighborhood. And it's gonna affect my property value by having to live in a shadow here now. And I would once again ask all 12 councillors, if this was in your lot next to you, would you be happy with having no view and living in a shadow? Uh, I'm open to some questions. I think I have more notes, or maybe I've used up my time. But like I say, I've waited since 12 to, I guess it's now. Thank you, Mr. 45 for me to be able to spend five minutes to affect the next 20 years of my life in my household here and my wife. Thank you, Mr. Wisniak. Uh, questions? Councillor Essinger, go ahead. Yes, and thank you for hanging in there with us today, Mr. Wisniak. Um, certainly appreciate your comments today, and I just want to make sure I understand your concern was really about the impact on your home with the sewer, with drainage, um, and, and uh, the side setback I think you were worried about. Um, the other okay. thing I heard you say was you're concerned about the height. Do I have those right? That is correct, um, well, currently it's our it's zoned for a single family, which can't be more than 8.9 meters, and that's what the proposal is. So I don't think it's designed to uh, tower over you. But I'm going to ask administration those other questions on your behalf. Um, I would much appreciate that because, like I say, the house that's being built on 130th, I can see it being constructed, and it's 
it, go, it has an, the just the other floor levels already above my property height, and they're still going to put a roof on that one. Yeah, and I'm today we're just dealing with this one. I'm not sure about that, but these are legitimate questions, and we'll ask on your behalf. All right. Uh, yes, and uh, I've also got a consultant in advising me on some of these uh, things that I'm bringing up, and uh, I can see that already because it's pretty. Uh, when you get your statement in the mail that says that the city has already approved this or wishes to see this go through, I, get, I think their exact quotes are something like administration supports this proposed charter bylaw. So it's, I'm looking at the whole site map. There's the one there, and now I'll be the second one. And it's going to, of course, impact this neighborhood because if each of these four residences and most young families have two cars, not to mention when they have visitors and stuff, and if you were ever out here, well, you don't have to because you guys know already you've rezoned a lot of the traffic flow to accommodate all the students and all the families that bring their children and stuff through here. Uh, there's already three handicapped parking places because we're all seniors around here. And my wife has already put in because we have a 90-year-old uncle and 88-year-old aunt that have a parking permit for handicap. So we'd like to make sure before this happens that we at very least get to be like the other three seniors here and have a place for them to park where they can come in from the front. And the other reset I'd like to talk about is what about going to your new garbage can systems? All of a sudden we're going to have four, well, I guess it would be eight if everybody's allowed two, and the only place they have here, much like my place, is through the back alley to take these garbage cans. Are they going to have a built-in enclosure for the garbage? Uh, or am I going to be running around like I have been in the past, picking up garbage from what's get blown by out of the other can and stuff? I understand your concerns, and uh, certainly we'll ask those questions. But the beauty of this lot is that it's nearby two schools, so might bring some young people into the area, but there's no guarantee that it will. Um, but I will ask your questions to administration to clarify, okay? Yes, yeah, that, thank you. That is sort of a beauty of some in some ways, but a curse in others for people who need parking here because as it stands already, when the school comes in, goes out, and at lunch because they have three different phases, and this is now in the we're into the uh, COVID era, but it, before the pre-COVID, that's why some of the other seniors here have put these handicapped because they you can't find a place to park here. And I appreciate that you're, you've put it to the one way, but if you have cars parked out by that fire hydrant and cars on the other side, take a look at the width of the load would be a uh, width of the road, pardon me, and look and see. You can't get two cars or uh, uh, to go by when there's a, somebody parked on either side of the road, it barely makes it room for one for people to egress through here. Yes, and thank you, uh, Ms. Essinger, for uh, going through all this. And I, I still would like, I know it's like I say, the cart before the horse, but I would sort of like to see the elevation plans and be assured that they're going to only go within 100 millimeters of where the past foundation was so that it doesn't really change a whole bunch like uh, if they dig down deeper i'm pretty sure being as i've worked with facility management with all cm's buildings over here at, in the calder area and now we're called the walker area from the yard anyway but there is a high water table as i'm sure you're aware and i'm quite scared that if they dig any deeper than the previous foundation it's going to severely affect me yeah, and I'm going to ask those questions for you on your behalf, but unfortunately, my five minutes is up now as well. Thank you. Okay, well, thanks for my five minutes for the next 20 years, uh, City Council. Thank you. Um, I see no further questions for you at this time, Mr. Wisniak, and you will actually get the chance, once we've asked questions of administration, for up to an additional five minutes under new information, uh, should you need it uh, to cover anything uh, that we haven't covered already or that comes up in the Q&A. So, Councillor Essinger, do you have questions for administration? Uh, yes, I do. Um, you've heard the questions from uh, Mr. Wisniak, concern about uh, the impact on his home, the sewer, the drainage, uh, the height of the building, side setbacks. Could you just speak to some of those items, please? I can get Laurie Moulton to 
speak to the planning questions and then Mr. Jutinder Tawana will talk to the drainage issues. Thank you. Okay, so I will start with the side yard setbacks. With the RF3 zone and the mature neighborhood overlay imposed on that, the interior side yard setback, so the site, the south lot line on the on the property being rezoned adjacent to um, Mr. Wisniak, is it? His property would be three meter setback, which is the RF1 zone currently requires a 1.2 meter setback. So it's, it's a little bit more. It's more than double more, actually. And the height, both are 8.9 meters in height, maximum height for whether it's a single detached or a multi-unit dwelling. Um, there was a question about garbage cans too. My understanding is when they bring in the new garbage cans, they can, could either have either the four individual or possibly one consolidated garbage can. But not entirely sure on that one, but that's what it's sort of looking like. And with that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Tuana. Councillor, uh, we uh, calculated the sanitary flows uh, as well as the storm flows. 32. So, 30. I'm sorry, Mr. Mr. Wisniak, if you could just uh, mute yourself for a moment here till we have a chance to come back to you. All right, sorry, carry on with the answers. Uh, this site is adjacent to a, a combined sewer main, uh, which is a fairly large size, 525 millimeter to be precise. Uh, the anticipated flows from sanitary are 0.14 liters per second. And the anticipated flows from storm in a 100-year event are only 6.61 liters. So when we add these two together, they are less than 2% of the pipe capacity. So we don't have any concerns as regards sewer backing up. Uh, the only instance of sewer backing up in this area is further along 132 Street, uh, that is the closest uh, where we, it has been uh, experienced in the past. Uh, there is uh, no issue as regards silver capacity uh, in the immediate vicinity. Thank you. Uh, the other question we had was really about uh, the possibility of flooding. Um, do we have any information that this would cause that or? No, uh, like the flows being generated, uh, uh, there is not very much change because it's only a 0 0.06 hectare parcel. So the change in flows is not much. And even with the maximum uh, generation that's going to happen, it is less than 2% of the pipe capacity. So we are fairly confident that uh, it is not going to change anything as regards drainage over here. Okay, great. Um and I guess I'll go back to Ms. Moulton. Um, so I just want to make sure that I understand it so Mr. Wisniak can. The height is no higher than what can be allowed right now under RF1. The side setback is actually farther, almost twice as much under the RF3, right? Yes, correct on both counts. Actually, yes, it's more than double what's currently required in the RF1. And they still are required to have that rear yard is still a half space for a rear yard, correct? I'm sorry, it's, it's still, um, yes, the same amount of 40% of the site depth for the rear yard. So it'll be very similar um, to what could be there now. Okay, I think those are his questions for now. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Henderson. Well, I, th I think I might have heard two more questions, so I just wanted to check on these. Um, because of because his building is to the south, um, there won't be any sun shadow impact. Correct? Am I right about that? I mean, because the sun, he his building will shadow this new building run the other way around. There should, I mean, the way the sun works, there should be no sun shadow impact. Am I getting that correct. right, or I have it backwards? Correct. That's no, this, uh, this the property in question being rezoned is to the north. Yeah. So if it was the other way around, there'd be there might be concerns about sun shadow impact, and probably would be significant. But this way, there's zero sun shadow impact. Correct. Correct. And then the one other question that I think I heard was about the overland drainage piece. And um, so if you can just walk through now, you know, I, I know we've run into glitches on this before that that we sometimes have problems where where the original property may currently be draining onto the neighbor. Um, and there's not much we can do about that if that changes, but we have rules making sure that the new building will not drain onto the, 
onto onto the, the existing property, correct? Uh, correct, Councillor. Uh, uh, this is a corner lot, and uh, they are required to put in a storm service. Uh, the current property does not have a storm service. Uh, the future development will uh, will be required to put in a storm service, and that will connect to the mains uh, within the street. Okay. So, I mean, I, we can't say for sure that the drainage won't change, but it would only change if Mr. Uh, sorry, I can't remember. Is it Mr. Wozniak's? Um, uh, um, but Wisniak's current property is draining across that neighbor. That would be the only reason drainage would change, correct? For him. So, Councillor, any... my my property drains into the sewer system Sorry, directly Wisniak. through my house. I don't Sorry, have outside drainage. Yeah. No, You're I'm gonna... just establishing it for you. So, I just wanted to do a double check on this because I know we've had that issue in the past. Yes. That's the only reason why we might have drainage issues. It wouldn't be based on the new the new property. It would be based on existing conditions, correct? So any new development has to ensure that there isn't any cross-lot drainage. Yep. Uh, that includes uh, typically developing a uh, landscape wall in between the two properties yep. uh, and ensure that the drainage, surface drainage on site is front to back yep. instead of sideways. So, uh, and so that's covered off through the drainage yep. bylaw and the drainage inspection yep. so team we, looks So we at can that. ensure and guarantee that none of that property's water will come onto Mr. Wisniak's property. There are processes in yep. place to ensure that. Great, thanks. Thank you. That addresses my concern too, because I, I sorry, like Mr. That Wisniak. Last Mr. Wisniak, this is not a back and forth. You will have a moment uh, to offer your feedback in just a second. I will come to you. Please stand by until I do. Um, I now need, under new information, to check with Mr. Nath. Did you have any new information you wish to respond to at this point in the public hearing? Not at all, Mr. Mayor. Great. Okay, thank you. Mr. Wisniak, is there any new information yes. that you would like to respond to? Go ahead. Now is your time. No, uh, everything sounds good. If they can guarantee that the watershed from that building isn't going to come on onto my lot or that they're not going to elevate that lot two feet higher than mine so that it comes onto my property. And I wasn't concerned about the sun shadow. I was concerned about all the snow that's going to drift between our buildings and how long it's going to take for the ice and stuff to melt in the shade of the two of us. Well, I'm, I'm very glad that uh, those pressing questions were resolved for you and, and that you have some assurance about the, the process. Uh, Councillor Essinger, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Wisniak. So I think we've answered your questions and you feel comfortable uh, with this development now. Is that what I understand? Uh, except for the fact when you talk and quote, because I used to be doing a lot of culverts for the railway, a 525 millimeter drainage is not all that big, especially with four households all of a sudden flushing into it where there was one in the past. It's fine to state that it's only going to be 0.25%, but if there's flushing and stuff happening during a storm, that dramatically changes. And that's the one and only last concern. If they can guarantee that I'm not going to have no sewer backups, then I'm a happy camper. Well, I think that's why we asked the experts how they felt about that so that we could feel assured. Yes, well, I've got a lot of experience with COVID and drainages on all the CN properties in Western Canada. And I assure you that it may sound good, but 510 millimeter isn't even a 16 inch drain. And they're, you're adding another four all of a sudden they're going to have a 20-foot head on my property that the bathrooms are going to be way above mine. So, yes, if you can assure me I don't have any sewer backups, I'm a happy camp. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for coming today and sharing your thoughts. It was a long, growing one, and I don't envy you guys because I've been asking for seven and a half, waiting for my five minutes for the rest of my 20-year career of living here. But thank you once again, Council and Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Wisniak, for your patience as well with us. Um, are there, is there any new, new information? No? Councillor Essinger? So I'm happy to move closure of the public hearing. Second. Thank you. Uh, please vote on closure of the public hearing. Yes, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Councillor Katarina. And we're just missing Councillor Cartmel. 
Councilor Carmel. Okay, well, we may have to mark him absent for that. Display the vote with. Oh, um, it just oh. came in. Super. There we go. Uh, okay, carried unanimously. First reading. Thank you. I'll move uh, first reading and then speak to it. Second. Uh, I just wanted to say, uh, and I appreciated Mr. Wozniak coming in today and sh sharing his concerns, um, but for the community, this seems to be the appropriate place to have this RF3 um, row housing near two schools uh, near a major transportation corridor along 132. Um, and we've heard the concerns and I believe we've mitigated them. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, please vote. And apologies, um, I misspoke before Councillor Cartmel was marked absent um, for the last vote. So I see that he's on the meet. I just wanted to. Okay, I'm a yes, Kate. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cartmel. We have 12 votes. Display the vote. Carried. And I'll move second reading of item 318. Second. Second reading, please vote. We're just missing Councillor Katarina. Yes, Madam Clerk. Thank you, we have 12 votes. Display the vote, please. Carried. Um, Thank you. Oh. No, somebody's not right there. Yes, Sign Councillor right. Katarina's having abstained. Yes. No. I think that that may have been a glitch on our end. Okay. I, I did see him as in favor in the system. Yeah, Tony Tony was in favor, so that's carried unanimously. Um, That'll move consideration for third reading. Second. Thank you. Uh, please vote to allow third reading to proceed. Yes, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Councillor Katarina. And we have 12 votes. Display the vote, please. Carried. I'll move third uh, reading of Charter Bylaw 19680. Second. On third and final reading, please vote. Yes, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Councilor Katarina. And we have 12 votes. Display the vote, carried unanimously. Okay, that's the Calder item. Next up is the Cromdale item, which remember we have 22 registered speakers on, so uh, that will almost certainly take us uh, to quitting time here. Assuming they're all here, so yeah, well, um, yeah, we shouldn't send away Big Lake just yet, because uh, we'll at least have an update on when we'll get to them. Um, so uh, without further ado, let's get the presentation on the Cromdale item. And I'm going to pass the chair to Councillor Henderson just because i got to pop in the back for a second during the okay. presentation. So, so go ahead. Uh, presentation, please. Thank you. We'll just wait for the presentation to be up on the screen. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and Councillors. This application is to rezone a site in the Cromdale neighbourhood from RF1 Single Detached Residential Zone, CNC Neighbourhood Convenience Commercial Zone, an RA7 low-rise apartment zone to the RA8 mid-rise apartment zone. In association with the proposed zoning, there is also a road closure application, which would close an unused lane that is positioned internally to the rezoning area. Once closed, the closure area and adjacent parcels will be consolidated to assemble the development site. The proposed RA8 zone would allow for the development of a residential building with a maximum height of 23 meters, or approximately six stories, with limited commercial opportunities at ground level. Next slide, please. In addition to the rezoning and road closure components, the application also proposes to amend the Cromdale Virginia, area, Virginia Park Area Redevelopment Plan 
to allow for this mid-rise six-storey building. Next slide, please. The 0.24 hectare vacant site is located along 112th Avenue, which is a major roadway between 78 and 79th Streets. Next slide. The site borders single detached housing along its southern and western edges and park space along north and eastern edges with Borden Park north of 112th Avenue and Stutchbury Park east of 78th Street. In addition to the abundance of park space within the vicinity of this site, other notable land uses within walking distance include commercial amenities to the west along 112th Avenue, including a grocery store, and access to the River Valley and Sherdews Path through the Kennard Ravine to the south. The site has, all good, has also good access to public transit with the Stadium Station LRT stop located approximately 550 metres and frequent and local bus routes along 112th Avenue and 82nd Street Northwest. Bicycle facilities are also available along 79th Street adjacent to the site. Next slide. As the majority of the site is currently zoned RA7, identified in blue on this slide, the current development rights for those portions also allow for the development of multi-unit multi housing in the form of an apartment building with limited commercial opportunities at ground level, albeit at a lower maximum height of 16 metres or approximately four storeys. Permitted uses in both in, within the RA8 zone are the same as the RA7, as are other regulations such as building setbacks. As a result, the land use change being considered by this application, with the exception of the parcels currently zoned CNC and RF1, identified on this slide as purple and yellow, can be generalized as a request to increase development intensity on this site by approximately two stories. Next slide. The site's most sensitive edge is along its southern boundary where it shares a property line with single detached housing. To mitigate the impacts produced by the increase in building massing, the RA8 zone will require a minimum building setback of seven and a half meters along this property line. Further mitigation me measures, including landscaping within this setback area and privacy screening for boundaries will also be required. Next slide. There are several factors that suggest that this is an appropriate location to accommodate the additional development intensity allowed by the RA8 zone which include, this is a relatively large site that is located along adjacent to a major roadway, 112th Avenue, where this type of development is most appropriate. It's within walking distance of a variety of amenities which can support the additional density, including public transit options, commercial services, parks, and convenient access to the River Valley and Sherdews Path network. The site is separated from adjacent properties to the north, east and west by existing roads and from the south through the adherence to the RE8 setback. Next slide. In context, on the north side of 112th Avenue is the newly approved exhibition lands planning framework and this application is compatible within this framework which also allows for the building height of up to six meters, sorry, up to six stories. Next slide. The city plan identifies the stadium station area as being a district node. While there are no specific boundaries identified for district nodes, they're considered to be approximately one kilometer across. Located across, sorry, located approximately 550 meters from stadium station LRT stop, this site is in close proximity of this district node. A district node is diverse and includes housing, employment, and amenities. And typical buildings include mid-rise and some high-rise buildings. As such, from a high-level planning policy, this proposed mid-rise building is in support of the infill projects and objectives of the plan. Next slide. To conclude, administration recommends approval of this application because it proposes a moderate increase in building mass on a site primarily zoned for low-rise apartment buildings. It's appropriately located along a major roadway within walking distance to a variety of amenities and it introduces a mid-rise building near a stadium station district node. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <coughs> first up would be Mr. Golightly, uh, but questions only. Are there any questions for Mr. Golightly? Not seeing any, then uh, Lucas Stone is up next to speak in favor. Mr. Stone, the floor is yours. Mr. Stone. Excuse me, Mr. Mayor. It's Bard, it's Bard Golightly. Um, I had asked to uh, make a presentation. Is that option not available? 
Oh, no, it is. I just have you down for questions only for some reason. But, oh, um, that but if you, just if you want to present, absolutely. It, it, is it possible? A hundred percent. Do you have uh, material as well? Uh, oh, yep, there it is right go. there. It's up, it's up on the screen. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. I uh, appreciate that the discussion here this evening is, is primarily around land use. But I would like to just spend a few minutes uh, prior to that to trying to give an outline of the intention of this development because uh, I believe it provides a suitable context for the discussion this evening. So if we could uh, move to the next slide, please. Uh, so what we're proposing here is, is a seniors-oriented development. We call it the forgotten 40%. Uh, I have had extensive experience working in the seniors uh, world and Unfortunately, there are a lot of seniors get lost and forgotten. Either there's low-end housing or high-end housing, and often nothing in the middle. So this is a, a model where uh, we're putting folks into this development on a volunteer model, uh, where they do a lot of the work and they become part of the community and they're contributing to the housing in which they live. Uh, next slide, please. Um, there's a, a short list here of, of the kinds of things that vol volunteers will do when living in this building. I won't spend a lot of time on it, but it does give you a sense of the kind of ideas of, uh, of, of involving people uh, in activities, some of which they bring their own expertise to. Next slide, please. Uh, with uh, a, a little bit more about the building or the services in the building. So, all the, all the suites will have full kitchens, residents can cook, and there will be an access to a communal kitchen. Uh, there's recreation planning. Uh, there'll be a shuttle van for transportation. Uh, a variety of optional services will be available to the folks living here. And uh, because of the age group, there is an emergency call system or emergency call program available. Uh, next slide, please. Um, there's a bit of programming in the building. It's all about creating community and wellness and uh, some sense of uh, activity. I'll just leave it at that. And if we could go to the next slide. Um, I'm expecting that um, most folks are going to be interested in, in, in what is planned here. Uh, so we're talking about 62 units with 40 underground parking stalls. Uh, we intend on on uh, carving out a lay-by in front of the building. Um, there is a significant uh, amount of amenity space in addition to that of various floors. And, and on the list in front of you, you'll see uh, a variety of amenities. The purpose of, um, of, of this uh, slide is to try to give a context to the scale of the, this project. Um, we, I wanna touch on parking, if I may, in that, uh, we think we may be over parked on this, but uh, we are going to provide 40, under, 40 underground parking stalls. My experience has been that in these kinds of developments, we end up with a number of empty parking stalls. Point being that uh, often traffic and parking are concerns, understandably, when there's new developments in a neighborhood, it's, it's a fair, fair concern. Um, I believe with this kind of a development though, uh, we're gonna see uh, that's gonna be somewhat minimized uh, just because of the nature of, of the use of the building. Uh, we could go to the next slide, please. Um, this is uh, on the corner is, as it was displayed earlier, 112th and 79th. Uh, so uh, the just like the last proposal, the shadows will be cast on to 112th and, and to the west of north where uh, they'll have minimal impact. Uh, parking will come from 112. We don't uh, anticipate there'll be a lot of, uh, of uh, traffic uh, transversing through the neighborhood with, with 112 as a, a major corridor right there. Parking is on site, and as I mentioned earlier, um, this demographic typically doesn't bring nearly as many cars. It's already been mentioned about the proximity to the uh, stadium LRT station, so I won't dwell on that. Um, the, uh, the pedestrian connectivity in this neighborhood is wonderful. There's a, a lot of things to do, whether it's to go to the park, whether it's to uh, wander across the street to, down to the, the shopping, to the, the Savon. 
there's a medical clinic across the street. Um, there is the future redevelopment to the north, which was discussed earlier. Um, so we see this as a great fit for this neighborhood. It's just one more thing in a neighborhood which really is in transition and is a welcome revitalization. Um, so next and last slide, please. Um, so, uh, you know, we're requesting uh, this motion receive its three readings this evening and, and approval. Uh, we sincerely believe this development meets the goals of the city plan and of the aspirations of our city. And uh, also sincerely believe this, this development contributes to the community. It's uh, going to be uh, something that is going to bring life to the community with minimal parking and minimal traffic and uh, certainly contribute to the economic viability of the shops and services around it. And with that, I'll, I'll, uh, I'm certainly open to questions. Thank you, Mr. Golightly. Questions? Councillor Katarina? Yeah, sorry, I can't get on uh, the C scribe tonight. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Golightly, uh, for uh, the presentation. And I know that I've seen this before uh, two, three years ago. Right. Uh, when, we first, uh, when we first met on this, and uh, I see that uh, you've basically kept it uh, virtually the same as what you presented uh, uh, a number of years ago uh, in the intent uh, of, uh, of this. So you've answered a number of the questions uh, that are obviously going to come up, uh, uh, parking uh, and providing uh, uh, probably too many uh, underground parking stalls, but uh, sun shadow, uh, those sorts of things, which uh, we are to the north. Uh, the one thing that uh, I think has changed since uh, then was the... Uh, uh, integration of a new station at one uh, fifteenth. Uh, I know we've uh, talked about, or you've talked about uh, Stadium, uh, which is close uh, vicinity. But you'll actually have a closer one. Uh, there will be a closer one eventually at one fifteenth. Uh, that's the plan for the exhibition lands uh, uh, going forward. So, have you uh, reconsidered that and or added it to your plans? We have, we were aware of those plans and we just see that it's that much more of a neighborhood integration benefit. Uh, one of the things that will be encouraged in this whole development is, is walkability, getting out, being active, yet finding one way, one's way to transportation, which we believe will be mostly, uh, to a large degree, the public transportation will be relied on. For that, Terry. And just to put it into context, uh, um, Obviously, the empty uh, lands uh, to the uh, north of the exhibition lands. Uh, and then Kitty Corner is the medical center, uh, which would be, um, I guess, quite useful uh, given uh, uh, the clientele that you're looking to uh, uh, provide housing uh, for. Uh, the uh, first building west of uh, the Medi Center, uh, there in Northeast uh, Medical Center, uh, a condominium building, that's a six story there, too, right? That's an RA8. So that's sort of the context of, of what you can actually uh, physically see right now that's uh, in very short proximity uh, to that. Uh, to the west, you have uh, uh, apartment buildings and then a, uh, a small CNC uh, on the corner of 82nd Street and 105th. Yes. Okay, so that that's... Uh, uh, describes the uh, sort of general uh, description of what already exists there and uh, uh, what's going to be forward with the exhibition lines. So. Okay, yeah, that's I just want a confirmation. Yeah, uh, go ahead. Uh, sorry. No, I'm just going to contribute to the conversation in that where we see that the folks living here are going to just contribute to that sense of community and, and continue to patronize those shops that you just mentioned on the, on the corner there, as well as the other commercial and most certainly the medical center across the street. Yeah, the uh, 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 one last question. The uh, uh, commercial uh, space that you're considering in CNC, uh, can you give me a, a, a scale? Uh, what what are you uh, anticipating uh, size-wise, square footage? Um, about 4,000 square feet of amenity space, but most of it will be dedicated strictly to this building. So I don't see this as typical CRU commercial space um, at all. I, this will be in building use. So there could be podiatrists, there, there could be um, other services, uh, hair salon, 
that sort of thing, but all dedicated to the building. We don't anticipate this being a, a retail. A retail uh, from external. Okay, well, that answers, uh, I think, some of the questions uh, on uh, traffic generation to convenience yeah. stores or, or that sort of thing. So this is all internal to the residents. Yes, it is. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. That's all the questions I have. You're most welcome. I see no further questions for you, Mr. Golightly. Um, do we have Mr. Stone? I don't believe so. Our office um, is reaching out to him okay. now. I just don't have an update at this point. Okay. Um, well, we'll uh, turn now to, he may have an opportunity under new information if he is able to join us. Um, <clears throat> so now we will hear from those in opposition, starting with Debbie Bocabella. Debbie, are you there? I believe that. Yes. yes go ahead. Good evening. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and City Council. As a resident of this neighborhood for 19 years, I oppose the R8 rezoning. I take this very personally since my house would be in the shadow of a six-story apartment building. Five floors of balconies looking down on my backyard would end all privacy. If this is to be a six-story wood frame construction, there is also danger of fire. Many past six-story wood frame fire occurrences are started from smokers and barbecues on balconies. I have quoted Fire Chief Ken Block in a CBC interview, six-story frame buildings pose fire risk. This is a safety issue for me as I have cedar shakes on my house. Can you tell me what benefit this development would be to our neighborhood. The city is already planning an 8,500 residential expansion on the exhibition land. Why then is such a large residence building with, with 62 dwellings and a commercial strip mall required in our area? It will definitely decrease our property values, increase our local traffic, and make parking even more difficult on the street. With the increase of people, there is also an increase of vandalism, crime, and noise. We have a close-knit, friendly community with supportive social bonds between residents. We have yearly block parties, a neighborhood watch, and a small off-leash park bordering on the ravine. Originally, we understood a smaller development was going on the corner, no more than four stories, which was not opposed. This is a dramatic change and it will dominate our area, controlling our lives and our financial futures for years. Hopefully you will understand why we wanna protect the unique residential gems of Comdale East and Virginia Park. Please do what is best for the city and these communities. I'm happy to answer any questions. Council. Thank you very much. Any questions for Ms. Pocabella? Not seeing any. <clears throat> Thank you for your presentation. Next up will be Lori Rack. Uh, excuse me. Uh, did you? I submitted photos and a petition. Yes, those those uh, are available to us through council correspondence. We we have received them. Okay, thank you. You're welcome, <clears throat> Lori Rackle. Uh, good evening, council members and Mayor Don Iverson. Uh, thank you, Bart, for your presentation. I am a, a resident. I'm on seven seven three seven one one two South Avenue, and I will be directly facing the uh, proposed development, which is a change from R7 to R8. And I'm in opposition to it based on just the sheer volume and increase to many factors. When I was worried about safety issues due to the ambulance access on the walk light, right now as the safety is it, it takes 15 seconds for that walk light for a patient to walk across. I am a research coordinator and I work extensively with seniors. They cannot get across the street that fast 
And in fact, it is happens at least once a day that I see somebody almost get hit. I don't know how much he, um, pedestrian traffic issues have been in that particular spot, but I see that as a problem that will, will be need to be addressed if this goes forward. The other thing is that uh, I, I value the fact that that is going to be a senior complex, but I don't see the reason for six stories. I'm also worried about the sewer grading. We just replaced the whole area on 79th Street. You're now going to dig an underground, which will affect that area that was just finished in the fall. So I'm, I'm concerned for that. The other concern is that you are allowing 40 residential parking spots on an underground facility, which is, sounds great, but what about the care workers? There's on average one care worker per, per every resident in a cooperative situation, and I don't think that you've uh, factored that. You're, act, you're telling me that that is the city, city residents or the people that will own the property, but where are the care workers parking and where are the visitors? We have Virginia Park Lodge, and we see an offset on all the streets around that area. That street of 79th is a biking path, which is used extensively to access. And I'm worried that that will increase pedestrian issues with traffic. Also, the fact is that my house has no access to the back lane due to the ravine. So I'm forced to park on the street and if I have an overflow of people parking, I cannot park in front of my own house, which I own. The other thing I want to bring to your attention is that by extending this to an R8, you're increasing the paving demands, which we have been paying for over the last little while. And I would like to see that addressed. I'm looking at the power grid overload, especially with the senior residents, if that's the proposition. They will need extensive servers for that. Um, I don't know about the balconies, if that's what you're going to put forward, that might be okay. Removal of a buffer lane is an extreme concern because you're now having noise and concern. And I don't see how that big development with the big light shadow, how removing the buffer lane is going to be any kind of value to the residents there right now. So uh, I do support a senior facility. I would prefer to see a R7 stay in place. 62 residents can be accommodated on a four-story facility, and I think that that should remain in as it is. Um, and I will be available for questions, and I will quote some of the bylaws that you are proposing to, to amend. Bylaw 19685 to close the right away on Cromdale. That's a buffer. That is an extremely bad decision considering that that's an arterial float 112. It feeds from off the Wayne Gretzky. It feeds to 112. It also is going to be supporting the 8,500 residents that are going to be put into the exhibition park. And I, as a tune lay, lane with a walk light situated right there, uh, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to see that that's going to be an issue. And you're talking to amend our uh, park area redevelopment plan, which I am in strong opposition of. I have no problem with the R7, but to, to develop that big light shadow and put a density in that area, uh, we can support density no problem with the R7. 62 residents can fit on that 4,000 square thing. If it's a senior complex, the amount of square footage they need is substantially less, and I do not see the reason for an R8 put there. That just lends to degradate the whole neighborhood, which is now uh, protected as a historic situation, and I don't see how that is going to be of any use to anybody in the neighborhood that already lives there. I think that there, we could work with the developer on that and they could amend their project to fit in the present zoning. Um, and I think I will leave it at that since that I was gonna talk about the roadways and the bikeways because you put that on there, but seniors don't walk that fast and it may or may not affect the, the bikers, which is myself. And I am Thank also you. considered a senior. So, so Thank you, Ms. Rackle. I will be open to any questions afterwards. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Questions for Ms. Rackle? Not seeing any.
Thank you very much. Next is Jennifer K. Bowerman. <laughs> I do see Jennifer on the meet, um, but she's muted. Jennifer? Perhaps, yeah, perhaps we'll go to uh, Anthony Oliver and then we'll come back to Jennifer uh, in a moment once the technical issue is resolved. Anthony, are you there? Hi folks, I sure am. Yes, you are. Proceed, please. Do we have my presentation, sir? Yep. Slide here, one. Here it comes. Great. Mayor Iveson, members of council, thanks for the opportunity to speak to you. I favor densification and commercial and residential development at the vacant site, but I oppose the ARP amendment, lane removal, and RA zoning. From the outset, I should mention that the developer, while touting plans for a large seniors complex, has owned these four parcels since 2007 but is yet to develop. Even though the ARP and current zoning permits low rise and commercial opportunities, which require the laneway, the laneway already in place. The developer has put these parcels up for sale for some time now. My concern is that the rezoning application is about resale value as opposed to solid justification and good reason for changing the ARP and dramatically transforming our family oriented community, both at Cromdale, Virginia Park and Viewpoint all contained within the ARP. That plan at present is compatible with the stadium station plan and the exhibition grounds plan, which collectively reflect the city's infill objectives. West of 82nd um, Stadium and north of 112, marked by high, uh, medium to high density commercial residential. And then for us, east of 82nd and south of 112 Ave, um, maintaining the stability and preservation of the family oriented character and the historic elements of our ribbon community, while also permitting uh, residential-based uh, commercial opportunities. Our house at 11202 79th Street, circled in red, and the parcels at issue to its left are located in sub-area five of that ARP. Uh, as a whole, we're bounded by to the south by the North Saskatchewan River and to the, um, uh, to the west by 82nd Street and to the north by 112. These are arterial major roads, which insulate our community. The ARP at present, uh, unamended uh, as, a, as requested, under 2.2.3 residential land use, uh, provides that, uh, or directs, instructs the city to preserve and protect the major portion of the existing stable residential neighborhoods from intrusion of through traffic and large scale redevelopment. The planner has confirmed uh, folks that nothing of this nature has been proposed since the ARP's adoption in 1983, even though it's been amended several times, including for the new plans at Stadium Act and Exhibition, which essentially insulate our community within those major roads. What's left here is a medium, low to medium density residential community that's saved from the intrusion of an R8 development. Aside from the absurdity of 62 units in a pandemic era, the ARP notes the significant traffic and parking concerns which are already at issue and the developer has not done nothing to show mitigation for. Next slide. Our RA8 land use is a necessary and will certainly erode the integrity of our family oriented lower density residential community. That includes a uh, specific to our sub area for general intent of land use um, it's anticipated that only the only land use change will that will occur is the development of low rise apartment buildings and similar to viewpoint or to viewpoint along 82nd and Virginia Park along 12. Um, that would be it low rise apartment buildings with some commercial use for the for the residences. Our sub area similar to viewpoint in Virginia Park uh, does contain a low rise just uh, west of the proposed uh, 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 medium uh, 23 meter high building. And outside of that, our community is filled with single family homes with unique character, mainly constructed between the, 20, the 1920s and 40s. Next slide. Pictured at bottom left are homes upgraded or infilled with structures compatible with homes of historical significance in our sub area. And save for Virginia Park folks, uh, these homes that are pictured are within a stone's throw 
of this uh, building that uh, that's proposed. Among others, uh, just uh, pictured at the bottom left are homes upgraded or infilled with structures compatible with homes of historic significance in our sub area. Among others, just east of our residence uh, and at top uh, center is Kirkness House, built in 1909 by fur trader James Kirkness. To our west and top right in the image is McDonald House, built in 1912 by original river lot settler James McDonald. Adherence to the ARP and its call for residential low rise integrity in our sub area is of vital importance, not just to us, but to each sub area. We are a, uh, a wide and narrow um, uh, community. Also, uh, our first speaker, uh, community speaker, she intended to present the 201 signatures on the petition signed by residents from all ARP areas. Uh, of course, the 120 meter radius for engagement did not capture everyone in the ARP, so we made sure we did that. Uh, the response that the city got, 18 of 27 responded in complete disagreement. Um, our community isn't a, a linear uh, community as, as many are, and that's because of the ravine, which doesn't separate but bonds are the sub areas five, six, and three. Again, what's proposed here is a large seniors complex that would do nothing to integrate or connect with the community, aside from uh, concerns with the size of the building and parking and traffic issues that would certainly ensue in an area where the ARP already notes major problems in that regard and where, par and where parking restrictions are in, in effect for major events. This past winter, following the death of a valued long-term resident, Chelsea DePraca, a 37-year-old woman with autism, who when I moved Mr. here gave Oliver. me her Eskimo tip, it's pictured bottom right I'm sorry, is Mr. the Oliver. box for her uh, that serves in her memory. Um, Mr. Oliver, community... we're, we're well past the five minutes. Okay, uh, if you could go to the last slide, please. Current zoning permits medium density um, while also ensuring stability and retention I'm, of, I'm of our neighborhood. I'm RA7 sorry, has a, permits um, a, a low rise building. The RF1 provides for semi detached housing. The current zoning seems more appropriate. Yes. It permits yes, densification, Oliver, but does not there. create a massive structure that would overhang our community. Thanks for your time and attention, and Thank sorry you, for going Oliver. over. Questions for Mr. Oliver? I don't see any questions for you, sir. Thank you. Uh, next, I'm, I'm going to much. just ask everyone left. It's been a very long day. Um, I neglected to mention what is sometimes a helpful suggestion at the beginning. If you have a countdown timer on your phone or a stopwatch or something that can help you track the five minutes, that makes my job a little bit easier, but more importantly, respects everybody else's time. So uh, please, if you could have a timer uh, at your disposal. Um, but I will be a little bit gentle with Nancy Bradford, who's immediately up next after saying so. So, uh, um, and actually, do we need to loop back to Jennifer Bowerman, actually? Okay. So. Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I've lived in this neighborhood for the last 15 years. I remember this particular land when it actually had buildings on it that were torn down by the uh, new owner uh, because of the druggies that had, or at least that was my understanding. I know when I walked by there, there were a lot of people and a lot of needles and a lot of undesirable activity. So the land, the, the buildings were torn down and now it is green space. I oppose this uh, redevelopment uh, plan in terms of going from four stories to six stories. I live at 404-8119, 112th Avenue in a four-story condominium. And I was not told of the proposal from the city for this change, even though it is my neighborhood. I go from the condominium where I live, either on the street or on the lane, down past all of my neighbors uh, to Virginia Park, where my mother used to live, into uh, Ada, uh, Concordia and then Ada Boulevard. And I either run, walk, uh, or bike uh, every single day. I cross the roads from Borden Park into the, where this proposed development is, and I know how dangerous it's going to be, as it is already. 
I don't know why I was left out of the rezoning notification, but I am somewhat perturbed that I would be, as were my neighbors. I helped to take the petition around to uh, the 20 or 30 houses in this particular neighborhood. And not one of the people that I spoke to was in favor of this development. The first thing. Second thing is I am absolutely bowled over by the fact that somebody, uh, this developer, who I understood was Ebenezer developer, would come here and tell us that it is a senior's residence that is planned because we had no idea. I don't know why a senior's residence of six stories is necessary. My understanding of senior's residences is that they, they are, well, like everybody, are better closer to the ground. People are happier on the ground, um, at ground level. I believe we should be attracting families in particular. Um, a four-story is probably much more family-oriented than a six-story. We have schools, great schools. We have a clinic. I'm not sure that we need more space for, uh, for, for seniors. Uh, why wouldn't we told, we were told that before? Why doesn't the city council have a plan whereby we can work with developers in terms of the development plan that we already have established? Why suddenly at this hearing are we told that it is going to be a seniors development? And allow me to tell you that I see many seniors from Virginia Park walking up here every single morning and every single night. There have been some serious accidents from 112th Avenue um, over, with cars flipping over the boulevard and landing in front of my neighbor's houses. They would have killed some of the seniors that walk along here. I know them by name. They know me by name. I am just shocked that suddenly we would be faced with a proposal for a six-story house that is seniors oriented with no relationship to the, the development plan, no communication, and there is nothing wrong with a four-story building if that's what it has to be. But we should be doing much more to attract families in particular because this establishment, and I'm a senior myself, this area deserves to have families. Thank you, Ms. Bowerman. Any questions? Not seeing any. Perhaps someone could tell me why we were omitted from the notice. Uh, that, that question can be uh, asked on your behalf when um, counselors have an opportunity to ask. Thank you. It's not just on my behalf. It's on behalf of many of my neighbors here, too. Yeah, there is a 60-meter notification requirement, uh, and then that is sometimes expanded under certain circumstances, but I shouldn't be answering that question. That, that I will ask. I will undertake, if no one else does, to ask about notification on your behalf, ma'am. Next, is, I will certainly do that, Mr. Mayor, thank you, when the time Mayor, comes. Excellent. I'm glad you're keeping notes. Um, wonderful. Next is Nancy Bradford. Good evening, councillors and mayor. Uh, thank you for allowing me to speak. Uh, I agree with everything that has been said so far. I, I'm in total opposition. My husband and I are in total opposition to this uh, RA8 rezoning. Uh, I, um, I, um, I've been here for over 17 years, and I have seen a revitalization of this neighbourhood in the way of families. We're having a, a lot more young children in the area, which is fantastic. Um, also, um, I, I, I'd just like to say that the negative impacts, of course, there's the, the congestion with the traffic, the parking, the crime. Um, of course, I think it's, a, it's um, more light pollution, but I guess that's going to be there anyways, regardless, because they're putting six feet, uh, six-story uh, six buildings on the north side in the future. Um, as far as um, being in an area where there was um, to be uh, around, uh, uh, what did they call that, the pod, uh, around the um, uh, LRT, uh, we've had a lot of high density already put up in the area, although it's on the, on the uh, other side of 82nd Street and then further down along Jasper. 
Um, there, there's also a noise. It's going to be a lot more noise. Um, I don't think this area can sustain any more density in that regard, especially with the building that's going to be proposed for the north side of 112th Avenue. Um, our entire neighborhood is against this uh, mid-rise. There's no reason why RA7 cannot be sustained and stay that way. RA8 is, is unsustainable. It's going to impact the quality and safety of our, of our residents, and it's going to bring irreparable damage. Um, also, um, uh, you know, in this neighborhood, we already are... Uh, have a lot to deal with because we are the uh, transient uh, corridor, which means that we have a lot of transients coming from downtown up to 118th Avenue. We also have a lot of encampments uh, on both sides of uh, the ravine, which is polluting Rat Creek, which is not good for the environment. And they're taking down trees and making the encampments even larger. So we have uh, a lot of things. Uh, we have a lot of property theft, and that may not re be reflected in the stats because we all get tired of reporting it because nothing's done. We are referred to as the jewel of East Cromdale, and this is no place, of, uh, uh, RA is not for the jewel. It is a very unique uh, community, and it is going to continue to be a unique community. And as it was previously said, we know everybody by name. We know everybody's dogs. We know everybody's children. So this is just not a good proposal. I think that this should not go through at all. Uh, and, and had there been no COVID, I'm sure there would have been uh, far more on the, uh, on the, uh, uh, on the um, thing that Jennifer submitted for, that we signed. Um, and there would be far more, um, far more um, getting together and, and um, protesting this. But because of COVID, we are uh, very, uh, we aren't able to do all that. So, you know, uh, there, there is a lot to be considered. And uh, if uh, there is any uh, doubt or if there's any, any um, if maybe um, if there needs to be more uh, information. And as was just uh, stated, we did not know. Uh, what was being developed, for whom, and and how. Uh, there's no, um, it's nice that it's going to be a senior's residence, but also that we have to look at affordable housing, which uh, is, is an important thing. And the fact of the matter is, is that mid-rises really do not um, affect, uh, uh, are not desirable for community. Uh, they don't foster community. Now, uh, a senior's residence might foster more community, but I do believe that that can all be done, RA7, and I'm totally opposed, my husband and I, on the RA8. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Bradford. Any questions? Not seeing questions. Um, next is Ashling Ryan. We, apologies, Mr. Mayor, we may have Councillor Banga um, wishing to ask questions of that last speaker. Oh, okay. Councillor Banga, did you have questions for Ms. Bradford? Yes, I do. Go ahead. Uh, Bradford, uh, uh, knowing uh, a little bit uh, about police uh, and crime, usually seniors' uh, residences are the one that are probably considered I guess less uh, dis uh, disturbing or uh, uh, crime pill. Yes. What? What? Uh, why would that concern you? Well, that concerns me because originally that wasn't going to be RA seven either. It was going to be a family, single family dwelling, or uh, along those lines, but. The seniors may not bring the crime, but the building brings the criminals. So there's where my point is. Okay, and uh, if it's, uh, let's say, if, if it's four-story and uh, we can't legislate, who lives in there? No, I understand that. 
I understand that. I'm not saying the residents bring the crime. I'm saying having the big building brings the crime. If you talk to the people who live in the four uh, four story uh, condos that are uh, on south of the avenue, where Jennifer lives, and what and and very and and right across from the clinic, they have severe crime problems. So this building will have severe crime problems as well, based on the transient population and the fact that there's no, uh, they're not, not the city is not dealing with uh, housing these people uh, or looking after these people the way they should, and then they become our problem, especially because we're the transient corridor. So it, it's just come to a point where enough is enough for us. And this is enough. RA7 is more than enough. RA8 is too, too much and totally opposed to it. All right. Thanks. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, no further questions for you, Ms. Bradford. Now, Ashling Ryan, are you there? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yes, proceed, please. Excellent. Thank you. Um, yes, as you've heard, my name is Ashling Ryan. I live within the uh, the zone that was given notice, and I believe it was a 120-meter zone, so I was captured in that area. Uh, I am concerned about the size of the building that is proposed, and uh, I am ag agreeable to uh, RA7, which would allow for a dense increased densification in the area, but the RA, RA8 that is proposed is simply too high uh, for this area. Um, it doesn't fit within the character and nature of the neighborhood. When we purchased in this area three years ago, I did my due diligence and saw that there was this plot of land that had not been developed and obviously knew it was gonna be open for development. I noted that there was RA7, uh, that it was RA7 zoning and that the lot, uh, the there was a single family uh, development zoning as well. Um, I anticipated that we would have increased dens uh, density by a low rise apartment complex and perhaps something like townhouses uh, that would may appear or some form of garden suites on that uh, the our, excuse me, the uh, single family lot there. Uh, but this RA8 is a huge deviation from that and I am concerned about the size of the building that is proposed. It, uh, it may not cause a shadow in the sense of a light shadow, but it certainly uh, is massively invasive on privacy. And uh, Mayor Ivinson, you noted earlier that you know, one of the things people bring up is that slippery slope in development. And what I heard was, well, we've agreed to have RA8 across 112th Avenue and so what's the big deal of having an RA building across on the other side of 100, uh, uh, on the south side of 112th Avenue? And the big deal, we're going to have single family homes essentially backing directly onto it. So it makes a huge difference for the livability and enjoyment of the community. One of the objectives in the area redevelopment plan that is in place, that is currently in place, um, is that we increase the densification of the area, but maintain the integrity of the single uh, single family home uh, lots that are in the area. And I'm asking that that be preserved. I I, I understand that the the, uh, the plan that is in place right now increases densification in a way that is appropriate and allows for a good grade into into the single family home. So on the north side of 112th, you have the RA8, the higher buildings, which I think does work with the health center and the uh, the condominium complex and the, the Save-On Food Shopping Center that is there. But on the south side of 112th Ave, you then have a lower uh, development in the RA7 zone and then a lower development again as you progress into the uh, the, the where the single family homes are in the neighborhood neighborhood. Um, so those that's my major concern. I mean, I do also have concerns about increased traffic. I think the, the comment about that, you know, yes, maybe the residents are accounted for in parking, but what about the care workers? Uh, I do have concerns about that, particularly as it is on a cycling route. But really, my big concern is that this will stick out like a sore thumb. You are changing uh, an RA7 into an RA8. And then more importantly, you the the applicant is requesting that you change the 
a single family home development, you remove the road that creates a, uh, the road variant barrier that creates a, a break between the RA7 and the single fa family development. And then you have the single family development. So there's, there's no break between a massive building and the single family homes. And that is just out of character for the neighborhood. Um, this is not an area that has uh, has been in opposition to densification. We've accepted it. We just don't want to get stuck with that slippery slope, essentially. Uh, those are my comments, unless you have any questions for me. Uh, let's see. Are there any questions for Ms. Ryan? Not seeing any. Thank you very much. Right. Next, Thank you. Uh, were the Pittmans able to join us ever? Not so far. Okay. How about uh, Cal? Yes. Hello. Oh, Joyce. Hello. This is Joyce Pittman. Yep. Oh, yes. I'm here. Okay. Go ahead. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thanks for hearing me. My name is Joyce Pittman. My husband and I have lived in our house at 7903 112th Avenue South for 30 years. This We are actually within a half a block of the development. can clearly see it from our front yard. I actually lived here when the convenience store was on that corner and actually operating and actually bought popsicles and other things from there. So I've been here a long time. I have issue and, and against the two bylaws, amending it to a low rise, medium size apartment. The area is primarily, the area is primarily single family homes with two four story small apartment complexes. The neighborhood has seen upgrades to many homes, young families with children moving in, and apartment development within three to four blocks. I have two points that I disagree with in the city report. Uh, one is the term moderate increase in building and generally compatible with surrounding context. The report summary states that the site is already zoned primarily for low-rise multi-unit, and it is a moderate increase. However, that was a result of rezoning in 2007. No buildings ever materialized on there. There's no structure there. It is a huge increase in mass compared to what is currently there because there's nothing there. It does not meet the definition of a moderate increase in building mass. Two additional floors is at least 10 to 16 units, 10 to 16 balconies viewing my yard, another 16 to 40 people, 10 to 20 cars, all in addition to the approved four floors of units, balconies, cars. I don't agree with the rezone, that the rezone is generally compatible with surrounding context. The context of the neighborhood is single family homes, Stukesbury Park, Jane Salisbury Park, Borden Park, a soccer field, Kennard Ravine, and four low rise apartment buildings. A massive six story, eight lot building does not fit that context. It's generally not compatible. There are four apartment buildings within this pie shape of 112th Avenue South. One is a three story and three are four stories. Two of them are older, one is newer. Um, the counselor stated that the one close to Savon was six stories high, but it is not. It is only four stories and it is, has a massive footprint on its own. And there are no single family dwellings by it. The health center has been mentioned many times. It is kitty corner to this proposed building, and it is two to, about two and a half to three stories high, so definitely fits in with the neighborhood context. This building is surrounded on two sides by single-family homes. I'm very concerned with the privacy, um, six stories of balconies looking into our front and backyards, um, the sight lines and livability and feel. Um, takes away, it doesn't feel like a single family neighborhood. Um, there have been statements that the, this building is close to stadium yards, which is being redevelopment. Those buildings are almost a kilometer away across busy 82nd Street, across the LRT tracks, totally separated from our community and not visible from my house. It's, the stadium yards is very different and it is really not within context of this three block community in the bylaw. Um, in my view, the four story, eight residential lot is the maximum that should be built here. There's transition to the north, um, which is the new proposed exhibition land. 
it meets the Go City goal of densifying existing residential and keeps the neighborhood closer to its general context. My warning is the same as Anthony's. The developer has owned this lot, these lots since 2007, and there's no development. The senior's residence sounds noble, but will this be the end use? Or will this increase the sale value by changing the zoning? Will it increase to more than 62 units by the time it's developed? Will there be underground parking when it's developed? These are all just proposals. There's no guarantee of what would be built there if this zone is changed to an R8. And this is more just more suitable to what it currently is. Thank you. Thank you. Um, other, are there questions for Ms. Pittman? Not seeing any, then, um, but Grant Pittman was not able to join us, I understand. And no, he won't be joining. Okay. Cal Rathall is next, then. Good evening, and thank you. Uh, my wife, Jean, and I live and, and own the property at 7731 112th Avenue South, Northwest Edmonton. Our property is 75 yards from the southeast corner of the proposed redevelopment site. We are also part of the group that signed the recent petition opposing the amendments to the bylaw or bylaws. In particular, we oppose the bylaw amendment 19687 um, to go to an RA8, and we support the neighborhood group's concerns. For us, there are two major issues uh, with the development plot proposal. I must say, like a couple of previous speakers, I am shocked and surprised at the level of communication to discover that this is going to miraculously be a senior's residence. Um, even though I phoned the city on this issue on uh, February 6th, I believe, 2020, um, I was not originally included in the, uh, the uh, by, by accident, according, they lost my uh, telephone number. But the bottom line is I was shocked to hear about this being a senior's residence. That's the first I've heard of it. So it's been a night of surprises. The proposed uh, height of the recommended structure, as has been mentioned, is six stories. We're moving in the proposal from low-rise apartments to medium-rise. Uh, as others have stated very articulately, um, a six-story building at one of the main entrances to 112th Avenue South provides, in our opinion, a very poor fit and an unwanted introduction to our area. Speaking of surprises, the only building in the immediate area now is on the north side of 112th Avenue, Kitty Corner, as was mentioned, and it is the East Edmonton Medical Center. I was surprised that it was listed in the uh, positive presentation as a six-story building. Um, quite frankly, it was more aptly described, and I can see it out my window, uh, as being closer to about three stories on the front. Uh, it's actually two stories, but um, they're, they're larger stories, so I would say equivalent to a three-story building. Um, okay, the issue of shadowing from a six-story building is only relevant in a, the building that size will surely lock, block light and our views. Our properties will be overlooked by a large imposing building that is not representative of our community. We will miss the evening sun setting in the summer months. The other issue is density. We already know that the density around our residential area will be increased by the city's 30-year redevelopment plan for the whole area to the north of 112th. I heard earlier about 8,500 more people in this area. Um, Significant density increases are proposed around the Coliseum LRT station, and I and my wife do not oppose that. At least that density increase, as per the city's area redevelopment plan, is using land that's not right in the lap of our residential area. The potential for increased parking problems was mentioned. I was likewise surprised tonight to find that they were going to put in some parking 
but I still think parking is uh, potentially with visitors and services uh, an issue in this area because there's precious little of it. The uh, increased traffic in the area will likely be a problem. The intersection of 112th and 79th is busy and what I call lightweights turn on to, to turn on to 112 from 79 are currently long. This intersection is a really small area in a tight turn off 112. In winter, 79th Street heading south often becomes um, a small one lane street because of parking allowed on both sides of the street in snow. Uh, snow is there as well. We are concerned about increased traffic in our area. Crime rates were mentioned. Uh, we googled crime statistics and discovered that Cromdale total crime rates are 125 percent above the Canadian national average. Violent crime is 76 percent higher and property crime is 141 percent higher than the national average. And I have the reference for that uh, Google search. I did look at the EPS website Unfortunately, uh, it, it did not have up-to-date information and was being updated uh, according to that, that site. We also work with our area neighborhood watch volunteers and know that it is a challenge to get people to report minor property crimes Sorry, in this Rappel. area as they are common Mr. in Rappel. the area. Sorry? We're, we're at the five minutes. Okay, reported crime we believe is lower than the reality and I can speak to that from personal things. In conclusion, we are opposed to rezoning the property in, in question as proposed. The current zoning provides a variety of new growth options and Thank main you, floor Mr. commercial Rappel. development. In our view, you, it is Rappel. a generous zoning now and one that more accurately Rappel, reflects the needs there. of our community. Uh, more thought needs to Sorry, be given to Rappel, how to effectively to utilize that space within the current zoning. Thank you. Um, are there questions for Mr. Rathel? I'm going to ask everyone again to be mindful of the time. And, uh, and if I have to remind people more than a couple of times, I am going to ask the clerks to mute. Um, just out of respect for everyone's time. So uh, I see no questions for Mr. Rathal. So uh, was Eugene, uh, Councillor Paquette, go ahead. Yeah, no, just really quickly. Um, so the statistics that you were mentioning about crime, have you sent that to us? Mr. Mr. Uh, Rathal, you may be muted right now. Uh, no, I have not sent that. Uh, it is available on, if you Google, crime rates com Cromdale, area vibes, uh, uh, comma, AB crime rates will show up. And that is where I got the reference. Okay. And do you know if that's uh, in comparison to other like-sized municipalities or just the average across Canada, across population? It was reported as above the national average. That's all I'm saying. Okay, so we don't have it in context of other municipalities. Of I like tried, as I said, I tried to go to the EPS site to get more detail, but was uh, not successful in that. Okay, just checking, because I lived in a small town where I don't think we reported a crime for maybe 10 years. So <laughs> hard to tell. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I see no further questions for Mr. Rathal. So, Eugene Drapaka, did Eugene ever? I don't believe so. And okay. Um, our our office has reached out to them. Um, there's a chance they're on the phone and would need to star six to unmute. Um, but they they did not check in, and we haven't been able to reach them. Okay. Well, unless we hear from them, we'll we'll carry on next with Shauna Ferragini. Yes, hello. Um, can you hear me? Yes, proceed, please. Thank you. Um, I have a presentation, please, if you could go to that. Um, and I'm reading from notes to try and stay on time. Um, I'm a 20-year resident of Cromdale neighborhood here to voice opposition to the proposed rezoning and bylaw change. I apologize there will be some ad hoc comments here as the information about the senior centre was new to me as well. But 
A mid-rise development at this site will not will change the character of our community significantly and likely negatively. It's not a moderate increase to our neighborhood as the site in question has yet to be redeveloped from the original homes that used to be there. A further moderate increase, how this was assessed by administration, will mean a significant increase in density to the community. In addition to the physical structure, which I will not address because it I don't see it. The increase in units will mean increased traffic and parking pressures, regardless of what goes in, and may result in potentially safety issues, which are contrary to our objectives of the Area Redevelopment Plan, and I believe contrary to City Council's own safe and livable community objectives in the new City Plan. I also note, as others have, that city growth objectives are being met in our area without the approval of this change. I support development of the site, but not as a mid-rise. This is not a not-in-my-backyard objection. This is a let's-be-good-neighbors request. Can you go to slide two, please? <clears throat> this is the Google map of the neighbourhood. People have talked about this, but I will draw your attention to the geographic constraints on 112th Avenue to the north, Kennard Ravine to the south, and 82nd Street to the west. We are a small community. This is it. I have highlighted the largest of the three existing apartments where Jennifer lives, which is a four-story with 21 units, and shown that the site in question would indeed be probably 60 units or more. City planning did not give us any information about a 62-unit senior home. So again, if there is a plan, we haven't seen it, and I would like someone to ask that question on why we haven't seen it yet. But the quote I do have from city planning admits that, <clears throat> excuse me, final size is, quote, one of the issues with the zoning stage. We don't know the details at this point. There is no guarantee we get a 62-unit seniors home. We get whatever fits into an RA8 zone. <clears throat> As a reminder, there are no units here now. We are redeveloping from single family, not from RA7. <clears throat> Excuse me. You've also heard of increased traffic and parking issues. Any development will bring significant parking and traffic issues to this small community, as you can see. But a larger development brings more. And what we're looking to is to mitigate those impacts of development. I've noted to the south, the ravine, and the homeless camps. And this isn't about homeless camps, and it's not the safety of homeless camps, but knowing who lives here is an important tool for community safety. A smaller development, whether they are seniors or not, will give the community a better chance of building connections with those residents for our neighborhood watch that helps to protect our properties, because it's those connections that keep this a safe and livable community so close to the city core. And finally, my comments about the developer has not engaged with our community on this zoning change. If the, if the person that provided the update on the seniors home is the developer that submitted the zoning change, I, I could not find that information. In an online and social media um, age, Ebenezer Development, which we were told who had submitted the the change have no online information. We have no idea who they who they are or what kind of developments they do and whether they will walk away from this once the zoning change is made or the building is done. And again, as you've heard, this senior's house was a was was a surprise to all of us. So we have to assume that in the community that the zoning increase or, or the zoning request is being made to increase profits at the site and not to integrate into the community. If you can go to slide three, please. I won't speak to this slide. These are the objectives of our, AR, of our current ARP, but I will refer to the new city plan approved December 7th. Um, and I note that the city plan sets strategic direction for the way Edmonton grows, and it does it in two complementary ways, the future city and the essential city. And this is a quote from page seven. Not everything in the city plan is about making something new. Much of our work is about keeping it things the same. A critical part of the city plan is rooted in stewardship and preserving the attributes most valued by Edmontonians today that were handed down to us from previous generations. As a community, in return, we continue to deliver on what makes for a safe and livable city as part of our gift to future generations. This is the essential city, and it comes to life through many of the intentions and directions in the city plan. Next slide, please. I also won't speak to slide four, because this is about the additional development to the north and the west of us in stadium yards and the exhibition grounds. It's happening and we know it, and administration has recognized it. But again, I'll reiterate, 
A mid-rise building in our small neighbourhood is not moderate and it does not fit and it's not required to meet growth goals. Finally, on slide five, <clears throat> I would like to end on slide five with what I value in my neighbourhood, a reminder of what community can be. This is my neighbourhood, I know these people, all those little all those little arrows are people that I know, the families I know by name. We talk to them as we meet in the alley, streets, parks in the area. We dine together, we vacation together, and we support each other. I want my community to remain safe and livable as it's developed. And community engagement is key in these objectives as it's people, not developers that live here. There'll be growth in our community and I look forward to it. It's, as long as it doesn't take over the single family character that's already here. A further zoning change to Midride puts that at risk. The response from the community with the 200 plus signatures and the speakers today provide feedback to you that we disagree with administration's assessment of this zoning change and that council's policy objective of meaningful engagement has not been met. I'm asking you Thank to support you. our neighborhood and reject this change. Thank you, Ms. Faragini. Questions? Yes. I'm just asking if there are any questions for you. Uh, from my colleagues. I don't see any. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, Howard Gibb was a question mark before. Do we have Mr. Gibb? I believe that they checked in at the at the beginning and maybe on the phone. Star six time. Hello, this is Howard Gibb. Go ahead. The floor is yours. Okay. Uh, well, that was the warm-up act. Uh, my neighbors are <laughs> they've outdone themselves uh we've lived here for uh for six years uh we are actually on 79th street and we are located kitty corner uh to these vacant lots and i'm looking at the the map on the administration report and it's 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 pretty om ominous and i i think a good title for this map would be uh one RA too far, like uh, RA7 low rise, I think it is uh, much more compatible with the character of the neighborhood uh, than a six story building. And also, uh, I'll echo what some of my neighbors have said already. Uh, I was caught off guard by, well, finding out what the proposal is. Uh, it's pretty hard to, uh, to bash seniors as I'm one myself. But nonetheless, uh, no matter who lives in that building, it's going to be a very large uh, building, totally out of character with the neighborhood. Uh, I believe it was Mr. Golightly when he was speaking uh, in favor. Uh, he was mentioning how the area is uh, it's going to support uh, this proposal. It, it's great that, uh, you know, the, the stadium, the LRT station, uh, all the amenities are close by, but this proposed development, it's, uh, it's not, it's not of any real benefit to the neighborhood in my, uh, in my view. Uh, again, uh, I think it's going to severely, uh, affect parking and traffic, uh, on the side, one of the uh, the benefits of, of the COVID times was uh, the city. They decided to make uh, 112th Avenue South a uh, a shared roadway, so that has really calmed down uh, traffic. And I'd like things to stay that way. However, uh, with this development, uh, I don't see that happening. Uh, and as I said earlier. We are we're just across the street from this proposal, kitty corner to it. And I I probably leave for work in the morning before all my neighbors and this the streets are full of cars. There's really no more room uh, for any more cars. And I don't think it's fair for people that own houses have to uh compete with uh uh, the caseworkers and the the overflow traffic from this uh, from this proposal. Uh, so, yeah, I'll just uh, I'll just leave it at that. I don't think there's any uh, 
questions for me as uh, I've basically just gone over points that people already uh, mentioned. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I don't see any questions for Mr. Gibb at this point. Um, how about Roman Warkola? Roman? Thank you, Mayor, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. First of all, let me thank City Council as the proposed amendments have galvanized and united our small community like nothing I've ever seen in almost 50 years that our family has owned this property and is shown by the petition that's been signed by over 200 residents. As a preference, the property I own is on the same block as these proposed amendments. So the decision that you will make here today has a direct and immediate impact. My property is one of only three single-story residential bungalows that remain standing on this entire block, with the rest of the lots on this block are bare land. No zoning changes are being proposed for our three remaining lots on this block. We are currently zoned as RF1, single detached residential, with a maximum height of 8.9 meters and three units of density. Let me assure Council that I welcome and embrace any changes in the development of our neighbourhoods and community, as long as the amendments add to the character, aesthetics and vibrancy of the area. Out of the three proposed zoning bylaw changes, I only have issue with what appears to be a subtle change on the surface, but will forever change and destroy the quaint and beloved character of our neighbourhood. This amendment is proposing to change the existing property zoning bylaw from RA7, low-rise apartment, to RA8, mid-rise apartment. So what's the big deal converting from RA7 to RA8? That has energized our community. In fact, city administration is in support of this application that, in their words, it proposes a increase in building mass on a site primarily zoned for low-rise apartment buildings and commercial development, and is generally compatible with its surrounding context. Here are the key facts and impact from rezoning the land from RA7 to RA8. The height of the building moves from 14.5 meters to 23 meters. That's a 58% increase in height. The density moves from a maximum of 45 dwelling units to a maximum of 75 dwelling units, a 66% increase. When you further compare the differences between RA8, mid-rise apartment, and the three remaining lots on the same block that are zoned as RF1, single detached residential, the discrepancy is even more alarming. The height of the building now increases by 155%, and the density increases 25 times, or 2,500%. In my opinion, these proposed changes are neither moderate and certainly not compatible with its surrounding context. Let me save you the time and trouble from another PowerPoint slide presentation and use this analogy with the <clears throat> imperial measure. I ask you to imagine a giant of a person measuring seven feet six inches tall, standing next to a little person barely two feet tall. This huge discrepancy in height between two individuals standing next to each other is what you would expect to see in a circus but not in a neighborhood community. But that is what you're voting on today. It is a 76 foot tall, six story building right next to a 20 foot tall, single detached residential one story home. This is a proverbial David versus Goliath parable with hopefully the same moral lesson and outcome. However, I understand and even respect why a developer would be pushing for this change as being able to sell or rent a maximum of 75 units as opposed to 45 units on the same parcel of land would allow the developer to gain additional economies of scale that would significantly improve his or her profits. However, your responsibility on council is not to maximize the developer's profits, but rather maintain the integrity and character of the communities you serve. Other than the obvious of constructing a building as tall as the White House in Washington, DC, right next to our single family homes, there are additional impacts on this proposal and you've heard them all. Parking, traffic, privacy, shadows, security, density, I could go on and on. If approved, this will forever change the quaint character, not only of Cromdale, but also Virginia Park and other surrounding communities. I ask you to reject the proposal to change the zoning bylaw to RA8 and reconsider converting or leaving the area being impacted to either to RA7 low rise apartment. Thank you for your time. I re remain available for any questions you may have. 
Thank you very much. Uh, any questions? Not seeing any. Next up is Oliver. Well, actually, uh, we're going to hit the uh, quitting time here in just a moment, and there may be some uh, other agenda changes. One option, we have seven speakers left, would be to extend till 10 p.m. so we can finish hearing from speakers today. Um, but that may or may not be desirable to <laughs> members of council after yesterday and today. Um, we, we are extending, uh, and we will have to pick this item up in the morning tomorrow. So, um, and that will take a good chunk of the morning. Um, I can update you uh, also from an agenda management standpoint that uh, what we've worked out with the Community and Public Services Committee Chair, Councillor Paquette, is that we can likely postpone the single admin driven item on the morning of next Friday's agenda, thereby freeing up the morning as well for the continuation of public hearings. And that would allow us to put the Holyrood on Tuesday, time specific, and the Garneau items on Friday, time specific, so that people don't have to bounce between multiple days. And then we'll see how much we get done tomorrow, um, but some of these other items might still spill into Tuesday, depending on how tomorrow goes, uh, or perhaps even into next Friday. But we'll free up another half day here with another motion to uh, change orders for this meeting uh, uh, and direct cancellation of CPSC and rescheduling, or do the clerks want time to... Am I going too fast? Um, I'm just trying to work out the logistics of... Um, the appropriate thing to do with those two items. Do you want to do you want to work on that overnight and make the motions in the morning? That would be great. Okay, cool. Then let's not try to change orders any further because we are going to continue um, at nine. Pardon me, nine a.m. tomorrow is when we will continue with our next speaker, who would be uh, Olivier Can, because uh, we are basically at uh, the witching hour now here. So I'm going to suggest uh, we pause here. However, if there are any process questions about agenda management, I'd take those now. Councillor Henderson? No, I was just going to say, you know, if we're starting earlier tomorrow than usual, I don't think we should go on tonight. I don't think that would be, you know, that at that point we will have very little break between the two meetings. Yeah, I have to give a little talk tomorrow too, so I would appreciate not being totally slammed between tonight and tomorrow. So. Um, um, Mr. Mayor. Yes, Councillor Nack. I'm sorry, just, just recognizing your discussion tomorrow. Um, the, the orders currently take us from 9 right till noon. Did, did, would it be wise to break at 11.45, recognizing? No. Um, would you be okay with us continuing on without you? Because I imagine you're not going to go right till noon and then jump in. Yeah, I'll slip out and hand off the chair for um, a few, a few uh, minutes. Um, so, so yes, I'll hand off the chair, and if there's a natural break, we can end a couple of minutes early if, if we're okay. just not going to start an item. But if we're in the midst of something and you all can finish, then have at it. Okay. Uh, but, yeah, then I'll I will, sneak yeah, out. I just wanted to double check. Thanks. Thank you. Appreciate that. Sir, Mr. Mayor, if I may ask a, a procedural question. I'm afraid not. Um, you can contact the clerks and, and, and uh, please uh, write to city.clerk at edmonton.ca, sure. and, uh, and we'll get it answered offline. So, Thank you very much. Um, there's something else I'm forgetting. Yes, uh, just um, based on case counts and an abundance of caution, we are going to be moving to, um, uh, we're hybrid now, we're going to be moving essentially to a nearly full virtual. The clerks will still be in the room here uh, running the equipment that, that runs the whole meeting. Uh, but uh, we're going to ask um, most other staff and uh, most, if not all, other members of council, including the chair, to work from remote for the next uh, few weeks until things are back under control. So we will interrupt our normally scheduled hybrid meetings like this and, and move to more or less uh, as online as we can get and still operate meetings because continuity of government is important. Uh, so we will, uh, we will carry on, but we will do so virtually. So you will see me um, uh, not in chambers tomorrow to reconvene, and uh, that will introduce one slight, an additional level of technical complexity um, to, to running these hearings, but, uh, but it's uh, in the interest of public health and setting the right example 
and taking the most precautions we can to protect uh, this workplace um, and set the right example for Edmontonians. That's uh, in consultation with the city manager what uh, we've determined is um, the most appropriate thing to do. So, um, so yes, uh, please tune in virtually tomorrow uh, uh, and I will be joining you in doing so. And uh, please be gentle because it's a little tricky to run these things from remote, but we'll do our very best. Clerks, fortunately, have done a great job making this as seamless as possible under these, actually, if you think about it, quite extraordinary circumstances. So let's, uh, let's leave it there. Uh, let's start up at 9 a.m. tomorrow to continue um, with the Cromdale item.